by Johann David Wyss. The, the Swiss, Swiss Family Robinson, Robinson or Adventures, Adventures in a Desert, Desert Island. Island. I see, my dear wife, said I, that you, as well as the rest of my family, are contented to remain on this island, where it seems it is the will of God for us to dwell, as it is improbable that in such a tempest Captain Johnson would risk approaching the island, if indeed it has not already been fatal to him. I'm impatient to learn if Fritz has any tidings of him, for it was on the shore near Tent House that he and Jack passed the night. "'Well done, my good and courageous boys,' said their mother. They might at any rate have given assistance to them if wrecked. "'You are more courageous than I am, my dear Elizabeth,' answered I. "'I have passed the whole night mourning for my children, and you think only of the good they might have done to their fellow creatures.' My sons were awake by this time, and I eagerly inquired if they had discovered any traces of the vessel. Fritz said they had not, but he feared it would never be able to resist the fury of the tempest. "'No, indeed,' said Jack. "'Those mountains of waves, which were not fixtures like other mountains, came full gallop to swallow up Fritz the Great, Jack the Little, and their fine canoe.' My wife nearly fainted when she heard they had ventured on that terrible sea, and I reminded Fritz that I had forbidden him to do this. "'But you have often said to me, Papa,' said he, "'do unto others as you would they should do unto you, and what a happiness it would have been to us when our vessel was wrecked if we had seen a canoe!' "'With two bold men coming to our assistance,' said Jack. "'But go on with your story, Fritz.' Fritz continued. We proceeded first to the rocks, and, with some difficulty, and not until Jack had shed some blood in the cause, we secured the karata leaves with their ugly thorns at the end. When our sack was full, we proceeded along the rocks towards Tent House. From this height I tried to discover the ship, but the darkness obscured everything. Once I thought I perceived at a great distance a fixed light which was neither a star nor the lightning, and which I lost sight of occasionally. We had now arrived at the cascade, which, from the noise, seemed much swollen by the rain. Our great stones were quite hidden by a boiling foam. I would have attempted to cross, if I had been alone, but, with Jack on my shoulders, I was afraid of the risk. I therefore prepared to follow the course of the river to Family Bridge. The wet ground continually brought us on our knees, and with great difficulty we reached the bridge. But judge of our consternation! The river had risen so much that the planks were covered, and as we conceived, the whole was destroyed. I then told Jack to return to Falcon's Nest with the Karata leaves, and I would swim across the river. I returned about a hundred yards up the stream to find a wider and less rapid part and easily crossed. Judge of my surprise, when I saw a human figure approaching to meet me. I had no doubt it was the captain of the vessel, and— And it was Captain Jack, sans peur et sans reproche, said the bold little fellow. I was determined not to return home a poltroon who was afraid of the water. When Fritz was gone, I tried the bridge— and soon found there was not sufficient water over it to risk my being drowned. I took off my boots, which might have made me slip, and my cloak, which was too heavy, and, making a dart, I ran with all my strength across and reached the other side. I put on my boots, which I had in my hands, and advanced to meet Fritz, who called out as soon as he saw me, "'Is that you, Captain?' I tried to say, "'Yes, certainly,' in a deep tone but my laughter betrayed me. To my great regret, said Fritz, I should truly have preferred meeting Captain Johnson, but I fear he and his people are at the bottom of the sea. After meeting with Jack, we proceeded to Tent House, where we kindled a good fire, and dried ourselves a little. We then refreshed ourselves with some wine which remained on the table where you had entertained the captain and proceeded to prepare a signal to inform the vessel we were ready to receive them. We procured a thick bamboo cane from the magazine. I fixed firmly to one end of it the large lantern of the fish's bladder you gave us to take. 
I filled the lamp with oil, and placed in it a thick cotton wick, which, when lighted, was very brilliant. Jack and I then placed it on the shore, at the entrance of the bay. We fixed it before the rock, where the land wind would not reach it, sunk it three or four feet into the ground, steadied it with stones, and then went to rest over our fire, after this long and difficult labor. After drying ourselves a little, we set out on our return, when, looking towards the sea, we were startled by the appearance of the same light we had noticed before. We heard, at the same time, the distant report of a gun, which was repeated three or four times at irregular intervals. We were persuaded that it was the vessel calling to us for aid, and, remembering the command of our Saviour, we thought you would forgive our disobedience if we presented to you in the morning the captain, the lieutenant, and as many as our canoe would contain. We entered it then without any fear, for you know how light and well balanced it is. And, rowing into the bay, the sail was spread to the wind, and we had no more trouble. I then took the helm, my own signal light shone clearly on the shore, and, except for the rain which fell in torrents, the waves which washed over our canoe, and uneasiness about the ship and about you, and our fear that the wind might carry us into the open sea, we should have had a delightful little maritime excursion. When we got out of the bay, I perceived the wind was driving us towards Shark Island, which, being directly before the bay, forms two entrances to it. I intended to go round it and disembark there, if possible, that I might look out for some trace of the ship. But we found this impossible. The sea ran too high. Besides, we should have been unable to moor our canoe, the island not affording a single tree or anything we could lash it to, and the waves would soon have carried it away. We had now lost sight of the light, and hearing no more signals, I began to think on your distress when we did not arrive at the hour we promised. I therefore resolved to return by the other side of the bay, carefully avoiding the current which would have carried us into the open sea. I lowered the sail by means of the ropes you had fixed to it, and we rowed into port. We carefully moored the canoe, and, without returning to Tent House, took the road home. We crossed the bridge as Jack had done, found the waterproof cloak and bag of karata leaves where he had left them, and soon after met Ernest. As it was daylight, I did not take him for the captain, but knew him immediately, and felt the deepest remorse when I heard from him in what anxiety and anguish you had passed the night. Our enterprise was imprudent, and altogether useless. But we might have saved life, which would have been an ample remuneration. I fear all is hopeless. What do you think, father, of their fate? I hope they are far from this dangerous coast, said I. But if still in our neighborhood, we will do all we can to assist them. As soon as the tempest is subsided, we will take the pinnace and sail round the island. You have long urged me to this, Fritz, and who knows but that on the opposite side we may find some traces of our own poor sailors, perhaps even meet with them. The weather gradually clearing, I called my sons to go out with me. My wife earnestly besought me not to venture on the sea. I assured her it was not sufficiently calm, but we must examine our plantations to ascertain what damage was done, and at the same time we might look out for some traces of the wreck. Besides, our animals were becoming clamorous for food. Therefore, leaving Ernest with her, we descended to administer in the first place to their wants. Our animals were impatiently expecting us. They had been neglected during the storm, and were ill-supplied with food, besides being half sunk in water. The ducks and the flamingo liked it well enough, and were swimming comfortably in the muddy water, but the quadrupeds were complaining aloud, each in his own proper language, and making a frightful confusion of sounds. Valiant, especially, the name Francis had bestowed on the calf I had given him to bring up, bleated incessantly for his young master, and could not be quieted till he came. It is wonderful how this child, only twelve years old, had tamed and attached this animal, though sometimes so fierce, 
With him he was as mild as a lamb. The boy rode on his back, guiding him with a little stick with which he just touched the side of his neck as he wished him to move. But if his brothers had ventured to mount, they would have been certainly thrown off. A pretty sight was our cavalry, Fritz on his handsome Monagra, Jack on his huge buffalo, and Francis on his young bull. There was nothing left for Ernest but the donkey, and its slow and peaceful habits suited him very well. Francis ran up to his favorite, who showed his delight at seeing him as well as he was able, and at the first summons followed his master from the stable. Fritz brought out Lightfoot, Jack his buffalo, and I followed with the cow and the ass. We left them to sport about at liberty on the humid earth till we removed the water from their stable and supplied them with fresh food. We then drove them in, considering it advisable to pursue our expedition on foot, lest the bridge should still be overflowed. Francis was the superintendent of the fowls, and knew every little chicken by name. He called them out and scattered their food for them, and soon had his beautiful and noisy family fluttering round him. After having made all our animals comfortable, and given them their breakfast, we began to think of our own. Francis made a fire and warmed some chicken broth for his mother. For ourselves, we were contented with some new milk, some salt herrings, and cold potatoes. I had often searched in my excursions for the precious breadfruit tree, so highly spoken of by modern travellers, which I had hoped might be found in our island from its favourable situation. But I had hitherto been unsuccessful. We were unable to procure the blessing of bread. Our ship biscuit had long been exhausted, and though we had sown our European corn, we had not yet reaped any. After we had together knelt down to thank God for our merciful protection through the terrors of the past night, and we besought Him to continue it, we prepared to set out. The waves still ran high, though the wind had subsided, and we determined merely to go along the shore as the road still continued impassable from the rain, and the sand was easier to walk on than the wet grass. Besides, our principal motive for the excursion was to search for any traces of a recent shipwreck. At first we could discover nothing, even with a telescope, but Fritz, mounting a high rock, fancied he discovered something floating towards the island. He besought me to allow him to take the canoe, which was still where he had left it on the preceding night. As the bridge was now easy to cross, I consented, only insisting on accompanying him to assist in managing it. Jack, who was much afraid of being left behind, was the first to leap in and seize an oar. There was, however, no need of it. I steered my little boat into the current, and we were carried away with such velocity as almost to take our breath. Fritz was at the helm, and appeared to have no fear. I will not say his father was so tranquil. I held Jack for fear of accidents, but he only laughed and observed to his brother that the canoe galloped better than Lightfoot. We were soon in the open sea, and directed our canoe towards the object we had remarked, and which we still had in sight. We were afraid it was the boat upset, but it proved to be a tolerably large cask which had probably been thrown overboard to lighten the distressed vessel. We saw several others, but neither mast nor plank to give us any idea that the vessel and boat had perished. Fritz wished much to have made the circuit of the island to assure ourselves of this, but I would not hear of it. I thought of my wife's terror. Besides, the sea was still too rough for our frail bark, and we had, moreover, no provisions. If my canoe had not been well built, it would have run great risk of being overset by the waves, which broke over it. Jack, when he saw one coming, lay down on his face, saying he preferred having them on his back rather than in his mouth. He jumped up as soon as it passed to help to empty the canoe, till another wave came to fill it again. But, thanks to my outriggers, we preserved our balance very well, and I consented to go as far as Cape Disappointment which merited the name a second time. For we found no trace here of the vessel, though we mounted the hill, and thus commanded a wide extent of view. As we looked round the country, 
it appeared completely devastated. Trees torn up by the roots, plantations leveled with the ground, water collected into absolute lakes, all announced desolation, and the tempest seemed to be renewing. The sky was darkened, the wind arose, and was unfavorable for our return. Nor could I venture the canoe upon the waves. Every instant it was becoming more formidable. We moored our bark to a large palm tree we found at the foot of the hill, near the shore, and set out by land to our home. We crossed the gourd wood and the wood of monkeys, and arrived at our farm, which we found, to our great satisfaction, had not suffered much from the storm. The food we had left in the stables was nearly consumed, from which we concluded that the animals we had left here had sheltered themselves during the storm. We refilled the mangers with the hay we had preserved in the loft, and observing the sky getting more and more threatening, we set out without delay for our house, from which we were yet a considerable distance. To avoid Flamingo Marsh, which was towards the sea, and Rice Marsh, towards the rock, we determined to go through Cotton Wood, which would save us from the wind which was ready to blow us off our feet. I was still uneasy about the ship, which the lieutenant had told me was out of repair, but I indulged a hope that they might have taken refuge in some bay, or found anchorage on some hospitable shore, where they might get their vessel into order. Jack was alarmed lest they should fall into the hands of the anthropophagi, who eat men like hares or sheep, of which he had read in some book of travels, and excited the ridicule of his brother, who was astonished at his ready belief of travellers' tales, which he asserted were usually false. "'But Robinson Crusoe would not tell a falsehood,' said Jack indignantly. "'And there were cannibals came to his island.' and were going to eat Friday if he had not saved him. Oh, Robinson could not tell a falsehood, said Fritz, because he never existed. The whole history is a romance. Is that not the name, father, that is given to works of the imagination? It is, said I. But we must not call Robinson Crusoe a romance. Though Robinson himself, and all the circumstances of his history, are probably fictitious. The details are all founded on truth, on the adventures and descriptions of voyagers who may be depended upon, and unfortunate individuals who have actually been wrecked on unknown shores. If ever our journal should be printed, many may believe that it is only a romance, a mere work of the imagination. My boys hoped we should not have to introduce any savages into our romance and were astonished that an island so beautiful had not tempted any to inhabit it. In fact, I had often been myself surprised at this circumstance, but I told them many voyagers had noticed islands apparently fertile, and yet uninhabited. Besides, the chain of rocks which surrounded this might prevent the approach of savages, unless they had discovered the little bay of safety where we had landed. Fritz said he anxiously desired to circumnavigate the island, in order to ascertain the size of it, and if there were similar chains of rocks on the opposite side. I promised him, as soon as the stormy weather was past, and his mother well enough to remove to Tent House, we would take our pinnace and set out on our little voyage. We now approached the marsh, and he begged me to let him go and cut some canes, as he projected making a sort of carriage for his mother. As we were collecting them, he explained his scheme to me. He wished to weave of these reeds, which were very strong, a large and long sort of pannier, in which his mother might sit or recline, and which might be suspended between two strong bamboo canes by handles of rope. He then purposed to yoke two of our most gentle animals, the cow and the ass, the one before and the other behind, between these shafts, the leader to be mounted by one of the children as director, the other would follow naturally, and the good mother would thus be carried, as if in a litter, without any danger of jolting. I was pleased with this idea, and we all set to work to load ourselves each with a huge burden of reeds. They requested me not to tell my wife, 
that they might give her an agreeable surprise. It needed such affection as ours to induce us to the undertaking in such unpropitious weather. It rained in torrents, and the marsh was so soft and wet that we were in danger of sinking at every step. However, I could not be less courageous than my sons, whom nothing daunted, and we soon made up our bundles, and, placing them on our heads, we formed a sort of umbrella which was not without its benefits. We soon arrived at Falcon's Nest. Before we reached the tree, I saw a fire shine to such a distance that I was alarmed, but soon found it was only meant for our benefit by our kind friends at home. When my wife saw the rain falling, she had instructed her little assistant to make a fire in our usual cooking place, at a little distance from the tree, and protected by a canopy of waterproof cloth from the rain. The young cook had not only kept up a good fire to dry us on our return, but had taken the opportunity of roasting two dozen of those excellent little birds which his mother had preserved in butter, and which, all arranged on the old sword which served us as a spit, was just ready for our arrival, and the fire and feast were equally grateful to the hungry, exhausted, and wet travellers who sat down to enjoy them. However, before we sat down to our repast, we went up to see our invalids, whom we found tolerably well, though anxious for our return. Ernest, with his sound hand, and the assistance of Francis, had succeeded in forming a sort of rampart before the opening into the room, composed of the four hammocks in which he and his brothers slept, placed side by side on end. This sufficiently protected them from the rain, but excluded the light, so that they had been obliged to light a candle, and Ernest had been reading to his mother in a book of voyages that had formed part of the captain's small library. It was a singular coincidence that while we were talking of the savages on the way home, they were also reading of them, and I found my dear wife much agitated by the fears these accounts had awakened in her mind. After soothing her terrors, I returned to the fire to dry myself, and to enjoy my repast. Besides the birds, Francis had prepared fresh eggs and potatoes for us. He told me that his mamma had given up her office of cook to him, and assured me that he would perform the duties to our satisfaction, provided he was furnished with materials. Fritz was to hunt, Jack to fish, I was to order dinner, and he would make it ready. "'And when we have neither game nor fish,' said Jack, "'we will attack your poultry-yard.' That was not at all to the taste of poor little Francis who could not bear his favorites to be killed, and who had actually wept over the chicken that was slaughtered to make broth for his mother. We were obliged to promise him that, when other resources failed, we would apply to our barrels of salt fish. He, however, gave us leave to dispose as we liked of the ducks and geese, which were too noisy for him. After we had concluded our repast, we carried a part of it to our friends above and proceeded to give them an account of our expedition. I then secured the hammock somewhat more firmly, to save us from the storm that was still raging, and the hour of rest being at hand, my sons established themselves on mattresses of cotton, made by their kind mother, and in spite of the roaring winds, we were soon in profound repose. The storm continued to rage the whole of the following day and even the day after with the same violence. Happily our tree stood firm, though several branches were broken, amongst others that to which Francis's wire was suspended. I replaced it with more care, carried it beyond our roof, and fixed at the extremity the pointed instrument which had attracted the lightning. I then substituted for the hammocks before the window strong planks, which remained for my building, and which my sons assisted me to raise with pulleys, after having sawed them to the proper length. Through these I made loopholes, to admit the light and air. In order to carry off the rain, I fixed a sort of spout, made of the wood of a tree I had met with, which was unknown to me, though apparently somewhat like the elder. The whole of the tree, almost to the bark, 
was filled up with a sort of pith, easily removed. From this tree I made the pipes for our fountain, and the remainder was now useful for these rain-spouts. I employed those days in which I could not go out, in separating the seeds and grain, of which I saw we should have need, and in mending our work-tools. My sons, in the meantime, nestled under the tree among the roots, were incessantly employed in the construction of the carriage for their mother. The Karatas had nearly completed the cure of Ernest's hand, and he was able to assist his brothers preparing the canes, which Fritz and Jack wove between the flat wooden wands with which they had made the frame of their pannier. They succeeded in making it so strong and close that they might have carried liquids in it. My dear wife's foot and leg were gradually improving, and I took the opportunity of her confinement to reason with her on her false notion of the dangers of the sea, and to represent to her the gloomy prospect of our sons if they were left alone in the island. She agreed with me, but could not resolve to leave it. She hoped God would send some vessel to us which might leave us some society, and after all, if our sons were left, she pointed out to me, that they had our beautiful pinnace, and might at any time of their own accord leave the island. "'And why should we anticipate the evils of futurity, my dear friend?' said she. "'Let us think only of the present. I am anxious now to know if the storm has spared my fine kitchen-garden.' "'You must wait a little,' said I. "'I am as uneasy as you, for my maize plantations, my sugar-canes, and my cornfields.' At last, one night, the storm ceased, the clouds passed away, and the moon showed herself in all her glory. How delighted we were! My wife got me to remove the large planks I placed before the opening, and the bright moonbeams streamed through the branches of the tree into our room. A gentle breeze refreshed us, and so delighted were we in gazing on that sky of promise, that we could scarcely bear to go to bed but spent half the night in projects for the morrow. The good mother alone said that she could not join in our excursions. Jack and Francis smiled at each other, as they thought of their litter, which was now nearly finished. A bright sun awoke us early next morning. Fritz and Jack had requested me to allow them to finish their carriage, so, leaving Ernest with his mother, I took Francis with me, to ascertain the damage done to the garden at Tent House, about which his mother was so anxious. We easily crossed the bridge, but the water had carried away some of the planks. However, my little boy leaped from one plank to another with great agility, although the distance was sometimes considerable. He was so proud of being my sole companion that he scarcely touched the ground as he ran on before me. But he had a sad shock when he got to the garden of which we could not find the slightest trace. All was destroyed. The walks, the fine vegetable beds, the plantations of pines and melons, all had vanished. Francis stood like a marble statue, as pale and still, till, bursting into tears, he recovered himself. "'Oh, my good mamma," said he, "'what will she say when she hears of this misfortune?' "'But she need not know it, Papa,' added he, after a pause. "'It would distress her too much. "'And if you and my brothers will help me, "'we will repair the damage before she can walk. "'The plants may not be so large, "'but the earth is moist, and they will grow quickly, "'and I will work hard to get it into order.' "'I embraced my dear boy, "'and promised him this should be our first work. "'I feared we should have many other disasters to repair.' but a child of twelve years old gave me an example of resignation and courage. We agreed to come next day to begin our labor, for the garden was too well situated for me to abandon it. It was on a gentle declivity at the foot of the rocks, which sheltered it from the north wind, and was conveniently watered from the cascade. I resolved to add a sort of bank or terrace to protect it from the violent rains, and Francis was so pleased with the idea that he began to gather the large stones which were scattered over the garden, and to carry them to the place where I wished to build my terrace. He would have worked all day, if I had allowed him, 
but I wanted to look after my young plantations, my sugar canes, and my fields. And after the destruction I had just witnessed, I had everything to fear. I proceeded to the avenue of fruit trees that led to Tent House, and was agreeably surprised. All were half bowed to the ground, as well as the bamboos that supported them, but few were torn up, and I saw that my sons and I, with a labor of two or three days, could restore them. Some of them had already begun to bear fruit, but all was destroyed for this year. This was, however, a trifling loss compared with what I had anticipated, for having no more plants of European fruits, I could not have replaced them. Besides having resolved to inhabit Tent House at present, entirely, being there defended from storms, it was absolutely necessary to contrive some protection from the heat. My new plantations afforded little shade yet, and I trembled to propose to my wife to come and inhabit these burning rocks. Francis was gathering some of the beautiful unknown flowers of the island for his mother, and when he had formed his nosegay, bringing it to me, "'See, Papa,' said he, "'how the rain has refreshed these flowers. I wish it would rain still. It is so dreadfully hot here. Oh, if we had but a little shade!' "'That is just what I was thinking of, my dear,' said I. "'We shall have shade enough when my trees are grown. But in the meantime—' "'In the meantime, Papa,' said Francis, "'I will tell you what you must do. You must make a very long, broad colonnade before our house, covered with cloth, and open before, so that Mamma may have air and shade at once.' I was pleased with my son's idea and promised him to construct a gallery soon, and call it the Franciade, in honor of him. My little boy was delighted that his suggestion should be thus approved, and begged me not to tell his mamma, as he wished to surprise her, as much as his brothers did with their carriage, and he hoped the Franciade might be finished before she visited Tent House. I assured him I would be silent, and we took the road hence talking about our new colonnade. I projected making it in the most simple and easy way. A row of strong bamboo canes planted at equal distances along the front of our house, and united by a plank of wood at the top, cut into arches between the canes. Others I would place sloping from the rock, to which I would fasten them by iron cramps. These were to be covered with sailcloth, prepared with the elastic gum, and well secured to the plank. This building would not take much time, and I anticipated the pleasure of my wife when she found out that it was an invention of her little favorite, who, of a mild and reflecting disposition, was beloved by us all. As we walked along, we saw something approaching, that Francis soon discovered to be his brothers, with her new carriage, and concluding that his mamma occupied it, he hastened to meet them, lest they should proceed to the garden. But on our approach we discovered that Ernest was in the litter, which was borne by the cow before, on which Fritz was mounted, and by the ass behind, with Jack on it. Ernest declared the conveyance was so easy and delightful that he should often take his mother's place. "'I like that very much,' said Jack. "'Then I will take care that we will harness the onagra and the buffalo for you and they will give you a pretty jolting, I promise you. The cow and ass are only for Mama. Look, Papa, is it not complete? We wish to try it as soon as we finished it, so we got Ernest to occupy it while Mother was asleep. Ernest declared it only wanted two cushions, one to sit upon, the other to recline against to make it perfect, and though I could not help smiling at his love of ease, I encouraged the notion in order to delay my wife's excursion till our plans were completed. I then put Francis into the carriage beside his brother, and ordering Fritz and Jack to proceed with their equipage to inspect our cornfields, I returned to my wife, who was still sleeping. On her awaking, I told her the garden and plantations would require a few days' labor to set them in order, and I should leave Ernest, who was not yet in condition to be a laborer, to nurse her and read to her. My sons returned in the evening, 
and gave me a melancholy account of our cornfields. The corn was completely destroyed, and we regretted this the more, as we had very little left for seed. We had anticipated a feast of real bread, but we were obliged to give up all hope for this year, and to content ourselves with our cakes of cassava and with potatoes. The maize had suffered less, and might have been a resource for us, but the large hard grain was so difficult to reduce to flour fine enough for dough. Fritz often recurred to the necessity of building a mill near the cascade at Tent House, but this was not the work of a moment, and we had time to consider of it, for at present we had no corn to grind. As I found Francis had let his brothers into all our secrets, it was agreed that I, with Fritz, Jack, and Francis, should proceed to Tent House next morning. Francis desired to be of the party, that he might direct the laying out of the garden, he said, with an important air, as he had been his mother's assistant on its formation. We arranged our bag of vegetable seeds, and having bathed my wife's foot with a simple embrocation, we offered our united prayers, and retired to our beds to prepare ourselves for the toils of the next day. We rose early, and after our usual morning duties, we left our invalids for the whole day, taking with us for our dinner a goose and some potatoes, made ready the evening before. We harnessed the bull and the buffalo to the cart, and I sent Fritz and Jack to the wood of bamboos, with orders to load the cart with as many as it would contain, and especially to select some very thick ones for my colonnade. The rest I intended for props for my young trees, and this I proposed to be my first undertaking. Francis would have preferred beginning with the Franciade, or the garden, but he was finally won over by the thoughts of the delicious fruits which we might lose by our neglect, the peaches, plums, pears, and above all the cherries, of which he was very fond. He then consented to assist me in holding the trees whilst I replaced the roots, after which he went to cut the reeds to tie them. Suddenly I heard him cry, Papa, Papa, there is a large chest come for us. Come and take it. I ran to him, and saw it was the very chest we had seen floating, and which we had taken for the boat at a distance. The waves had left it in our bay, entangled in the reeds, which grew abundantly here. It was almost buried in the sand. We could not remove it alone, and, notwithstanding our curiosity, we were compelled to wait for the arrival of my sons. We returned to our work, and it was pretty well advanced when the tired and hungry party returned with their cartload of bamboos. We rested, and sat down to eat our goose. Guavas and sweet acorns, which had escaped the storm, and which my sons brought, completed our repast. Fritz had killed a large bird in the marsh, which I took at first for a young flamingo, but it was a young cassowary, the first I had seen in the island. This bird is remarkable for its extraordinary size, and for its plumage so short and fine that it seems rather to be hair than feathers. I should have liked to have had it alive to ornament our poultry yard, and it was so young we might have tamed it, but Fritz's unerring aim had killed it at once. I wish to let my wife see this rare bird, which, if standing on its webbed feet, would have been four feet high. I therefore forbade them to meddle with it. As we ate, we talked of the chest, and our curiosity being stronger than our hunger, we swallowed our repast hastily, and then ran down to the shore. We were obliged to plunge into the water up to the waist and then had some difficulty to extricate it from the weed and slime, and to push it on shore. No sooner had we placed it in safety than Fritz, with a strong hatchet, forced it open, and we all eagerly crowded to see the contents. Fritz hoped it would be powder and firearms. Jack, who was somewhat fond of dress, had had notions of elegance, declared in favor of clothes, and particularly of linen, finer and whiter than that which his mother wove. If Ernest had been there, books would have been his desire. For my own part, there was nothing I was more anxious for than European seeds, particularly corn. 
Francis had a lingering wish that this chest might contain some of those gingerbread cakes which his grandmamma used to treat him with in Europe, and which he had often regretted. But he kept this wish to himself, fears his brothers should call him Little Glutton, and assured us that he should like a little pocket knife with a small saw better than anything in the world. And he was the only one who had his wish. The chest was opened, and we saw that it was filled with a number of trifling things likely to tempt savage nations and to become the means of exchange, principally glass and ironware, colored beads, pins, needles, looking-glasses, children's toys, constructed as models, such as carts, and tools of every sort, amongst which we found some likely to be useful, such as hatchets, saws, planes, gimlets, etc., besides a collection of knives, of which Francis had the choice, and scissors, which were reserved for Mama, her own being nearly worn out. I had, moreover, the pleasure of finding a quantity of nails of every size and kind, besides iron hooks, staples, etc., which I needed greatly. After we had examined the contents, and selected what we wanted immediately, we closed up the chest and conveyed it to our magazine at Tent House. We had spent so much time in our examination that we had some difficulty to finish propping our trees and to arrive at home before it was dark. We found my wife somewhat uneasy at our lengthened absence, but our appearance soon calmed her. Mother, said I, I have brought back all your chickens to crowd under your wing. And we have not come back empty-handed, said Jack. Look, Mama, here are a beautiful pair of scissors, a large paper of needles, another of pins, and a thimble. How rich you are now, and when you get well, you can make me a pretty waistcoat and a pair of trousers, for I am in great want of them. And I, Mama, said Francis, have brought you a mirror, that you may arrange your cap. You have often been sorry Papa did not remember to bring one from the ship. This was intended for the savages, and I will begin with you. I believe I rather resemble one now said my good Elizabeth, arranging the red and yellow silk handkerchief which she usually wore on her head. "'Only, Mama," said Jack, "'when you wear the comical pointed bonnet which Ernest made you.' "'What matters it,' said she, "'whether it be pointed or round? It will protect me from the sun, and it is the work of my Ernest, to whom I am much obliged.' Ernest, with great ingenuity and patience, had endeavoured to plait his mother a bonnet of the rice straw. He had succeeded, but not knowing how to form the round crown, he was obliged to finish it in a point, to the great and incessant diversion of his brothers. Mother, said Ernest, in his usual grave and thoughtful tone, I should not like you to look like a savage, therefore as soon as I regain the use of my hand, my first work shall be to make you a bonnet which I will take care shall be formed with a round crown, as you will lend me one of your large needles, and I will take, to sew the crown on, the head of either Jack or Francis. "'What do you mean, my head?' said they both together. Oh, "'I don't mean to take it off your shoulders,' said he. "'It will only be necessary that one of you should kneel down before me, for a day, perhaps, while I use your head as a model.' and you need not cry out much if I should chance to push my needle in. This time the philosopher had the laugh on his side, and his tormentors were silenced. We now explained to my wife where we had found the presents we had brought her. My offerings to her were a light axe, which she could use to cut her firewood with, and an iron kettle, smaller and more convenient than the one she had. Fritz had retired, and now came in dragging with difficulty his huge cassowary. "'Here, Mama," said he, "'I brought you a little chicken for your dinner.' And the astonishment and laughter again commenced. The rest of the evening was spent in plucking the bird to prepare part of it for the next day. We then retired to rest, that we might begin our labor early next morning. Ernest chose to remain with his books and his mother, for whom he formed with the 
mattresses a sort of reclining chair, in which she was able to sit up in bed and sew. Thus she endured a confinement of six weeks, without complaint, and in that time got all her clothes put into good order. Francis had nearly betrayed our secret wants, by asking his mamma to make him a mason's apron. "'A mason's apron?' said she. "'Are you going to build a house, child?' "'I, I meant to say a gardener's apron,' said he. His mamma was satisfied, and promised to comply with his request. In the meantime, my three sons and I labored assiduously to get the garden into order again, and to raise the terraces, which we hoped might be a defense against future storms. Fritz had also proposed to me to construct a stone conduit, to bring the water to our kitchen garden from the river, to which we might carry it back after it had passed round our vegetable beds. This was a formidable task, but too useful an affair to be neglected and, aided by the geometrical skill of Fritz and the ready hands of my two younger boys, the conduit was completed. I took an opportunity at the same time to dig a pond above the garden, into which the conduit poured the water. This was always warm with the sun, and, by means of a sluice, we were able to disperse it in little channels to water the garden. The pond would also be useful to preserve small fish and crabs for use. We next proceeded to our embankment. This was intended to protect the garden from any extraordinary overflow of the river, and from the water running from the rocks after heavy rains. We then laid out our garden on the same plan as before, except that I made the walks wider, and not so flat. I carried one directly to our house, which, in the autumn, I intended to plant with shrubs, that my wife might have a shady avenue to approach her garden, where I also planned an arbor, furnished with seats, as a resting place for her. The rocks were covered with numerous climbing plants, bearing every variety of elegant flower, and I had only to make my selection. All this work, with the enclosing the garden, with palisades of bamboo, occupied us about a fortnight, in which time our invalids made great progress towards their recovery. After the hole was finished, Francis entreated me to begin his gallery. My boys approved of the plan, and Fritz declared that the house was certainly comfortable and commodious, but that it would be wonderfully improved by a colonnade, with a little pavilion at each end, and a fountain in each pavilion. I never heard a word of these pavilions, said I. No, said Jack, they are our own invention. The colonnade will be called the Franciade, and we wish our little pavilions to be named the one Fritzia and the other Jackia, if you please. I agreed to this reasonable request, and only begged to know how they would procure water for their fountains. Fritz undertook to bring the water, if I would only assist them in completing this little scheme, to give pleasure to their beloved mother. I was charmed to see the zeal and anxiety of my children to oblige their tender mother. Her illness seemed to have strengthened their attachment. They thought only how to console and amuse her. She sometimes told me she really blessed the accident, which had taught her how much she was valued by all around her. The next day was Sunday, our happy Sabbath for repose and quiet conversation at home. After passing the day in our usual devotions and sober reading, my three elder boys requested my permission to walk towards our farm in the evening. On their return they informed me it would be necessary to give a few days' labor to our plantations of maize and potatoes. I therefore determined to look to them. Though I was out early next morning, I found Fritz and Jack had been gone some time, leaving only the ass in the stables, which I secured for my own little Francis. I perceived also that they had dismounted my cart and carried away the wheels, from which I concluded that they had met with some tree in their walk the preceding evening, suitable for the pipes for their fountains, and that they had now returned to cut it down and convey it to Tent House. As I did not know where to meet with them, I proceeded with Francis on the ass to commence his favorite work. 
I drew my plan on the ground first. At the distance of twelve feet from the rock which formed the front of our house, I marked a straight line of fifty feet, which I divided into ten spaces of five feet each for my colonnade. The two ends were to be reserved for the two pavilions my sons wished to build. I was busy in my calculations, and Francis placing stakes in the places where I wished to dig, when the cart drove up with our two good laborers. They had, as I expected, found the evening before, a species of pine well adapted for their pipes. They had cut down four, of fifteen or twenty feet in length, which they had brought on the wheels of the cart drawn by the four animals. They had had some difficulty in transporting them to the place, and the greatest still remained, the boring the trunks and then uniting them firmly. I had neither augers nor any tools fit for the purpose. I had certainly constructed a little fountain at Falcon's Nest, but the stream was near at hand, and was easily conveyed by our cane pipes to our tortoise-shell basin. Here the distance was considerable, the ground unequal, and to have the water pure and cool, underground pipes were necessary. I thought of large bamboos, but Fritz pointed out the knots, and the difficulty of joining the pieces, and begged me to leave it to him, as he had seen fountains made in Switzerland, and had no fears of success. In the meantime, all hands set to work at the arcade. We selected twelve bamboos of equal height and thickness, and fixed them securely in the earth at five feet from each other. These formed a pretty colonnade, and were work enough for one day. We took care to divert all inquiries at night by discussing the subjects which our invalids had been reading during the day. The little library of our captain was very choice. Besides the voyages and travels, which interested them greatly, there was a good collection of historians, and some of the best poets, for which Ernest had no little taste. However, he requested earnestly that he might be of our party next day, and Francis, good-naturedly, offered to stay with Mama, expecting, no doubt, Ernest's congratulations on the forward state of the Franciade. The next morning... Ernest and I set out, his brothers having preceded us. Poor Ernest regretted, as we went, that he had no share in these happy schemes for his mother. I reminded him, however, of his dutiful care of her during her sickness, and all his endeavours to amuse her. And besides, added I, did you not make her a straw bonnet? Yes, said he, and I now remember what a frightful shape it was. I will try to make a better and will go to-morrow morning to choose my straw. As we approached Tent House, we heard a most singular noise echoing at intervals amongst the rocks. We soon discovered the cause. In a hollow of the rocks I saw a very hot fire which Jack was blowing through a cane, whilst Fritz was turning amidst the embers a bar of iron. When it was red-hot, they laid it on an anvil I had brought from the ship, and struck it alternately with hammers to bring it to a point. "'Well done, my young smiths,' said I. "'We ought to try all things, and keep what is good. Do you expect to succeed in making your auger? I suppose that is what you want.' "'Yes, father,' said Fritz. "'We should succeed well enough if we only had a good pair of bellows. You see, we have already got a tolerable point.' Now Fritz could not believe anything was impossible. He had killed a kangaroo the evening before, and skinned it. The flesh made us a dinner. Of the skin he determined to make a pair of bellows. He nailed it, with the hair out, not having time to tan it, to two flat pieces of wood, with holes in them. To this he added a reed for the pipe. He then fixed it by means of a long cord and a post to the side of his fire, and Jack, with his hand or foot, blew the fire, so that the iron was speedily red-hot and quite malleable. I then showed them how to twist the iron into a screw, rather clumsy, but which would answer the purpose tolerably well. At one end they formed a ring, in which we placed a piece of wood transversely, to enable them to turn the screw. We then made a trial of it. 
we placed a tree on two props, and Fritz and I managed the auger so well that we had our tree pierced through in a very little time, working first at one end and then at the other. Jack, in the meantime, collected the shavings we made, which he deposited in the kitchen for his mother's use, to kindle the fire. Ernest, meanwhile, was walking about, making observations, and giving his advice to his brothers on the architecture of their pavilions, till, seeing that they were going to bore another tree, he retired into the garden to see the embankment. He returned delighted with the improvements, and much disposed to take some employment. He wanted to assist in boring the tree, but we could not all work at it. I undertook this labor myself, and sent him to blow the bellows, while his brothers labored at the forge, the work not being too hard for his lame hand. My young smiths were engaged in flattening the iron to make joints to unite their pipes. They succeeded very well, and then began to dig the ground to lay them. Ernest, knowing something of geometry and land surveying, was able to give them some useful hints, which enabled them to complete their work successfully. Leaving them to do this, I employed myself in covering in my long colonnade. After I had placed on my columns a plank cut in arches, which united them, and was firmly nailed to them, I extended from it bamboos, placed sloping against the rock, and secured to it by cramps of iron the work of my young smiths. When my bamboo roof was solidly fixed, the canes as close as possible, I filled the interstices with a clay I found near the river, and poured gum over it. I had thus an impervious and brilliant roof, which appeared to be varnished and striped green and brown. I then raised the floor a foot in order that there might be no damp and paved it with the square stones I had preserved when we cut the rock. It must be understood that all this was the work of many days. I was assisted by Jack and Fritz, and by Ernest and Francis alternately, one always remaining with his mother, who was still unable to walk. Ernest employed his time, when at home, in making the straw bonnet, without either borrowing his brother's head for a model or letting any of them know what he was doing. Nevertheless, he assisted his brothers with their pavilions by his really valuable knowledge. They formed them very elegantly, something like a Chinese pagoda. They were exactly square, supported on four columns, and rather higher than the gallery. The roofs terminated in a point, and resembled a large parasol. The fountains were in the middle, the basins breast-high, were formed of the shells of two turtles from our reservoir, which were mercilessly sacrificed for the purpose, and furnished our table abundantly for some days. They succeeded the cassowary, which had supplied us very seasonably. Its flesh tasted like beef, and made excellent soup. But to return to the fountains. Ernest suggested the idea of ornamenting the end of the perpendicular pipe, which brought the water to the basin, with shells, every sort might be collected on the shore, of the most brilliant colors and curious and varied shapes. He was passionately devoted to natural history, and had made a collection of these, endeavoring to classify them from the descriptions he met with in the books of voyages and travels. Some of these, of the most dazzling beauty, were placed round the pipe, which had been plastered with clay. From thence the water was received into a volute, shaped like an antique urn, and again was poured gracefully into the large turtle shell. A small channel conveyed it then out of the pavilions. The whole was completed in less time than I could have imagined, and greatly surpassed my expectations, conferring an inestimable advantage on her dwelling, by securing us from the heat. All honor was rendered to Master Francis the inventor, and the Franciade was written in large letters on the middle arch. Fritzia and Jackia were written in the same way over the pavilions. Ernest alone was not named, and he seemed somewhat affected by it. He had acquired a great taste for rambling and botanizing, 
and had communicated it also to Fritz. And now that our labors were ended at Tent House, they left us to nurse our invalid, and made long excursions together, which lasted sometimes whole days. As they generally returned with some game or some new fruit, we pardoned their absence, and they were always welcome. Sometimes they brought a kangaroo, sometimes an agouti, the flesh of which resembles that of a rabbit, but is richer. Sometimes they brought wild ducks, pigeons, and even partridges. These were contributed by Fritz, who never went out without his gun and his dogs. Ernest brought us natural curiosities, which amused us much. Stones, crystals, petrifactions, insects, butterflies of rare beauty, and flowers, whose colors and fragrance no one in Europe can form an idea of. Sometimes he brought fruit, which we always administered first to our monkey as taster. Some of them proved very delicious. Two of his discoveries especially were most valuable acquisitions. The Guajaraba, on the large leaf of which one may write with a pointed instrument, and the fruit of which, a sort of grape, is very good to eat. Also the date palm, every part of which is so useful that we were truly thankful to heaven, and our dear boys for the discovery. Whilst young, the trunk contains a sort of marrow, very delicious. The date palm is crowned by a head formed of from forty to eighty leafy branches which spread round the top. The dates are particularly good about half-dried, and my wife immediately began to preserve them. My sons could only bring the fruit now, but we proposed to transplant some of the trees themselves near our abode. We did not discourage our sons in these profitable expeditions, but they had another aim, which I was yet ignorant of. In the meantime, I usually walked with one of my younger sons towards Tent House to attend to our garden, and to see if our works continued in good condition to receive Mama, who daily improved. But I insisted on her being completely restored before she was introduced to them. Our dwelling looked beautiful amongst the picturesque rocks, surrounded by trees of every sort, and facing the smooth and lovely Bay of Safety. The garden was not so forward as I could have wished, but we were obliged to be patient, and hope for the best. One day, having gone over with my younger sons to weed the garden, and survey our possessions, I perceived that the roof of the gallery wanted a little repair, and called Jack to raise for me the rope ladder which I had brought from Falcon's Nest, and which had been very useful while we were constructing the roof. But we sought for it everywhere. It could not be found and as we were quite free from robbers in our island, I could only accuse my elder sons, who had doubtless carried it off to ascend some tall coconut tree. Obliged to be content, we walked into the garden by the foot of the rocks. Since our arrival, I had been somewhat uneasy at hearing a dull, continued noise, which appeared to proceed from this side. The forge we had passed, now extinguished, and our workmen were absent. Passing along close to the rocks, the noise became more distinct, and I was truly alarmed. Could it be an earthquake? Or perhaps it announced some volcanic explosion? I stopped before that part of the rock where the noise was loudest. The surface was firm and level, but from time to time blows and falling stones seemed to strike our ears. I was uncertain what to do. Curiosity prompted me to stay but a sort of terror urged me to remove my child and myself. However, Jack, always daring, was unwilling to go till he had discovered the cause of the phenomenon. If Francis were here, said he, he would fancy it was the wicked gnomes working underground, and he would be in a fine fright. For my part, I believe it is only people come to collect the salt in the rock. People, said I, you don't know what you're saying, Jack. I could excuse Francis and his gnomes, it would be at least a poetic fancy, but yours is quite absurd. Where are the people to come from? Well, what else can it be? said he. Hark! You may hear them strike the rock. Be certain, however, said I. There are no people. At that moment I distinctly heard human voices, speaking, laughing, and apparently clapping their hands. I could not distinguish any words. 
I was struck with the mortal terror, but Jack, whom nothing could alarm, clapped his hands also, with joy that he had guessed right. What did I say, Papa? Was I not right? Are there not people within the rock? Friends, I hope. He was approaching the rock, when it appeared to me to be shaking. A stone soon fell down, then another. I seized hold of Jack to drag him away, lest he should be crushed by the fragments of rock. At that moment another stone fell, and we saw two heads appear through the opening, the heads of Fritz and Ernest. Judge of our surprise and joy. Jack was soon through the opening, and assisting his brothers to enlarge it. As soon as I could enter, I stepped in, and found myself in a real grotto of a round form with a vaulted roof, divided by a narrow crevice which admitted the light and air. It was, however, better lighted by two large gourd lamps. I saw my long ladder of ropes suspended from the opening at the top, and thus comprehended how my sons had penetrated into this recess, which it was impossible to suspect the existence of from the outside. But how had they discovered it? And what were they making of it? These were my two questions. Ernest replied at once to the last. I wished, said he, to make a resting place for my mother when she came to her garden. My brothers have each built some place for her and called it by their name. I had a desire that some place in our island might be dedicated to Ernest, and I now present to you the Grotto Ernestine. And after all, said Jack, it will make a pretty dwelling for the first of us that marries. Silence, little giddy pate, said I. Where do you expect to find a wife in this island? Do you think you shall discover one among the rocks, as your brothers have discovered the grotto? But tell me, Fritz, what directed you here? Our good star, father, said he. Ernest and I were walking round these rocks, and talking of his wish for a resting place for my mother on her way to the garden. He projected a tent, but the path was too narrow to admit it, and the rock heated by the sun was like a stove. We were considering what we should do when I saw on the summit of the rock a very beautiful little unknown quadruped. From its form I should have taken it as a young chamois, if I had been in Switzerland, but Ernest reminded me that the chamois was peculiar to cold countries, and he thought it was a gazelle or antelope, probably the gazelle of Guinea or Java, called by naturalists the Chevrotain. You may suppose I tried to climb the rock on which this little animal remained standing, with one foot raised, and its pretty head turning first to one side and then to the other, but it was useless to attempt it here where the rock was smooth and perpendicular. Besides, I should have put the gazelle to flight, as it is a timid and wild animal. I then remembered that there was a place near Tent House, where a considerable break occurred in the chain of rocks, and we found that, with a little difficulty, the rock might be scaled by ascending this ravine. Ernest laughed at me, and asked me if I expected the antelope would wait patiently till I got to it. No matter, I determined to try and I told him to remain, but he soon determined to accompany me, for he fancied that in the fissure of a rock he saw a flower of a beautiful rose color, which was unknown to him. My learned botanist thought it might be an erica, or heath, and wished to ascertain the fact. One helping the other, we soon got through all difficulties, and arrived at the summit, and here we were amply repaid by the beautiful prospect on every side. We will talk of that afterwards, father. I have formed some idea of the country which these rocks separate us from. But to return to our grotto. I went along, first looking for my pretty gazelle, which I saw licking a piece of rock where, doubtless, she found some salt. I was hardly a hundred yards from her, my gun ready, when I was suddenly stopped by a crevice which I could not cross, though the opening was not very wide. The pretty quadruped was on a rock opposite to me, but of what use would it have been to shoot it when I could not secure it? I was obliged to defer it until a better opportunity offered, and turned to examine the opening, which appeared deep. Still I could see that the bottom of the cavity was white, like that of our former grotto. I called Ernest, who was behind me with his plants and stones, to impart to him an idea that suddenly struck me. It was to make this the retreat for my mother. 
I told him that I believed the floor of the cave was nearly on a level with the path that led to the garden, and we had only to make an opening in the form of a natural grotto, and it would be exactly what he wished. Ernest was much pleased with the idea, and said he could easily ascertain the level by means of a weight attached to a string. But though he was startled at the difficulty of descending to our labor every day, and returning in the evening, he would not agree to my wish of beginning at the outside of the rock, as we had done in our former grotto. He had several reasons for wishing to work from within. In the first place, said he, it will be so much cooler this summer weather, we should be soon unable to go on laboring before the burning rock. Then our path is so narrow that we should not know how to dispose of the rubbish. In the interior it will serve us to make a bench round the grotto. Besides, I should have such pleasure in completing it secretly, and unsuspected, without any assistance or advice except yours, my dear Fritz, which I accept with all my heart, so pray find some means of descending and ascending readily. I immediately recollected your rope ladder, father. It was forty feet long, and we could easily fasten it to the point of the rock. Ernest was delighted and sanguine. We returned with all speed. We took first a roll of cord and some candles, then the rope ladder, which we rolled up as well as we could, but had great difficulty in conveying it up to the rock. Once or twice, when the ascent was very difficult, we were obliged to fasten a cord to it and draw it up after us. But determination, courage, and perseverance overcame all obstacles. We arrived at the opening, and, on sounding it, we were glad to find our ladder would be long enough to reach the bottom. We then measured the outside of the rock, and ascertained that the floor of the grotto was near the same level as the ground outside. We remembered your lessons, father, and made some experiments to discover if it contained mephitic air. We first lighted some candles, which were not extinguished. We then kindled a large heap of sticks and dried grass, which burned well the smoke passing through the opening like a chimney. Having no uneasiness about this, we deferred our commencement till the next day. Then we lighted the forge and pointed some iron bars we found in the magazine. These were to be our tools to break open the rock. We secured also your chisel, as well as some hammers, and all our tools were thrown down below. We then arranged two gourds to serve us for lamps, and when all was ready, and our ladder firmly fixed, we descended ourselves, and we have nothing more to tell you, except that we were very glad when we heard your voices outside, at the very time when our work was drawing to an end. We were sure, when we distinguished your voices so clearly, that we must be near the external air. We redoubled our efforts, and here we are. Now tell us, father, are you pleased with our idea, and will you forgive us for making a mystery of it? I assured them of my forgiveness, and my cordial approbation of their manly and useful enterprise, and made Ernest happy by declaring that it should always be called the Grotto Ernestine. "'Thanks to you all, my dear children,' said I. "'Your dear mamma will now prefer Tent House to Falcon's Nest, and will have no occasion to risk breaking a limb and descending a winding staircase. I will assist you to enlarge the opening, and as we will leave it, all the simplicity of a natural grotto, it will soon be ready. We all set to work. Jack carried away the loosened stones and rubbish, and formed benches on each side of the grotto. With what had fallen outside, he also made two seats in the front of the rock, and before evening all was complete. Fritz ascended to unfasten the ladder, and to convey it by an easier road to Tent House. He then rejoined us, and we returned to our castle in the air, which was henceforward only to be looked on as a pleasure house. We resolved, however, to establish here, as we had done at our farm, a colony of our cattle, which increased daily. We had now a number of young cows, and which were most useful for our support. We wished, however, for a female buffalo, as the milk of that animal makes excellent cheese. Conversing on our future plans, we soon reached home, and found all well. In a few days we completed the Grotto Ernestine. It contained some stalactites, but not so many as our former grotto. 
We found, however, a beautiful block of salt, all resembled white marble, of which Ernest formed a sort of altar, supported by four pillars, on which he placed a pretty vase of citron wood, which he had turned himself, and in which he arranged some of the beautiful erica which had been the cause of his discovering the grotto. It was one of those occasions when his feelings overcame his natural indolence, when he became for a time the most active of the four, and brought forward all his resources, which were many. This indolence was merely physical, when not excited by any sudden circumstance, or by some fancy which soon assumed the character of a passion. He loved ease, and to enjoy life tranquilly and study. He improved his mind continually, as well by his excellent memory, as by natural talent and application. He reflected, made experiments, and was always successful. He had at last succeeded in making his mother a very pretty bonnet. He had also composed some verses which were intended to celebrate her visit to Tent House, and this joyful day being at last fixed, the boys all went over, the evening before, to make their preparations. The flowers that the storm had spared were gathered to ornament the fountains, the altar, and the table, on which was placed an excellent cold dinner, entirely prepared by themselves. Fritz supplied and roasted the game, a fine bustard, the flesh of which resembles a turkey, and a brace of partridges. Ernest brought pines, melons, and figs. Jack should have supplied the fish, but was able only to procure oysters, crabs, and turtles' eggs. Francis had the charge of the dessert, which consisted of a dish of strawberries, honeycomb, and the cream of the coconut. I had contributed a bottle of canary wine, that we might drink Mama's health. All was arranged on a table in the middle of the Franciade, and my sons returned to accompany the expedition next day. The morning was beautiful, and the sun shone brightly on our emigration. My wife was anxious to set out, expecting that she should have to return to her dwelling. Though her leg and foot were better, she still walked feebly, and she begged us to harness the cow and ass to the cart, and to lead them as gently as possible. "'I will only go a little way the first day,' said she, "'for I am not strong enough to visit Tent House yet.' We felt quite convinced that she would change her opinion when once in her litter. I wished to carry her down the staircase, but she declined, and descended very well with the help of my arm. When the door was opened, and she found herself once more in the open air, surrounded by her children, she thanked God with tears of gratitude for her recovery, and all His mercies to us. Then the pretty Osher carriage arrived. They had harnessed the cow and young bull to it. Francis, answering for the docility of Valiant, provided he guided him himself. Accordingly, he was mounted before, his cane in his hand, and his bow and quiver on his back, very proud to be Mama's charioteer. My other three boys, mounted on their animals, were ready before, to form the advance guard, while I proposed to follow and watch over the whole. My wife was moved even to tears, and could not cease admiring her new carriage, which Fritz and Jack presented to her as their own work. Francis, however, boasted that he had carted the cotton for the soft cushion on which she was to sit, and I that I had made it. I then lifted her in, and as soon as she was seated, Ernest came to put her new bonnet on her head, which greatly delighted her. It was of fine straw, and so thick and firm that it might even defend her from the rain. But what pleased her most was that it was the shape worn by the Swiss peasants in the canton of Vaud, where my dear wife had resided some time in her youth. She thanked all her dear children, and felt so easy and comfortable in her new conveyance, that we arrived at Family Bridge without her feeling the least fatigue. Here we stopped. "'Would you like to cross here, my dear?' said I. "'And as we are very near, look in at your convenient tent-house, where you will have no staircase to ascend. And we should like to know, too, if you approve of our management of your garden.' "'As you please,' said she. "'In fact, I am so comfortable in my carriage that if it were necessary I could make the tour of the island.' 
I should like to see my house again, but it will be so very hot at this season that we must not stay long. "'But you must dine there, my dear mother,' said Fritz. "'It is too late to return to dinner at Falcon's Nest. Consider, too, the fatigue it would occasion you.' "'I would be very glad indeed, my dear,' said she. "'But what are we to dine on? We have prepared no provision, and I fear we shall all be hungry.' "'Oh, what matter?' said Jack. "'Provided you dine with us. You must take your chance. I will go and get some oysters, that we may not die of hunger.' and off he galloped on his buffalo. Fritz followed him, on some pretense, on Lightfoot. Mama wished that she had brought a vessel to carry some water from the river, for she knew we could get none at Tent House. Francis reminded her we could milk the cow, and she was satisfied, and enjoyed her journey much. At last we arrived before the colonnade. My wife was dumb with wonder for some moments. "'Where am I?' "'And what do I see?' said she, when she could speak. "'You see the Franciad, mamma," said her little boy. "'This beautiful colonnade was my invention, to protect you from the heat. Stay, read what is written above. Francis to his dear mother, may this colonnade, which is called the Franciad, be to her a temple of happiness.' Now, Mama, lean on me, and come and see my brother's gifts, much better than mine. And he led her to Jack's pavilion, who was standing by the fountain. He held a shell in his hand, which he filled with water, and drank, saying, To the health of the Queen of the Island, may she have no more accidents, and live as long as her children. Long live Queen Elizabeth, and may she come every day to Jackia, to drink her son Jack's health. I supported my wife, and was almost as much affected as herself. She wept and trembled with joy and surprise. Jack and Ernest then joined their hands, and carried her to the other pavilion, where Fritz was waiting to receive her, and the same scene of tenderness ensued. "'Accept this pavilion, dear mother,' said he, "'and may Fritzia ever make you think on Fritz.' The delighted mother embraced them all, and observing Ernest's name was not commemorated by any trophy, thanked him again for her beautiful bonnet. She then drank some of the delicious water of the fountain, and returned to seat herself at the repast, which was another surprise for her. We all made an excellent dinner, and at the dessert I handed my canary wine round in shells, and then Ernest rose and sung us very prettily to a familiar air some little verses he had composed. On this festive happy day, let us pour our grateful lay, since heaven has hushed our mother's pain and given her to her sons again. Then from this quiet, lovely home, never, never may we roam. All we love around us smile, joyful is our desert isle. When o'er our mother's couch we bent, fervent prayers to heaven we sent, and God has spared that mother dear to bless her happy children here. Then from this quiet, lovely home, never, never may we roam. All we love around us smile, joyful is our desert isle. We all joined in the chorus, and none of us thought of the ship, of Europe, or of anything that was passing in the world. The island was our universe, and Tent House was a palace we would not have exchanged for any the world contained. This was one of those happy days that God grants us sometimes on earth, to give us an idea of the bliss of heaven, and most fervently did we thank Him, at the end of our repast, for all His mercies and blessings to us. After dinner I told my wife she must not think of returning to Falcon's Nest, with all its risk of storms and the winding staircase, and she could not better recompense her sons for their labors than by living among them. She was of the same opinion, and was very glad to be so near her kitchen and her stores, and to be able to walk alone with the assistance of a stick in the colonnade, which she could do already. But she made me promise to leave Falcon's Nest as it was. It would be a pretty place to walk to, and besides, this castle in the air was her own invention. We agreed that this very evening she should take possession of her own pretty room, 
with the good felt carpet, on which she could walk without fear, and that on the next day I should go with my elder sons and the animals to bring the cart, such utensils as we needed, and above all, the poultry. Our dogs always followed their masters, as well as the monkey and jackal, and they were so domesticated we had no trouble with them. I then prevailed on my wife to go into her room and rest for an hour, after which we were to visit the garden. She complied, and after her repose found her four sons ready to carry her in her litter as in a sedan chair. They took care to bring her straight to the grotto, where I was waiting for her. This was a new surprise for the good mother. She could not sufficiently express her astonishment and delight when Jack and Francis, taking their flagellets, accompanied their brothers, who sung the following verse, which Ernest had added to his former attempt. Dear mother, let this gift be mine, except the grotto Ernestine. May all your hours be doubly blessed within this tranquil place of rest. Then from this quiet, lovely home, never, never may we roam. All we love around us smile, joyful is our desert isle. What cause had we to rejoice in our children? We could not but shed tears to witness their affection and perfect happiness. Below the vase of flowers, on the block of salt, Ernest had written. Ernest, assisted by his brother Fritz, has prepared this grotto as a retreat for his beloved mother when she visits her garden. Ernest then conducted his mother to one of the benches which he had covered with soft moss as a seat for her, and there she rested at her ease to hear the history of the discovery of the grotto. It was now my turn to offer my present, the garden, the embankment, the pond, and the arbor. She walked, supported by my arm, to view her little empire, and her delight was extreme. The pond, which enabled her to water her vegetables, particularly pleased her, as well as her shady arbor, under which she found all her gardening tools, ornamented with flowers, and augmented by two light watering pans, constructed by Jack and Francis from two gourds. They had canes for spouts, with the gourd bottles at the end, pierced with holes, through which the water came in the manner of a watering pan. The embankment was also a great surprise. She proposed to place plants of pines and melons on it, and I agreed to it. Truly did she rejoice at the appearance of the vegetables, which promised us some excellent European provision, a great comfort to her. After expressing her grateful feelings, she returned to the grotto, and seating herself in her sedan chair, returned to Tent House, to enjoy the repose she needed after such a day of excitement. We did not, however, lie down before we had together thanked God for the manifold blessings He had given us, and for the pleasure of that day. If I had been in Europe, said my dear wife, on the festival of my recovery, I should have received a nosegay, a ribbon, or some trinket. Here I have been presented a carriage, a colonnade, pavilions, ornamental fountains, a large grotto, a garden, a pond, an arbor, and a straw bonnet. The next and following days were spent in removing our furniture and property, particularly our poultry, which had multiplied greatly. We also constructed a poultry yard at a sufficient distance from our house to save our sleep from disturbance, and still so near that we could easily tend them. We made it as a continuation of the colonnade, and on the same plan, but enclosed in the front by a sort of wire trellis work, which Fritz and Jack made wonderfully well. Fritz, who had a turn for architecture and mechanics, gave me some good hints, especially one which we put into execution. This was to carry the water from the basin of the fountain through the poultry yard, which enabled us also to have a little pond for our ducks. The pigeons had their abode above the hen roosts in some pretty baskets, which Ernest and Francis made similar to those made by the savages of the Friendly Isles, of which they had seen engravings in Cook's voyages. When all was finished, my wife was delighted to think that, even in the rainy season, she could attend to her feathered family and collect their eggs. 
"'What a difference!' said she, admiring the elegance of our buildings. "'What a difference between this tent-house and the original dwelling that suggested the name to us, and which was our only shelter four years ago! What a surprising progress luxury has made with us in that time! Do you remember, my dear, the barrel which served us for a table, and the oyster-shells for spoons, and the tent where we slept, crowded together on dried leaves, and without undressing, and the river half a mile off, where we were obliged to go to drink if we were thirsty? Compared to what we were then, we are now great lords. "'Kings, you mean, Mama," said Jack, "'for all this island is ours, and it is quite like a kingdom.' and how many millions of subjects does prince jack reckon in the kingdom of his august father said i prince jack declared he had not yet counted the parrots kangaroos agoutis and monkeys the laughter of his brothers stopped him i then agreed with my wife that our luxuries had increased but i explained to her that this was the result of our industry all civilized nations have commenced as we did Necessity has developed the intellect which God has given to man alone, and by degrees the arts have progressed, and knowledge has extended more, perhaps, than is conducive to happiness. What appeared luxury to us now was still simplicity compared with the luxury of towns, or even villages among civilized nations. My wife declared she had everything she wished for, and should not know what more to ask for as we now had only to rest and enjoy our happiness. I declared against spending our time in rest and indolence as the sure means of ending our pleasure, and I well knew my dear wife was, like myself, an enemy to idleness, but she dreaded any more laborious undertakings. But, Mama, said Fritz, you must let me make a mill under the cascade. It will be so useful when our corn grows, and even now for the maize. I also think of making an oven in the kitchen, which will be very useful for you to bake your bread in. These would indeed be useful labors, said the good mother, smiling. But can you accomplish them? I hope so, said Fritz, with the help of God and that of my dear brothers. Ernest promised his best aid in return for his brother's kind services in forming his grotto, only requesting occasional leisure for his natural history collections. His mother did not see the utility of these collections, but, willing to indulge her kind and attentive earnest, she offered, till she could walk well, to assist him in arranging and labeling his plants, which were yet in disorder, and he gratefully consented. In procuring her some paper for the purpose, of which I had brought a large quantity from the vessel, I brought out an unopened packet amongst which was a piece of some fabric, neither paper nor stuff, apparently. We examined it together, and at length remembered it was a piece of stuff made at Odahaita, which our captain had bought of a native at an island where we had touched on our voyage. Fritz appearing much interested in examining this cloth, Ernest said gravely, I can teach you how to make it and immediately bringing Cook's Voyages, where a detailed description is given, he proceeded to read it. Fritz was disappointed to find it could only be made of the bark of three trees. Of these our island produced only one. These trees were the mulberry tree, the breadfruit, and the wild fig. We had the last in abundance, but of the two former we had not yet discovered a single plant. Fritz was not, however, discouraged. They ought to be here, said he, since they are found in all the South Sea Islands. Perhaps we may find them on the other side of the rocks, where I saw some superb unknown trees from the height where we discovered the grotto. And who knows, but I may find my pretty gazelle there again. The rogue can leap better than I can over those rocks. I had a great wish to descend them, but found it impossible. Some are very high and perpendicular." Others have overhanging summits. I might, however, get round as you did by the pass, between the torrent and the rocks at Great Bay. Jack offered to be his guide, even with his eyes shut, into that rich country where he conquered and captured his buffalo. And Ernest begged to be of the party. 
As this was an expedition I had long projected, I agreed to accompany them next day, their mother being content to have Francis left with her as a protector. I cautioned Fritz not to fire off his gun when we approached the buffaloes, as any show of hostility might render them furious. Otherwise the animals, unaccustomed to man, had no fear of him, and will not harm him. In general, added I, I cannot sufficiently recommend to you to be careful of your powder. We have not more than will last us a year, and there may be a necessity to have recourse to it for our defense. I have a plan for making it, said Fritz, who never saw a difficulty in anything. I know it is composed of charcoal, saltpeter, and sulfur, and we ought to find all these materials in the island. It is only necessary to combine them and to form it into little round grains. This is my only difficulty, but I will consider it over, and I have my mill to think on first. I have a confused recollection of a powder manufactory at Bern. There was some machinery which went by water. This machinery moved some hammers, which pounded and mixed the ingredients. Was this not the case, father? Something like it, said I. But we have many things to do before making powder. First, we must go to sleep. We must set out before daybreak, if we intend to return tomorrow evening. We did indeed rise before the sun, which would not rise for us. The sky was very cloudy, and shortly we had an abundant and incessant rain, which obliged us to defer our journey, and put us all in bad humor. But my wife, who was not sorry to keep us with her, and who declared this gracious rain would water her garden, and bring it forward. Fritz was the first who consoled himself. He thought on nothing but building mills and manufacturing gunpowder. He begged me to draw him a mill. This was very easy, so far as regards the exterior, that is, the wheel and the waterfall that sets it in motion, but the interior, the disposition of the wheels, the stones to bruise the grain, the sieve or bolter to separate the flour from the bran. All this complicated machinery was difficult to explain, but he comprehended all, adding his usual expression, I will try, and I will succeed. Not to lose any time, and to profit by this rainy day, he began by making sieves of different materials, which he fastened to a circle of pliant wood, and tried by passing through them the flower of the cassava. He made some with sailcloth, others with the hair of the onagra, which is very long and strong, and some of the fibers of bark. His mother admired his work, which he continued to improve more and more. She assured him the sieve would be sufficient for her. It was useless to have the trouble of building a mill. "'But how shall we bruise the grain, Mama? said he. "'It would be tedious and hard work.' "'And you think there will be no hard work in building your mill?' said Jack. I'm curious to see how you will contrive to form that huge stone, which is called the millstone. You shall see, said Fritz. Only find me the stone, and it shall soon be done. Do you think, father, that of our rock would be suitable? I told him I thought it would be hard enough, but it would be difficult to cut from the rock a piece large enough for the purpose. He made his usual reply. I will try. Ernest and Jack will assist me, and perhaps you, papa. I declared my willingness, but named him the master mason. We must only be his workmen. Francis was impatient to see the mill in operation. Oh, said Jack, you shall soon have that pleasure. It is a mere trifle. We only want stone, wood, tools, and science. At the word science, Ernest, who was reading in a corner without listening to us, raised his head suddenly, saying, well, "'What science are you in need of?' "'Of one you know nothing of, Mr. Philosopher,' said Jack. "'Come, tell us. Do you know how to build a mill?' "'A mill?' answered Ernest. "'Of what description? There are many sorts. I was just looking in my dictionary for it. There are corn mills and powder mills, oil mills, wind mills, water mills, hand mills, and saw mills. Which do you want?' Fritz would have liked them all. You remind me, said I, that we brought from the vessel a hand-mill and a saw-mill, 
taken to pieces, to be sure, but numbered and labeled, so that they might easily be united. They should be in the magazine, where you found the anvil and iron bars. I had forgotten them. Let's go and examine them, said Fritz, lighting his lantern. I shall get some ideas from them. Rather, said his mother, they will spare you the trouble of thinking and laboring. I sent them all four to seek these treasures, which, heaped in an obscure corner of the storeroom, had escaped my recollection. When we were alone, I seriously besought my wife not to oppose any occupations our children might plan, however they might seem beyond their power, the great point being to keep them continually occupied so that no evil or dangerous fancies might fill their minds. Let them, I said, cut stone, fell trees, or dig fountains, and bless God that their thoughts are so innocently directed. She understood me, and promised not to discourage them, only fearing the excessive fatigue of these undertakings. Our boys returned from the magazine, delighted with what they had found, and loaded with work tools those of the masons, the chisel, the short hammer, and the trowel, were not to be found, and rarely are taken out to sea. But they had collected a great number of carpenters' tools, saws, planes, rules, etc., and now that Fritz was a smith, he had no difficulty in making any tool he wanted. He was loaded on each shoulder, and in each hand he brought a specimen of gunpowder. One sort was in good condition, and they had found a barrel of it. The other was much damaged by the water. Jack and Francis were also bending under the weight of various articles, among which I saw some pieces of the hand-mill Fritz wished to examine. Ernest, always rather idle, came proudly on, with a leather belt across his shoulders, to which was suspended a large tin box for plants, and a leather portmanteau for stones, minerals, and shells. His brothers, even Francis, rallied him unmercifully on his immense burden. One offered to help him, another to go and bring the ass. He preserved his grave and thoughtful air, and extended himself on a seat near his mother, who was occupied with his specimens of natural history. Jack deposited his load in a corner and ran out. We soon saw him return with a huge screw-machine on his head, which he placed before Ernest, saying with an air of respect, I have the honor to bring for his highness the prince of the idle penguins, the press for his august plants, which his highness doubtless found too heavy, and truly it is no little weight. Ernest did not know whether to thank him or be angry, but he decided to join him in the jest and therefore answered gravely that he was distressed that His Highness the Prince of the Monkeys should have taken so much trouble to oblige him, that he ought to have employed some of his docile subjects to do it. After all, he confessed that the press, which he had not noticed, gave him great pleasure, and he placed some plants in it immediately, which he had collected the evening before. The rain ceasing for a short time, I went with Fritz and Jack to examine our embankment, and to open the sluices of the pond. We found all right, and our garden looking beautiful after the rain. On our return we looked in at the Grotto Ernestine, which we found inundated from the opening above. We proposed to make a trench or a little channel to carry off the rainwater from it. We returned home and retired to bed in hopes of being able to set out next morning. We were, however, again disappointed, and for a longer period than we expected. The rain continued some days, and the country was again a complete lake. We had, however, no storm or wind, and our possessions did not suffer, so we resolved to wait patiently till the weather would permit us to go. My wife was delighted to be in her comfortable abode, and to have us round her. Neither did we waste the time. Ernest finished the arrangement of his collection with his mother and Francis. Fritz and Jack prepared the tools that they wanted in their great undertaking. The first attempt was to be a sawmill. In order to prepare the planks they wished, a very large saw which they had found amongst the tools would serve their purpose. 
but it was necessary to set it in motion by water, and here was the difficulty. Fritz made several models from the thin wood of our chests, and the wheels of our guns, but they were too small. In the meantime, the mind of my young mechanic was exercised, his ideas were enlarged and improved, and as this science was so necessary in our situation, I allowed him to go on with his experiments. Notwithstanding the rain, protected by my cloak, he went several times to the cascade to look out for a place where he should place his mills to the best advantage, and have a constant supply of water. Ernest assisted him by his advice, and promised his labor when it should be needed. Jack and Francis were helping their mother to card cotton, of which she had made a large collection, intending to spin it for our clothing, and I exercised my mechanical talents in turning a large wheel for her, which was necessary should revolve very easily, her leg being still stiff, and a reel by which four bobbins were filled at once by turning a handle. These different occupations aided us to pass the rainy season, which visited us earlier this year, and did not remain so long. My wife knew something of dyeing cloth, and some of the plants she had helped Ernest to dry, having left their color on the papers, she made some experiments, and succeeded in obtaining a very pretty blue to dye our clothes with, and with the cochineal from our fig tree, a beautiful red-brown, with which she had dyed for herself a complete dress. Thus passed several weeks. Ernest read to us from some amusing or instructive work every evening, and when his collections were all put in order, he worked at his lathe, or at the business of weaving. At last the sun appeared. We spent some days enjoying it in our delightful colonnade. We went to visit the grotto and the garden, where all was going on well. The embankment had prevented the inundation. Satisfied with our work, we now fixed our departure for the next day, once more hoping the rain would not come again to disappoint us. The next day the weather was delightful. We rose before daybreak. My eldest sons took their work tools, which we might want, and their guns also, but under the condition that they should not use them till I gave the word fire. I carried the bag of provisions. Our flock of sheep had increased so much at the farm that we allowed ourselves to kill one, and my wife had roasted a piece for us the preceding evening. To this we added a cake of cassava, and for our dessert we depended on the fruits of the trees we might discover. But, previous to our departure, while I was taking leave of my wife and Francis, I heard a dispute in the colonnade, which I hastened to learn the cause of. I found it was a question between Fritz and Jack, whether we should make the tour of the island by sea or land, and each was anxious for my support. Fritz complained that, since their two expeditions in the canoe, Jack believed himself the first sailor in the world, and that they had given him the name of Lord of the Waves, because he was constantly saying, When I was under the waves, when the waves were washing over me, do you think that they left me dry? No, Mr. Sportsman, said Jack. You have got enough of them, and that's the reason you don't wish to try them again. For my part, I love the waves, and I sing, The sea, the sea, it was the sea that brought us here. What a boaster you are, said Fritz. It was only yesterday you said to me, I will guide you, I know the way by the rocks. I got my buffalo there, and I intend to have another. Was it in the pinnace you intended to pass the defile and pursue buffaloes? No, no, I met on foot, said Jack, but I thought we should be only two then. Now, as we are four, papa at the helm and three bold rowers, why should we fatigue ourselves in making the tour of the island on our legs, when we have a good vessel to carry us? What says Mr. Philosopher, the Prince of Idlers, to it? For my part, said Ernest quietly, I am quite indifferent whether I use my legs in walking or my arms in rowing. It is equally fatiguing. But walking gives me more chance of filling my plant-box and my game-bag. And does he think, added Fritz, that the mulberry and breadfruit trees, which we shall certainly find on the other side, grow on the sea, 
without naming my gazelle, which does not run over the waves. No, it is waiting without moving for you to shoot it, said Jack. And, Ernest, perhaps you may find on the sea some of those curious things, half plants, half animals, which you were showing me in a book. The zoophytes, or polypi, for they are the same family, though there are more than a thousand species, said Ernest, charmed to display his knowledge. But I stopped him by saying, We will dispense with a thousand names at present. After hearing all your arguments, attend to mine, even Jack must yield to them. Our principal aim now being to search for the trees we are in need of, and to examine the productions of the island, our most sensible plan will be to walk. Jack still contended that we might land occasionally, but I showed him the danger of this, the island being in all probability surrounded by reefs, which might extend so far into the sea as to take us out of the sight of the island. This I intended to ascertain some day, and in the meantime I proposed to them that we should endeavor to find a pass round the rocks on our side, from whence we could walk to the defile at the other end, take our canoe, which we had left at anchor near the great bay, and return to Tent House. Jack was in ecstasies. He declared the pass must be very well concealed that escaped his search, and, seizing his lasso and his bow, rushed out the first, singing, The sea! The sea! There goes a sailor for my nature, thought I as we followed the course of the chain of rocks to the left of our dwelling. It conducted us first to the place of our landing, that little uncultivated plain of triangular form, of which the base was washed by the sea, and the point was lost among the rocks. I found here some traces of our first establishment, but how wretched all appeared, compared with our present comforts. We tried here in vain to find a passage to cross the rocks. The chain was everywhere like an impenetrable wall. We arrived at the ravine Fritz and Ernest had scaled, when they had discovered their grotto, and truly nothing but the courage and rashness of youth could have undertaken this enterprise, and continued it daily for three weeks. It appeared to me almost impossible. Fritz offered to ascend, to show me how they had accomplished it, but I would not consent as it could serve no useful purpose. I thought it better for us to proceed to the border of the island, where it was not impossible that there might be a small space on the strand between the rocks and the sea, round which we could pass. From my son's being able to distinguish from the summit the country on the other side, it was evident the chain of rocks could not be very broad. Suddenly Fritz struck his forehead, and seizing Ernest by the arm, Brother, said he, what fools we have been! Ernest inquired what folly they had been guilty of. Why did we not, said Fritz, when we were working within our grotto, attempt to make the opening on the other side? We should not have had much difficulty, I am persuaded, and if our tools had not been sufficient, a little powder would have opened us a door on the other side. Only consider, father, the convenience of bringing the cart loaded with the trees we wanted, through our grotto, and to be able to go a-hunting without having I don't know how many miles to go. Well, we can still do that, said Ernest, in his usual calm, grave manner. If we do not find another passage, we will make one through the grotto Ernestine, with Mamma's permission, as it is her property. This idea of my son appeared good. It was quite certain from our experience at Tent House and in the grotto that the cavity in the rocks was of very great extent, and it did not appear difficult to pierce through to the other side. But some other chain of rocks, some gigantic tree, some hill at the end of our tunnel, might render all our labor useless. I proposed that we should defer our work till we had examined the nature of the ground on the other side. My sons agreed and we proceeded with renewed courage, when we were suddenly checked by the side of the sea beating against a perpendicular rock of terrific height, which terminated our island on this side, and did not give us a chance of going on. I saw the rock did not extend far, but how to get round it I could not devise. 
I did not conceive we could get the pinnace round, as the coast seemed surrounded by reefs. Masses of rock stood up in the sea, and the breakers showed us that more were hidden. After much consideration and many plans, Ernest proposed that we should swim out to the uncovered rocks, and endeavour to pass around. Fritz objected, on account of his arms and ammunition, but Ernest suggested that the powder should be secured in the pockets of his clothes, which he might carry on his head holding his gun above the water. With some difficulty we arranged our encumbrances, and succeeded in reaching the range of outer rocks, without swimming, as the water was not above our shoulders. We rested here a while, and putting on some of our clothes, we commenced our rock over sharp stones, which wounded our feet. In many places, where the rocks lay low, we were up to the waist in the water. Ernest, the proposer of the plan, encouraged us, and led the way for some time, but at last he fell behind, and remained so long, that I became alarmed, and, calling aloud, for I had lost sight of him, he answered me, and at last I discovered him stretched on the rock, endeavouring to separate a piece from it with his knife. "'Father,' said he, "'I am now certain that this bed of rocks, over which we are walking, and which we fancied was formed of stone or flints, is nothing but the work of these remarkable zoophytes called coral insects, which form coral and many other extraordinary things. They can even make whole islands. Look at these little points and hollows, and these stars of every color and every form. I would give all the world to have a specimen of each kind. He succeeded in breaking off a piece, which was of a deep orange color inside. He collected also, and deposited in his bag, some other pieces of various forms and colors. These greatly enriched his collection, and, idle as he was, he did not complain of any difficulty in obtaining them. He had given his gun to Jack, who had complained much of the ruggedness of our road. Our march was truly painful, and I repented more than once of having yielded to the idea. Besides the misery of walking along these shelly rocks, which presented points like the sharp teeth of a saw, tearing our shoes and even our skin, the sea in some of the lower places was so high as to bar our passage, and we were obliged in the interval between two waves to rush across with the water to our chins. We had some difficulty to avoid being carried away. I trembled especially for Jack. Though small and light, he preferred facing the wave to avoiding it. I was several times obliged to catch hold of him, and narrowly escaped destruction along with him. Happily, our march was not above half a mile, and we gained the shore at last without any serious accident, but much fatigued and footsore, and we made a resolution never more to cross the coral reefs. After dressing ourselves, resting, and taking a slight refreshment on the beach, we resumed our march more at our ease into the interior of the island. But though the long grass was not so sharp as the coral, it was almost as troublesome, twisting round our legs, and threatening to throw us down every step we took. Ernest, loaded with his bag of fragments of rock, coral, and zoophytes, had given his gun to Jack, and fearing an accident among the long grass, I thought it prudent to discharge it. In order to profit by it, I fired at a little quadruped, about the size of a squirrel, and killed it. It appeared to me to be the animal called by naturalists the palm squirrel, because it climbs the cocoa and date palms, hooks itself by its tail, which is very long and flexible, to the upper branches, and feeds at pleasure on the fruit, of which it is very fond. We amused ourselves by details of the habits of this animal, occasionally separating to make more discoveries, but agreeing on a particular call which was to assemble us when necessary, a precaution by no means useless as it turned out. Fritz, with his head raised, went on examining all the trees, and occasionally giving a keen look after his gazelle. Ernest, stooping down, examined plants, insects, and occasionally pursuing rare and beautiful butterflies, was filling his 
bag and plant box with various curiosities. Jack, with his lasso in his hand, prepared himself to fling it round the legs of the first buffalo he met with, and was vexed when he did not see any. For my own part, I was engaged in surveying the chain of rocks, in order to discover that which contained the grotto Ernestine. It was easy to recognize it, from its summit cleft in two, and I wished to ascertain as nearly as possible if the cleft extended to the base of the rock, as this would render our work much easier. This side of the island did not resemble that near the great bay, with which Jack and I had been so much charmed. The island was much narrower here, and instead of the wide plain crossed by a river, divided by delightful woods, giving an idea of paradise on earth, we were journeying through a contracted valley lying between the rocky wall which divided the island and a chain of sandy hills which hid the sea and sheltered the valley from the wind. Fritz and I ascended one of these hills, on which a few pines and broom were growing, and perceived beyond them a barren tract, stretching to the sea, where the coral reefs rose to the level of the water and appeared to extend far into the sea. Any navigators, sailing along these shores, would pronounce the island inaccessible and entirely barren. This is not the fact. The grass is very thick, and the trees of noble growth. We found many unknown to us, some loaded with fruit. Also, several beautiful shrubs covered with flowers. The dwarf orange tree, the elegant melaleuca, the nutmeg tree and the Bengal rose blending its flowers with the fragrant jasmine. I should never finish if I were to try and name all the plants found in this shady valley, which might be called the botanic garden of nature. Ernest was in ecstasies. He wished to carry away everything, but he did not know how to dispose of them. Ah, said he, if only our grotto was open on this side. At this moment Fritz came running out of breath, crying out, the breadfruit tree i have found the breadfruit tree here is the fruit excellent delicious bread taste it father here ernest here jack and he gave each of us a part of an oval fruit about the size of an ordinary melon which really seemed very good and nourishing there are many of these trees continued he loaded with fruit would that we had our grotto opened that we might collect a store of them now that they are ripe my boys pointed out to me exactly the situation of the grotto, judging from the rock above, and longed for their tools that they might commence the opening directly. We proceeded to make our way through a border of trees and bushes that separated us from the rock, that we might examine it and judge of the difficulties of our undertaking. Jack preceded us, as usual, after giving Ernest his gun. Fritz followed him, and suddenly turning to me said, I believe kind nature has saved us much trouble. The rock appears to be divided from top to bottom. At the foot I see a sort of cave or grotto already made. At this moment Jack uttered a piercing cry, and came running to us, his lasso in his hand. Two monstrous beasts! cried he. Help! Help! We rushed forward, our guns ready, and saw at the entrance of the cave two large brown bears. The black bear, whose fur is much valued, is only found in cold and mountainous countries, but the brown prefers the south. It is a carnivorous animal, considered very ferocious. The black bear lives only on vegetables and honey. Of these, the one I judged to be the female seemed much irritated, uttering deep growls and furiously gnashing her teeth. As I knew something of these animals, having met with them in the Alps. I remembered having heard that a sharp whistling terrifies and checks them. I therefore whistled as long and loudly as I could, and immediately saw the female retire backwards into the cave, while the male, raising himself on his hind legs, stood quite still with his paws closed. My two elder sons fired into his breast. He fell down, but being only wounded, turned furiously on us. I fired a third shot at him, and finished him. 
We then hastened to load our guns again, to be ready to receive his companion. Jack wished to use his lasso, but I explained to him that the legs of the bear were too short and thick for such a measure to be successful. He related to us that, having entered the cave, he saw something moving at the bottom. He took up a stone and threw it with all his strength at the object. Immediately he heard a frightful growling, and saw two large beasts coming towards him. He had barely time to escape and call for help, and then to hide himself behind a tree. To save ourselves from the other bear, it was necessary that we should take some prompt measures. We therefore advanced and formed a line of battle before the entrance of the cave. I then called, Fire! And we all three fired off our pieces at the same moment. A ferocious roar made us hope they had taken effect. But to make sure, and to prevent the escape of the animal, if it was still living, we gathered a large heap of branches and dried leaves before the opening, to which I set fire. As soon as it blazed, we saw by the light the bear laid motionless on its side. But it is well known that this animal is crafty enough sometimes to feign itself dead, till its enemy approaches near enough to be in its power, when it seizes him in its enormous paws and strangles him. We took a lighted branch, and approached with great precaution. The cave did not extend far. The animal was lying on a heap of dried leaves, prepared for its young ones. I ascertained that it was really dead. I then, with the assistance of my sons, drew it out of the cave, which was too dark for work, and I wished to secure the rich and beautiful skins, which might be useful to us in winter. We set to work, and as the animals were still warm, we succeeded more easily than I could have expected. But the skins were so heavy, it was almost impossible to remove them. We therefore left them in the cave, the bottom of which was sandy, closing the entrance with boughs, that no animal might enter to devour them, and abandoned the two bodies, only regretting the abundance of fat, which would have been useful for many domestic purposes. We resumed our march, thanking God for our preservation from this danger, in which my dear Jack, at any rate, might have perished. As a proof and a trophy of our adventure, we cut off the forepaws of the animal to carry to my wife. It is said that these form a very delicious dish, fit for the tables of kings. The valley now began to expand, and presented a more varied appearance. It was intersected with beautiful plains, or savannas, of which the grass had evidently been eaten, and with more extensive woods, through which we had great difficulty in forcing a passage, so thick and entangled were the lianas and underwood. We succeeded in passing them by keeping at the borders, where we also felt in greater safety from the wild beasts and reptiles, of which we saw many species that had their abode at the foot of the rocks. Besides the fatigue of our journey, we were tormented with thirst, never having seen any water since we left the sea. The soil was so moist that I was of opinion we might have found water by digging, but having been compelled to leave our spades when we came along the reef, we had no tools suitable for the purpose. We were also impatient to wash ourselves, after the butchery of the bears, when, to our great satisfaction, we heard the murmur of waters, which I concluded was the river Jack and I had seen in our former expedition. He had frequently inquired about it, and we had foolishly thought it had extended along the whole valley, which could not be. It was a gentle stream gushing from a perpendicular rock, which reminded me of the source of the river Orb, in the canton of Vaud. It issued forth in its full width, rolling at first over a rocky bed, then forming a graceful bend, it took its course towards the great bay, and fell in a cascade into the sea. We remained some time here to fill our gourds, drinking moderately, and taking a bath, which refreshed us all greatly. The evening was approaching, and we began to fear we should not reach home before night. I had warned my wife that there was a possibility that we might be delayed, though I could not then anticipate the cause of our delay. We endeavored, however, by walking as quickly as we could, and resting no more, to reach our farm at any rate. We followed the course of the river, on the opposite shore of which rose a wide plain where we saw the herd of buffaloes quietly grazing, ruminating, and drinking, 
without paying the slightest attention to us. We thought we distinguished some other quadrupeds amongst them, which Fritz was certain were zebras or anagras, but certainly not his dear gazelle, for which he had incessantly looked round. Jack was in despair that the river separated us from the buffaloes, so that he could not cast his lasso round the legs of one of them, as he had promised Ernest. He even wished to swim across the stream to have a hunt, but I forbade him, encouraging him to hope that perhaps a single buffalo might cross to our side, and throw itself in the way of his lasso. I was far from wishing such a thing myself, for we had no time to lose, nor any means to secure and lead it home, should we succeed in capturing one, not having any cords with us, and moreover intending to return from the bay in the canoe. When we arrived at the bay, the night which comes on rapidly in equinoctial countries had almost closed. We were scarcely able to see, without terror, the changes that the late storm had occasioned. The narrow pass which led from the other side of the island, between the river and a deep stream that flowed from the rocks, was entirely obstructed with rocks and earth fallen upon it, and to render our passage practicable, it was necessary to undertake a labor that the darkness now prevented, and which would at any time be attended by danger. We were obliged then to spend the night in the open air, and separated from our dear and anxious friends at Tent House. Fortunately, Fritz had collected a store of breadfruit for his mother, with which he had filled his own pockets and those of his brothers. These, with water from the river, formed our supper, for we had nothing but the bone of our leg of mutton left. We turned back a little way, to establish ourselves under a clump of trees, where we were in greater safety. We loaded our muskets, we kindled a large fire of dry branches, and recommending ourselves to the protection of God, we lay ourselves down on the soft moss to wait for the first rays of light. With the exception of Jack, who from the first slept as if he had been in his bed, we none of us could rest. The night was beautiful. A multitude of stars shone over our heads in the ethereal vault. Ernest was never tired of gazing on them. After some questions and suppositions on the plurality of worlds, their courses, and their distances, he quitted us to wander on the borders of the river, which reflected them in all their brilliancy. From this night his passion for astronomy commenced, a passion which he carried beyond all others. This became his favorite and continual study, nor did he fall far short of Duval, whose history he had read. Whilst he was engaged in contemplation, Fritz and I conversed on our projects for tunneling to the grotto, and on the utility of such a passage, as this side of the island was quite lost to us, from the difficulty in reaching it. "'And yet,' said I, "'it is to this difficulty we owe the safety we have enjoyed. Who can say that the bears and the buffaloes may not find the way through the grotto?' I confess I am not desirous of their visits, nor even of those of the Onagras. Who knows but they might persuade your favorite Lightfoot to return and live amongst them? Liberty has many charms. Till now we have been very happy on our side of the island, without the productions of this. My dear boy, there is a proverb, Let well enough alone. Let us not have too much ambition. It has ruined greater states than ours for it seemed grieved to give up his plan, and suggested that he could forge some strong bars of iron to place before the opening, which could be removed at will. But, said I, they will not prevent the snakes from passing underneath. I have noticed some with terror, as they are animals I have a great antipathy to, and if your mother saw one crawl into her grotto, she would never enter it again, even if she did not die of fright. Well, we must give it up, said Fritz. But it is a pity. Do you think, father, that there are more bears in the island than those we killed? In all probability, said I. It is scarcely to be supposed that there should be only two. I cannot well account for their being here. They can swim very well, 
and perhaps the abundance of fruit in this part of the island may have attracted them. I then gave my son a short account of their manners and habits, from the best works on the history of these animals. Whilst we continued to talk, and to admire the beauty of the stars, they at length began to fade away before the first light of morning. Ernest returned to us, and we awoke Jack, who had slept uninterruptedly, and was quite unconscious where he was. We returned to the pass, which now, by the light of day, seemed to us in a more hopeless state than in the dusk of evening. I was struck with consternation. It appeared to me that we were entirely enclosed at this side, and I shuddered to think of crossing the island again, to pass round at the other end, of the risk we should run of meeting wild beasts, and of the painful and perilous passage along the coral reefs. At that moment I would gladly have consented to open a passage through the grotto, at the hazard of any visitors, in order to get through myself that I might relieve the anxious feelings of my dear wife and boy. The thoughts of their agony unnerved me, and took away all courage for the commencement of a labour which seemed impossible, our only utensils being a small saw, and a little dibble for taking up plants, which Ernest had been unwilling to leave behind us. The path by which Jack and I had passed was covered with rocks and masses of soil, which obstructed even the course of the stream. We could not discover the place we had forded. The river had opened itself a wider course, far beyond its former one. "'It is impossible,' said Fritz, gazing on the ruins, "'that we can remove all those immense stones without proper tools. Hmm, but perhaps with a little courage we may cross over them. The rivulet being widened cannot be very deep. At all events, it cannot be worse than the coral reefs.' Let us try. But I fear it will be impossible, at least for him, said I, pointing to Jack. Him, indeed, papa, and why not, said the bold fellow. He is perhaps as strong and more active than some of them. Ask Fritz what he thinks of his workmen. Shall I go the first to show you the way? And he was advancing boldly, but I checked him, and said, that before we undertook to scale these masses of rock absolutely bare, where we had nothing to support us or to hold by, it would be as well to examine if, by descending lower, we could not find a less dangerous road. We descended to the narrow pass, and found our drawbridge, plantation, all our fortification that my boys were so proud of, and where, at Fritz's request, I had even planted a small cannon, all all destroyed, the cannon swallowed up with the rest. My boys deplored their disappointment, but I showed them how useless such a defense must ever be. Nature had provided us with a better fortification than we could construct, as we had just now bitterly experienced. We had descended several yards lower with incredible difficulty, plunged in a wet, heavy soil, and obliged to step across immense stones when Fritz, who went first, cried out joyfully, "'The roof, papa! The roof of our chalet! It is quite whole. It will be a bridge for us if we can only get to it.' "'What roof? What chalet?' said I, in astonishment. "'The roof of our little hermitage,' said he, "'which we had covered so well with stones like the Swiss chalets.' I then recollected that I had made this little hut, after the fashion of the Swiss chalet, of bark, with a roof nearly flat and covered with stones, to secure it against the winds. It was this circumstance and its situation that had saved it in the storm. I had placed it opposite the cascade, that we might see the fall in all its beauty, and consequently a little on one side of the passage filled up by the fall of the rocks. Some fragments reached the roof of the hut, and we certainly could not have entered it but the chalet was supported by this means, and the roof was still standing, and perfectly secure. We contrived to slide along the rock which sustained it. Jack was the first to stand on the roof and sing victory. It was very easy to descend on the other side, holding by the poles and pieces of bark, and we soon found ourselves safe in our own island. 
Ernest had lost his gun in the passage. Not being willing to resign his bag of curiosities, he had dropped the gun into the abyss. "'You may take the gun I left in the canoe,' said Fritz. "'But another time throw away your stones and keep your gun. You will find it a good friend in need.' "'Let us embark in our canoe,' cried Jack. "'The sea! The sea! Long live the waves! They are not as hard as the stones.' I was very glad to have the opportunity of conveying my canoe back to the port of Tent House. Our important occupations had prevented me till now, and everything favoured the plan. The sea was calm, the wind favourable, and we should arrive at home sooner and with less fatigue than by land. We skirted the great bay to the Cabbage Palm Wood. I had moored the canoe so firmly to one of the palms that I felt secure of it being there. We arrived at the place, and no canoe was there. The mark of the cord which fastened it was still to be seen round the tree, but the canoe had entirely disappeared. Struck with astonishment, we looked at each other with terror, and without being able to articulate a word. What was become of it? Some animal. The jackals? A monkey, perhaps, might have detached it, said Jack but they could not have eaten the canoe, and we could not find a trace of it, any more than of the gun Fritz had left in it. This extraordinary circumstance gave me a great deal of thought. Savages surely had landed on our island and carried off our canoe. We could no longer doubt it when we discovered on the sands the print of naked feet. It is easy to believe how uneasy and agitated I was. I hastened to take the road to Tent House from which we were now more than three leagues distant. I forbade my sons to mention this event, or our suspicions, to their mother, as I knew it would rob her of all peace of mind. I tried to console myself. It was possible that chance had conducted them to the bay, that they had seen our pretty canoe, and that, satisfied with their prize, and seeing no inhabitants, they might not return. Perhaps on the contrary, these islanders might prove kind and humane, and become our friends. There was no trace of their proceedings further than the shore. We called at the farm on purpose to examine. All appeared in order, and certainly, if they had reached here, there was much to tempt them. Our cotton mattresses, our osier seats, and some household utensils that my wife had left here. Our geese and fowls did not appear to have been alarmed, but were pecking about as usual for worms and insects. I began to hope that we might get off with the loss of our canoe, a loss which might be repaired. We were a sufficient number, being well armed, not to be afraid of a few savages, even if they penetrated further into the island and showed hostile intentions. I exhorted my sons to do nothing to irritate them. On the contrary, to meet them with kindness and attention, and to commit no violence against them unless called on to defend their lives. I also recommended them to select from the wrecked chest some articles likely to please the savages, and to carry them always about with them. "'And I beseech you once more,' added I, "'not to alarm your mother.' They promised me, and we continued our road unmolested to Falcon's Nest." Jack preceded us, delighted, he said, to see our castle again, which he hoped the savages had not carried away. Suddenly we saw him return, running, with terror painted on his countenance. "'They are there!' said he. "'They have taken possession of it. Our dwelling is full of them. Oh, how frightful they are! What a blessing Mama is not there! She would have died of fright to see them enter!' I confess I was much agitated. But— not wishing to expose my children to danger before I had done all in my power to prevent it. I ordered them to remain behind till I called them. I broke a branch from a tree hastily, which I held in one hand, and in the other some long nails, which I found by chance in the bottom of my pocket, and I advanced thus to my tree castle. I expected to have found the door of my staircase torn open and broken, and our new guests ascending and descending but I saw at once it was closed as I had left it. 
being of bark it was not easily distinguished. How had these savages reached the dwelling forty feet from the ground? I had placed planks before the great opening. They were no longer there. The greater part of them had been hurled down to the ground, and I heard such a noise in our house that I could not doubt Jack's report. I advanced timidly, holding up in the air the branch and my offerings, when I discovered, all at once, that I was offering them to a troop of monkeys, lodged in the fortress, which they were amusing themselves by destroying. We had numbers of them in the island, some large and mischievous, against whom we had had some difficulty in defending ourselves when crossing the woods, where they principally dwelt. The frequent report of firearms round our dwelling had kept them aloof till now, when, emboldened by our absence, and enticed by the figs on our tree, they had come in crowds. These vexatious animals had got through the roof, and once in had thrown down the planks that covered the opening. They made the most frightful grimaces, throwing down everything they could seize. Although this devastation caused me much vexation, I could not help laughing at their antics, and at the humble and submissive manner in which I had advanced to pay homage to them. I called my sons, who laughed heartily, and rallied the prince of the monkeys without mercy for not knowing his own subjects. Fritz wished much to discharge his gun amongst them, but I forbade him. I was too anxious to reach Tent House to be able to turn my thoughts on these depredators just now. We continued our journey, but I pause here. My heart is oppressed. My feelings when I reached home require another chapter to describe them, and I must summon courage for the task. We soon arrived at Family Bridge, where I had some hopes of meeting Francis, and perhaps his mother, who was beginning to walk very well. But I was disappointed. They were not there. Yet I was not uneasy, for they were neither certain of the hour of our return, nor of the way we might take. I expected, however, to find them in the colonnade. They were not there. I hastily entered the house. I called aloud, Elizabeth! Francis! Where are you? No one answered. A mortal terror seized me, and for a moment I could not move. They will be in the grotto, said Ernest. Or in the garden, said Fritz. "'Perhaps on the shore,' cried Jack. "'My mother likes to watch the waves, and Francis may be gathering shells.' These were possibilities. My sons flew in all directions to search of their mother and brother. I found it impossible to move, and was obliged to sit down. I trembled, and my heart beat till I could scarcely breathe. I did not venture to dwell on the extent of my fears, or rather I had no distinct notion of them. I tried to recover myself. I murmured, Yes, at the grotto or the garden. They will return directly. Still I could not compose myself. I was overwhelmed with a sad presentiment of the misfortune which impended over me. It was but too soon realized. My sons returned in fear and consternation. They had no occasion to tell me the result of their search. I saw it at once and sinking down motionless, I cried, Alas! They are not there! Jack returned the last, and in the most frightful state. He had been at the seashore, and throwing himself into my arms, he sobbed out, The savages have been here, and carried away my mother and Francis. Perhaps they have devoured them. I have seen the marks of their horrible feet on the sands, and the print of dear Francis's boots. This account at once recalled me to strength and action. Come, my children, let us fly to save them. God will pity our sorrow and assist us. He will restore them. Come, come. They were ready in a moment. But a distracting thought seized me. Had they carried off the pinnace? If so, every hope was gone. Jack, in his distress, had never thought of remarking this, but the instant I named it, Fritz and he ran to ascertain the important circumstance, Ernest, in the meantime, supporting me and endeavouring to calm me. Perhaps, said he, they are still in the island. Perhaps they may have fled to hide themselves in some wood or amongst the reeds. 
even if the pinnace be left, it would be prudent to search the island from end to end before we leave it. Trust Fritz and me, we will do this, and even if we find them in the hands of the enemy, we will recover them. Whilst we are off on this expedition, you can be preparing for our voyage, and we will search the world from one end to the other, every country and every sea, but we will find them, and we shall succeed. Let us put our whole trust in God. He is our Father. He will not try us beyond our strength. I embraced my child, and a flood of tears relieved my overcharged heart. My eyes and hands were raised to heaven. My silent prayers winged their flight to the Almighty, to Him who tries us and consoles us. A ray of hope seemed to visit my mind when I heard my boys cry out as they approached, The pinnace is here! They have not carried that away! I fervently thanked God. It was a kind of miracle, for this pretty vessel was more tempting than the canoe. Perhaps, as it was hidden in a little creek between the rocks, it had escaped their observation. Perhaps they might not know how to manage it, or they might not be numerous enough. No matter, it was there, and might be the means of our recovering the beloved objects these barbarians had torn from us. How gracious is God to give us hope to sustain us in our afflictions! Without hope we could not live. It restores and revives us, and even if never realized below, accompanies us to the end of our life and beyond the grave. I imparted to my eldest son the idea of his brother that they might be concealed in some part of the island, but I dared not rely on this sweet hope. Finally, as we ought not to run the risk of abandoning them, if they were still here, and perhaps in the power of the savages, I consented that my two eldest sons should go to ascertain the fact. Besides, however impatient I was, I felt that a voyage such as we were undertaking into unknown seas might be of long duration, and it was necessary to make some preparations. I must think on food, water, arms, and many other things. There are situations in life which seize the heart and soul, rendering us insensible to the wants of the body. This we now experienced. We had just come from a painful journey, on foot, of twenty-four hours, during which we had had little rest and no sleep. Since morning we had eaten nothing but some morsels of the breadfruit. It was natural that we should be overcome with fatigue and hunger. But we none of us had even thought of our own state. We were supported, if I may use the expression, by our despair. At the moment that my sons were going to set out, the remembrance of their need of refreshment suddenly occurred to me and I besought them to rest a little and take something. But they were too much agitated to consent. I gave Fritz a bottle of canary, and some slices of roast mutton I met with, which he put in his pocket. They had each a loaded musket, and they set out, taking the road along the rocks, where the most hidden retreats and most impenetrable woods lay. They promised me to fire off their pieces frequently to let their mother know that they were there if she was hidden among the rocks. They took also one of the dogs. Flora we could not find, which made us conclude she had followed her mistress, to whom she was much attached. As soon as my eldest sons had left us, I made Jack conduct me to the shore where he had seen the footmarks, that I might examine them, to judge of their number and direction. I found many very distinct but so mingled I could come to no positive conclusion. Some were near the sea, with the foot pointing to the shore, and amongst these Jack thought he could distinguish the boot-mark of Francis. My wife wore very light boots also, which I had made for her. They rendered stockings unnecessary, and strengthened her ankles. I could not find the trace of these, but I soon discovered that my poor Elizabeth had been here, from a piece torn from an apron she wore, made of her own cotton, and dyed red. I had now not the least doubt that she was in the canoe with her son. It was a sort of consolation to think they were together, but how many mortal fears accompanied this consolation! Oh, 
was I ever to see again these objects of my tenderest affection. Certain now that they were not in the island, I was impatient for the return of my sons, and I made every preparation for our departure. The first thing I thought of was the wrecked chest, which would furnish me with means to conciliate the savages, and to ransom my loved ones. I added to it everything likely to tempt them, utensils, stuffs, trinkets. I even took with me gold and silver coin, which was thrown on one side as useless, but might be of service to us on this occasion. I wished my riches were three times as much as they were, that I might give all in exchange for the life and liberty of my wife and son. I then turned my thoughts on those remaining to me. I took, in bags and gourds, all that we had left of cassava bread, manioc roots, and potatoes, a barrel of salt fish, two bottles of rum, and several jars of fresh water. Jack wept as he filled them at his fountain, which he perhaps might never see again any more than his dear Valiant, whom I set at liberty, as well as the cow, ass, buffalo, and the beautiful Onagra. These docile animals were accustomed to us and our attentions, and they remained in their places, surprised that they were neither harnessed nor mounted. We opened the poultry-yard and pigeon-coat. The flamingo would not leave us. It went and came with us from the house to the pinnace. We took also oil, candles, fuel, and a large iron pot to cook our provisions in. For our defense I took two more guns, and a small barrel of powder, all we had left. I added besides some changes of linen, not forgetting some for my dear wife, which I hoped might be needed. The time fled rapidly while we were thus employed. Night came on, and my sons returned not. My grief was inconceivable. The island was so large and woody that they might have lost themselves, or that savages might have returned and encountered them. After twenty hours of frightful terror, I heard the report of a gun. Alas, only one report. It was the signal agreed on if they returned alone, two if they brought their mother, three if Francis also accompanied them. But I expected they would return alone and I was still grateful. I ran to meet them. They were overcome with fatigue and vexation. They begged to set out immediately, not to lose one precious moment. They were now sure the island did not contain those they lamented, and they hoped I would not return without discovering them, for what would the island be to us without our loved ones? Fritz, at that moment, saw his dear Lightfoot capering round him, and could not help sighing as he caressed him, and took leave of him. "'May I find thee here,' said he, "'where I leave thee in such sorrow, and I will bring back thy young master,' added he, turning to the bull who was also approaching him. He then begged me again to set out, as the moon was just rising in all her majesty. "'The Queen of Night,' said Ernest, "'will guide us to the Queen of our island.' who is perhaps now looking up to her and calling on us to help her. Most assuredly, said I, she is thinking on us. But it is on God she is calling for help. Let us join her in prayer, my dear children, for herself and our dear Francis. They fell on their knees with me, and I uttered the most fervent and earnest prayer that ever human heart poured forth, and I rose with confidence that our prayers were heard. I proceeded with new courage to the creek that contained our pinnace, where Jack arranged all we had brought. We rowed out of the creek, and when we were in the bay, we held a council to consider on which side we were to commence our search. I thought of returning to the great bay, from whence our canoe had been taken. My sons, on the contrary, thought that these islanders, content with their acquisition, had been returning homewards, coasting along the island, when an unhappy chance had led their mother and brother to the shore, where the savages had seen them and carried them off. At the most they could be but a day before us, but that was long enough to fill us with dreadful anticipations. I yielded to the opinion of my sons, which had a great deal of reason on its side. Besides, the wind was favorable in that direction, 
and abandoning ourselves in full confidence to Almighty God, we spread our sails, and were soon in the open sea. A gentle wind swelled our sails, and the current carried us rapidly into the open sea. I then seated myself at the helm, and employed the little knowledge I had gained during our voyage from Europe in directing our bark, so that we might avoid the rocks and coral banks that surrounded our island. My two oldest sons, overcome with fatigue, had no sooner seated themselves on a bench than they fell into a profound sleep, notwithstanding their sorrows. Jack held out the best, his love of the sea kept him awake, and I surrendered the helm to him till I took a momentary slumber, my head resting against the stern. A happy dream placed me in the midst of my family in our dear island, but a shout from Ernest woke me. He was calling on Jack to leave the helm, as he was contriving to run the vessel among the breakers on the coast. I seized the helm, and soon said all right, determined not to trust my giddy son again. Jack, of all my sons, was the one who evinced most taste for the sea, but being so young when we made our voyage, his knowledge of nautical affairs was very scanty. My elder sons had learnt more. Ernest, who had a great thirst for knowledge of every kind, had questioned the pilot on all he had seen him do. He had learned a great deal in theory, but of practical knowledge he had none. The mechanical genius of Fritz had drawn conclusions from what he saw. This would have induced me to place much trust in him, in case of that danger which I prayed heaven might be averted. What a situation was mine for a father! Wandering through unknown and dangerous seas with my three sons, my only hope, in search of a fourth and of my beloved helpmate, utterly ignorant which way we should direct our course, or where to find a trace of those we sought. How often do we allay the happiness granted us below by vain wishes! I had at one time regretted that we had no means of leaving our island. Now we had left it, and our sole wish was to recover those we had lost, to bring them back to it, and never to leave it more. I sometimes regretted that I had led my sons into this danger. I might have ventured alone, but I reflected that I could not have left them, for Fritz had said, if the savages had carried off the pinnace, I would have swum from isle to isle till I had found them. My boys all endeavoured to encourage and console me. Fritz placed himself at the rudder, observing that the pinnace was new and well built, and likely to resist a tempest. Ernest stood on the deck silently watching the stars, only breaking his silence by telling me he should be able by them to supply the want of the compass and point out how we should direct our course. Jack climbed dexterously up the mast to let me see his skill. We called him the cabin boy. Fritz was the pilot, Ernest the astronomer, and I was the captain and commander of the expedition. Daybreak showed us we had passed far from our island, which now only appeared a dark speck. I, as well as Fritz and Jack, was of the opinion that it would be advisable to go round it, and try our fortune on the opposite coast. But Ernest, who had not forgotten his telescope, was certain he saw land in a direction he pointed out to us. We took the glass, and were soon convinced he was right. As day advanced, we saw the land plainly, and did not hesitate to sail towards it. As this appeared the land nearest to our island, we supposed the savages might have conveyed their captives there. But more trials awaited us before we arrived there. It being necessary to shift the sail in order to reach the coast in view, my poor cabin boy Jack ran up the mast, holding by the ropes. But before he reached the sail, the rope which he held broke suddenly. He was precipitated into the sea and disappeared in a moment but he soon rose to the surface trying to swim and mingling his cries with ours. Fritz, who was the first to see the accident, was in the water almost as soon as Jack, and seizing him by the hair, swam with the other hand, calling on him to try and keep afloat and hold by him. When I saw my two sons thus struggling with the waves, that were very strong from a land wind, I should in my despair have leaped in after them but Ernest held me, and implored me to remain to assist in getting them into the pinnace. He had thrown ropes to them, 
and a bench which he had torn up with the strength of despair. Fritz had contrived to catch one of the ropes and fasten it round Jack, who still swam, but feebly, as if nearly exhausted. Fritz had been considered an excellent swimmer in Switzerland. He preserved all his presence of mind, calling to us to draw the rope gently, while he supported the poor boy and pushed him towards the pinnace. At last I was able to reach and draw him up, and when I saw him extended nearly lifeless at the bottom of the pinnace, I fell down senseless beside him. How precious to us now was the composed mind of Ernest! In the midst of such a scene he was calm and collected. Promptly disengaging the rope from the body of Jack, he flung it back to Fritz, to help him in reaching the pinnace, attaching the other end firmly to the mast. This done, quicker than I can write it, he approached us, raised his brother so that he might relieve himself from the quantity of water he had swallowed, then turning to me, restored me to my senses by administering to me some drops of rum, and by saying, Courage, father. You have saved Jack, and I will save Fritz. He is hold of the rope. He is swimming strongly. He is coming. He is here. He left me to assist his brother, who was soon in the vessel and in my arms. Jack, perfectly recovered, joined him, and fervently did I thank God for granting me, in the midst of my trials, such a moment of happiness. We could not help fancying this happy preservation was an augury of our success in our anxious search, and we should bring back the lost ones to our island. "'Oh, how terrified Mama would have been,' said Jack, "'to see me sink. I thought I was going, like a stone, to the bottom of the sea, but I pushed out my arms and legs with all my strength, and up I rose.' He, as well as Fritz, was quite wet. I had by chance brought some changes of clothes, which I made them put on, after giving each a little rum. They were so much fatigued, and I was so overcome by my agitation, that we were obliged to relinquish rowing most unwillingly, as the skies threatened a storm. We gradually began to distinguish clearly the island we wished to approach, and the land-birds, which came to rest on our sails, gave us hopes that we should reach it before night. But suddenly such a thick fog arose, that it hid every object from us, even the sea itself, and we seemed to be sailing among the clouds. I thought it prudent to drop our anchor, as fortunately we had a tolerably strong one, but there appeared so little water that I feared we were near the breakers, and I watched anxiously for the fog to dissipate and permit us to see the coast. It finally changed into a heavy rain which we could with difficulty protect ourselves from. There was, however, a half-deck to the pinnace, under which we crept, and sheltered ourselves. Here, crowded close together, we talked over the late accident. Fritz assured me he was never in any danger, and that he would plunge again into the sea that moment, if he had the least hope that it would lead him to find his mother and Francis. We all said the same though Jack confessed that his friends, the waves, had not received his visit very politely, but had even beat him very rudely. "'But I would bear twice as much,' said he, "'to see Mamma and dear Francis again. Do you think, Papa, that the savages could ever hurt them? Mamma is so good, and Francis is so pretty, and then poor Mamma is so lame yet. I hope they would pity her and carry her.' "'Alas!' I could not hope as my boy did. I feared that they would force her to walk. I tried to conceal other horrible fears that almost threw me into despair. I recalled all the cruelties of the cannibal nations, and shuddered to think that my Elizabeth and my darling child were perhaps in their ferocious hands. Prayer and confidence in God were the only means, not to console but to support me, and teach me to endure my heavy affliction with resignation. I looked on my three sons, and endeavoured for their sakes to hope and submit. The darkness rapidly increased, till it became total. We concluded it was night. The rain having ceased, I went out to strike a light, as I wished to hang the lighted lantern to the mast, when Ernest, who was on deck, called out loudly, Father! Brothers! Come! The sea is on fire! 
and indeed as far as the eye could reach the surface of the water appeared in flames. This light, of the most brilliant fiery red, reached even to the vessel, and we were surrounded by it. It was a sight at once beautiful and almost terrific. Jack seriously inquired if there was not a volcano at the bottom of the sea, and I astonished him much by telling him that this light was caused by a kind of marine animal, which in form resembled plants so much that they were formerly considered such. But naturalists and modern voyagers have entirely destroyed this error, and furnished proofs that they are organized beings, having all the spontaneous movements peculiar to animals. They feel when they are touched, seek for food, seize and devour it. They are of various kinds and colors, and are known under the general name of zoophytes. And this which glitters in such beautiful colors on the sea is called pyrosoma, said Ernest. See, here are some I've caught in my hat. You may see them move. How they change color! Orange, green, blue, like the rainbow! And when you touch them, the flame appears still more brilliant. Now they are pale yellow. They amused themselves some time with these bright and beautiful creatures, which appeared to have but a half-life. They occupied a large space on the water, and their astonishing radiance, in the midst of the darkness of the atmosphere, had such a striking and magnificent effect that for a few moments we were diverted from our own sad thoughts. But an observation from Jack soon recalled them. "'If Francis passed this way,' said he, "'how he would be amused by these funny creatures, which look like fire but do not burn. But I know he would be afraid to touch them, and how much afraid Mamma would be, as she likes no animals she does not know. Ah, how glad I shall be to tell her all about our voyage, and my excursion into the sea, and how Fritz dragged me by the hair, and what they call these fiery fishes. Tell me again, Ernest, a pi 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 pyrosoma, Mr. Perron calls them, said Ernest. The description of them is very interesting in his voyage, which I have read to Mamma, and as she would recollect it, she would not be afraid. I pray to God, replied I, that she may have nothing more to fear than the pyrosoma, and that we may soon see them again with her and Francis. We all said Amen, and the day breaking, we decided to weigh the anchor, and endeavor to find a passage through the reefs to reach the island which we now distinctly saw, and which seemed an uncultivated and rocky coast. I resumed my place at the helm. My sons took the oars, and we advanced cautiously, sounding every minute. What would have become of us if our pinnace had been injured? The sea was perfectly calm, and after prayer to God and a slight refreshment, we proceeded forward, looking carefully round for any canoe of the savages. It might be even our own, but no. We were not fortunate enough to discover any trace of our beloved friends, nor any symptom of the isle being inhabited. However, as it was our only point of hope, we did not wish to abandon it. By dint of searching, we found a small bay which reminded us of our own. It was formed by a river broad and deep enough for our pinnace to enter. We rowed in, and having placed our vessel in a creek, where it appeared to be secure, we began to consider the means of exploring the whole island. I did not disembark on this unknown shore without great emotion. It might be inhabited by a barbarous and cruel race, and I almost doubted the prudence of thus risking my three remaining children in the hazardous and uncertain search after our dear lost ones. I think I could have borne my bereavement with Christian resignation if I had seen my wife and child die in my arms, I should then have been certain they were happy in the bosom of their God. But to think of them, and the power of ferocious and idolatrous savages, who might subject them to cruel tortures and death, chilled my very blood. I demanded of my sons, if they felt courage to pursue the difficult and perilous enterprise we had commenced. They all declared they would rather die than not find their mother and brother. Fritz even besought me, with Ernest and Jack, to return to the island in case the wanderers should come back, 
and be terrified to find it deserted, and to leave him the arms and the means of trafficking with the savages without any uneasiness about his prudence and discretion. I assured him I did not distrust his courage and prudence, but I showed him the futility of hoping that the savages would voluntarily carry back their victims, or that they could escape alone. And should he meet with them here and succeed, how could he carry his recovered treasures to the island? No, my children, said I. We will all search, in the confidence that God will bless our efforts. And perhaps sooner than we think, said Ernest. Perhaps they are in this island. Jack was running off immediately to search, but I called my little madcap back, till we arranged our plans. I advised that two of us should remain to watch the coast, while the other two penetrated into the interior. The first thing necessary to ascertain was if the island was inhabited, which might easily be done, by climbing some tree that overlooked the country, and remarking if there were any traces of the natives, any huts or fires lighted, etc. Those who made any discovery were immediately to inform the rest that we might go in a body to recover our own. If nothing announced that the island was inhabited, we were to leave it immediately to search elsewhere. All wished to be of the party of discovery. At length, Ernest agreed to remain with me and watch for any arrivals by sea. Before we parted, we all knelt to invoke the blessing of God on our endeavors. Fritz and Jack, as the most active, were to visit the interior of the island and to return with information as soon as possible. To be prepared for any chance, I gave them a game-bag filled with toys, trinkets, and pieces of money, to please the savages. I also made them take some food. Fritz took his gun, after promising me he would not fire it except to defend his life, lest he should alarm the savages and induce them to remove their captives. Jack took his lasso, and they set out with our benedictions, accompanied by the brave Turk, on whom I depended much to discover his mistress and his companion Flora, if she was still with her friends. As soon as they were out of sight, Ernest and I set to work to conceal as much as possible our pinnace from discovery. We lowered the masts, and hid with great care under the deck the precious chest with our treasure, provisions, and powder. We got our pinnace with great difficulty, the water being low, behind a rock which completely concealed it on the land side, but it was still visible from the sea. Ernest suggested that we should entirely cover it with branches of trees, so that it might appear like a heap of bushes, and we began to cut them immediately with two hatchets we found in the chest, and which we speedily fitted with handles. We found also a large iron staple, which Ernest succeeded with a hammer and pieces of wood, in fixing in the rock to moor the pinnace to. We had some difficulty in finding branches within our reach. There were many trees on the shore, but their trunks were bare. We found at last, at some distance, an extensive thicket, composed of a beautiful shrub, which Ernest recognized to be a species of mimosa. The trunk of this plant is knotty and stunted, about three or four feet high, and spreads its branches horizontally clothed with beautiful foliage, and so thickly interwoven, that the little quadrupeds who make their dwellings in these thickets are obliged to open covered roads out of the entangled mass of vegetation. At the first blow of the hatchet a number of beautiful little creatures poured forth on all sides. They resembled the kangaroos of our island, but were smaller, more elegant, and remarkable for the beauty of their skin, which was striped like that of the zebra. It is the striped kangaroo, cried Ernest, described in the voyages of Perone. How I long to have one! The female should have a pouch to contain her young ones. He lay down very still at the entrance of the thicket, and soon had the satisfaction of seizing two, which leaped out almost into his arms. This animal is as timid as the hare of our country. They endeavored to escape, but Ernest held them fast. One was a female which had her young one in her pouch, which my son took out very cautiously. It was an elegant little creature, with a skin like its mother, only more brilliant, 
It was full of graceful antics. The poor mother no longer wished to escape. All her desire seemed to be to recover her offspring and to replace it in its nest. At last she succeeded in seizing and placing it carefully in security. Then her desire to escape was so strong that Ernest could scarcely hold her. He wished much to keep and tame her, and asked my permission to empty one of the chests for a dwelling for her, and to carry her off in the pinnace. But I refused him decidedly. I explained to him the uncertainty of our return to the island, and the imprudence of adding to our cares, and— Certainly, added I, you would not wish this poor mother to perish from famine and confinement, when your own mother is herself a prisoner. His eyes filled with tears, and he declared he would not be such a savage as to keep a poor mother in captivity. "'Go, pretty creature,' said he, releasing her, "'and may my mother be as fortunate as you.' She soon profited by his permission, and skipped off with her treasure. We continued to cut down the branches of the mimosa, but they were so entangled, and the foliage so light, that we agreed to extend our search for some thicker branches. As we left the shore, the country appeared more fertile. We found many unknown trees, which bore no fruit, but some covered with delicious flowers. Ernest was in his element. He wanted to collect and examine all of them, to endeavor to discover their names, either from analogy to other plants or from descriptions he had read. He thought he recognized the melaleuca, several kinds of mimosa, and the Virginian pine, which has the largest and thickest branches. We loaded ourselves with as much as we could carry, and in two or three journeys we had collected sufficient to cover the vessel, and to make a shelter for ourselves, if we were obliged to pass the night on shore. I had given orders to my sons that both were to return before night, at all events, and if the least hope appeared, one was to run with all speed to tell us. All my fear was that they might lose their way in this unknown country. They might meet with lakes, marshes, or perplexing forests. Every moment I was alarmed with the idea of some new danger, and never did any day seem so long. Ernest endeavored, by every means in his power, to comfort and encourage me. But the buoyancy of spirit peculiar to youth prevented him dwelling long on one painful thought. He amused his mind by turning to search for the marine productions with which the rocks were covered, seaweed, mosses of the most brilliant colors, zoophytes of various kinds occupied his attention. He brought them to me, regretting that he could not preserve them. "'Oh, if my dear mother could see them,' said he, "'or if Fritz could paint them, how they would amuse Francis!' This recalled our sorrows, and my uneasiness increased. All was so still around us, and our pinnace was so completely hidden with its canopy of verdure, that I could not help regretting that I had not accompanied my sons. It was now too late, but my steps involuntarily turned to the road I had seen them take, Ernest remaining on the rocks in search of natural curiosities. But I was suddenly recalled by a cry from Ernest, "'Father, a canoe! A canoe!' "'Alas! Is it not ours?' I said, rushing to the shore, where, indeed, I saw beyond the reefs a canoe floating lightly, apparently filled with the islanders, easy to distinguish from their dark complexion. This canoe did not resemble ours. It was longer, narrower, and seemed to be composed of long strips of bark, quite rough, tied together at each end, which gave somewhat of a graceful form to it although it evidently belonged to the infancy of the art of navigation. It is almost inconceivable how these frail barks resist the slightest storm, but these islanders swim so well that, even if the canoe fills, they jump out, empty it, and take their places again. When landed, one or two men take up the canoe and carry it to their habitation. This, however, appeared to be provided with outriggers to preserve the equilibrium, and six savages, with a sort of oars, made it fly like the wind. When it passed the part of the island where we were, we hailed it as loudly as we could. The savages answered by frightful cries, but showed no intention of approaching us or entering the bay. On the contrary, they went on with great rapidity, 
continuing their cries. I followed them with my eyes as far as I could in speechless emotion, for either my fancy deceived me, or I faintly distinguished a form of fairer complexion than the dark-hued beings who surrounded him, features or dress I could not see. On the whole it was a vague impression that I trembled alike to believe or to doubt. Ernest, more active than I, had climbed a sandbank, and with his telescope had commanded a better view of the canoe. He watched it round a point of land, and then came down almost as much agitated as myself. I ran to him and said, Ernest, was it your mother? No, papa, I am certain it was not my mother, said he. Neither was it Francis. Here he was silent. Cold shuddering came over us. Why are you silent? said I. What do you think? Indeed, papa, I could distinguish nothing, said he. Even with the telescope they pass so quickly. Would that it were my mother and brother. We should then be sure they were living, and might follow them. But a thought strikes me. Let us free the pinnace, and sail after the canoe. We can go quicker than they with the sail. We shall overtake them behind the cape, and then we shall at least be satisfied. I hesitated, lest my son should come back. But Ernest represented to me that we were only fulfilling the wishes of Fritz. Besides, we should return in a short time. He added that he would soon disencumber the pinnace. Soon, cried I, when we have been at least two hours in covering it. Yes, said he, but we had a dozen journeys to make it to the trees then. I will have it ready in less than half an hour. I assisted him as actively as I could, though not with good heart for I was uneasy about abandoning my sons. I would have given worlds to see them arrive before our departure, to have their assistance which was of much consequence in the pinnace, and to know that they were safe. I often left off my work to take a glance into the interior of the island, hoping to see them. Frequently I mistook the trees in the twilight, which was now coming on, for moving objects. At last I was not deceived. I saw distinctly a figure walking rapidly. "'They're here!' I cried, running forward, followed by Ernest, and we soon saw a dark-colored figure approaching. I concluded it was a savage, and, though disappointed, was not alarmed, as he was alone. I stopped, and begged Ernest to recollect all the words he had met with in his books of the language of the savages. The black man approached and conceived my surprise when I heard him cry in my own language, "'Don't be alarmed, father. It is I, your son Fritz.' "'Is it possible?' said I. "'Can I believe it? "'And Jack, what have you done with my Jack? "'Where is he? Speak!' Ernest did not ask. Alas, he knew too well. He had seen with his telescope that it was his dear brother Jack that was in the canoe with the savages, but he had dared not tell me. I was in agony. Fritz, harassed with fatigue and overwhelmed with grief, sunk down on the ground. "'Oh, father,' said he, sobbing, "'I dread to appear before you without my brother. I've lost him. Can you ever forgive your unfortunate Fritz?' "'Oh, yes, yes, we are all equally unfortunate,' cried I, sinking down beside my son, while Ernest seated himself on the other side to support me. I then besought Fritz to tell me if the savages had murdered my dear boy. He assured me that he was not killed, but carried off by the savages. Still he hoped he was safe. Ernest then told me he had seen him seated in the canoe, apparently without clothes, but not stained black as Fritz was. "'I earnestly wish he had been,' said Fritz. "'To that I attribute my escape. But I am truly thankful to God that you have seen him, Ernest.' Which way have the monsters gone? Ernest pointed out the cape, and Fritz was anxious that we should embark without delay, and endeavor to snatch him from them. And have you learned nothing of your mother and Francis? said I. Alas, nothing, said he, though I think I recognized a handkerchief belonging to dear Mamma on the head of a savage. I will tell you all my adventure as we go. You forgive me, dear father? Yes, my dear son, said I, I forgive and pity you, but are you sure my wife and Francis are not on the island? 
"'Quite sure,' said he. "'In fact, the island is entirely uninhabited. There's no fresh water, nor game, and no quadrupeds whatever, but rats and kangaroos, but plenty of fruit. I have filled my bag with breadfruit, which is all we shall need. Let's go.' We worked so hard that in a quarter of an hour the branches were removed and the pinnace ready to receive us. The wind was favourable for carrying us towards the cape the savages had turned. We hoisted our sail. I took my place at the helm. The sea was calm, and the moon lighted our way. After recommending ourselves to the protection of God, I desired Fritz to commence his melancholy recital. "'It will be melancholy indeed,' said the poor boy, weeping. "'If we do not find my dear Jack, I shall never forgive myself for not having stained his skin before my own, that he should have been with you now.' "'But I have you, my dear son, to console your father,' said I. "'I can do nothing myself in my sorrow. I depend on you, my two eldest, to restore to me what I have lost. Go on, Fritz.' We went on, continued he, with courage and hope, and as we proceeded, we felt that you were right in saying we ought not to judge of the island by the borders. You can form no idea of the fertility of the island, or of the beauty of the trees and shrubs we met with at every step, quite unknown to me. Some were covered with fragrant flowers, others with tempting fruits, which, however, we did not venture to taste, as we did not have nips to try them. "'Did you see any monkeys?' asked Ernest. "'Not one,' replied his brother, to the great vexation of Jack. But we saw parrots and all sorts of birds of the most splendid plumage. Whilst we were remarking these creatures, I did not neglect to look carefully about for any trace that might aid our search. I saw no hut, no sort of dwelling, nor anything that could indicate that the island was inhabited, and not the slightest appearance of fresh water, and we should have been tormented with thirst if we had not found some coconuts containing milk, and an acid fruit full of juice, which we have on our own island, Ernest calls it the carambolier. We quenched our thirst with this, as well as with the plant which we also have, and which contains water in the stem. The country's flat and open, and its beautiful trees stand at such a distance from each other that no one could hide amongst them. But if we found no dwellings, we often discovered traces of the savages, extinguished fires, remains of kangaroos and a fish coconut shells, and even entire nuts, which we secured for ourselves. We marked also footprints on the sand. We both wished anxiously to meet with a savage that we might endeavour to make him comprehend, by signs, whom we were in search of, hoping that natural affection might have some influence even with these untaught creatures. I was only fearful that my dress and the colour of my skin might terrify them. In the meantime, Jack, with his usual rashness, had climbed to the summit of one of the tallest trees, and suddenly cried out, "'Fritz, prepare your signs! The savages are landing! Oh, what black, ugly creatures they are, and nearly naked! You ought to dress yourself like them to make friends with them. You can stain your skin with these, throwing me down branches of a sort of fruit of a dark purple colour, large as a plum, with a skin like the mulberry.' I've been tasting them. They are very nauseous, and they've stained my fingers black. Rub yourself well with the juice of this fruit, and you will be a perfect savage. I agreed immediately. He descended from the tree while I undressed, and with his assistance I stained myself from head to foot, as you see me. But don't be alarmed. A single dip in the sea will make me a European again. The good-natured Jack then helped to dress me in a sort of tunic made of large leaves, and laughed heartily when he looked at me, calling me Omnibu, of whom he had seen a picture, which he declared I exactly resembled. I then wished to disguise him in the same way, but he would not consent. He declared that, when we met with Mama and Francis, he should fly to embrace them, and that he should alarm and disgust them in such a costume. He said I could protect him if the savages wished to devour him. They were now at hand, and we went forward, 
Jack following me with my bundle of clothes under his arm. I had slung my kangaroo skin, bag of powder, and provision on my shoulders, and I was glad to see that most of the savages wore the skin of that animal, for the most part spread out like a mantle over their shoulders. Few of them had other clothes, excepting one, who appeared to be the chief, and had a tunic of green rushes neatly woven. I tried to recollect all the words of savage language I could, but very few occurred to me. I said at first, Tayo, Tayo. I don't know whether they comprehended me, but they paid me great attention, evidently taking me for a savage. Only one of them wished to seize my gun, but I held it firmly, and on the chief speaking a word to him, he drew back. They spoke very rapidly, and I saw by their looks they spoke about us. They looked incessantly at Jack, repeating, To my titata! Jack imitated all their motions, and made some grimaces which seemed to amuse them. I tried in vain to attract their attention. I had observed a handkerchief twisted round the head of him who seemed the chief, that reminded me much of the one my mother usually wore. I approached him, touched the handkerchief, saying expressively, Matua Anosuakepa. I added, pointing to the sea, Paikono. But, alas, they did not appear to understand my words. The chief thought I wished to rob him of his handkerchief, and repelled me roughly. I then wished to retire, and I told Jack to follow me, but four islanders seized him, opened his waistcoat and shirt, and cried out together, Alei te Tata! In an instant he was stripped, and his clothes and mine were put on in a strange fashion by the savages. Jack, mimicking all their contortions, recovered his shirt from one of them, put it on, and began to dance, calling on me to do the same, and, in a tone as if singing, repeated, Make your escape, Fritz, while I am amusing them. I will then run off and join you very soon. As if I could for a moment think of leaving him in the hands of these barbarians. However, I recollected at that moment the bag you had given me of toys and trinkets. We had thoughtlessly left it under the great tree where I had undressed. I told Jack, in the same tone, I would fetch it if he could amuse the savages till I returned which he might be certain would be very soon. I ran off with all speed, and without opposition, arrived at the tree, found my bag well guarded indeed, father, for what was my surprise to find our two faithful dogs, Turk and Flora, standing over it. Flora! cried I. She accompanied my dear wife and child into their captivity. They must be in this island. Why have they left it? My dear father, continued Fritz, depend on it. They are not there. But I feel convinced that the wretches who have carried off Jack hold dear Mama and Francis in captivity. Therefore we must, at all events, pursue them. The meeting between Flora and me was truly joyful, for I was now convinced that my mother and Francis were not far off, though certainly not on the same island, or their attached friend would not have quitted them. I concluded that the chief who had brought my mamma's handkerchief had also taken her dog, and brought her on this excursion, and that she had met here with a friend Turk, who had rambled from us. After caressing Flora, and taking up my bag, I ran off full speed to the spot where my dear Jack was trying to divert the barbarians. As I approached, I heard cries, not the noisy laughter of the savages, but cries of distress from my beloved brother cries for help, addressed to me. I did not walk, I flew till I reached the spot, and I then saw him bound with a sort of strong cord made of gut. His hands were fastened behind his back, his legs tied together, and these cruel men were carrying him towards their canoe, while he was crying out, Fritz, Fritz, where are you? I threw myself desperately on the six men who were bearing him off. In the struggle, my gun, which I held in my hand, caught something, and accidentally went off, and, oh, father, it was my own dear Jack that I wounded. I cannot tell how I survived his cry of, You've killed me! And when I saw his blood flow, my senses forsook me, and I fainted. When I recovered, I was alone. They had carried him off. I rose, and following the traces of his blood, 
arrived fortunately at the shore just as they were embarking. God permitted me to see him again, supported by one of the savages, and even to hear his feeble voice cry, Console yourself, Fritz. I'm not dead. I'm only wounded in the shoulder. It is not your fault. Go, my kind brother, as quickly as possible to Papa, and you will both— The canoe sailed away so swiftly that I heard no more. But I understood the rest. You will both come and rescue me. But will there be time? Will they dress his wound? Oh, father, what have I done? Can you forgive me? Overwhelmed with grief. I could only hold out my hand to my poor boy, and assure him I could not possibly blame him for this distressing accident. Ernest, though greatly afflicted, endeavoured to console his brother. He told him a wound in the shoulder was not dangerous, and the savages certainly intended to dress his wound, or they would have left him to die. Fritz, somewhat comforted, begged me to allow him to bathe, to divest himself of the colouring, which was now becoming odious to him as being that of these ruthless barbarians. I was reluctant to consent. I thought it might still be useful in gaining access to the savages, but he was certain they would recognize him in that disguise as the bearer of the thunder, and would distrust him. I now recollected to ask what had become of his gun, and was sorry to learn that they had carried it off whilst he lay insensible. He himself considered it would be useless to them, as they had fortunately left him the bag of ammunition. Ernest, however, regretted the loss to ourselves, this being the third we had lost, the one we had left in the canoe being also in the possession of the savages. The dogs we missed too, and Fritz could give no account of them. We concluded they had either followed the savages, or were still in the island. This was another severe sorrow. It seemed as if every sort of misfortune was poured out upon us. I rested on the shoulder of Ernest in my anguish. Fritz took advantage of my silence, and leaped out of the pinnace to have a bath. I was alarmed at first, but he was such an excellent swimmer, and the sea was so calm, that I soon abandoned my fears for him. Fritz was now swimming far before us, and appeared to have no idea of turning, so that I was at once certain he projected swimming on to the point where he had lost sight of the savages to be the first to discover and aid his brother. Although he was an excellent swimmer, yet the distance was so great that I was much alarmed, and especially for his arrival by night in the midst of the savages. This fear was much increased by a very extraordinary sound, which we now heard gradually approaching us. It was a sort of submarine tempest. The weather was beautiful, there was no wind, the moon shone in a cloudless sky yet the waves were swollen as if by a storm, and threatened to swallow us. We heard at the same time a noise like violent rain. Terrified at these phenomena, I cried out aloud for Fritz to return, and though it was almost impossible my voice could reach him, we saw him swimming towards us with all his strength. Ernest and I used all our power in rowing to meet him, so that we soon got to him. The moment he leaped in, he uttered in a stifled voice, pointing to the mountains of waves, "'They are enormous marine monsters, whales, I believe, such an immense shoal, they will swallow us up.' "'No,' said Ernest quietly, "'don't be alarmed. The whale is a gentle and harmless animal when not attacked. I am very glad to see them so near. We shall pass as quietly through the midst of these colossal creatures as we did through the shining zoophytes.' Doubtless the whales are searching for them, for they constitute a principal article of their food. They were now very near us, sporting on the surface of the water, or plunging into its abysses, and forcing out columns of water through their nostrils to a great height, which occasionally fell on us and wetted us. Sometimes they raised themselves on their huge tail, and looked like giants ready to fall on us and crush us. Then they went down again into the water which foamed under their immense weight. Then they seemed to be going through some military evolutions, advancing in a single line, like a body of regular troops, one after another swimming with grave dignity. Still more frequently they were in lines of two and two. This wonderful sight partly diverted us from our own melancholy thoughts. 
Fritz had, however, seized his oar, without giving himself time to dress, whilst I, at the rudder, steered as well as I could through these monsters, who are, notwithstanding their appearance, the mildest animals that exist. They allowed us to pass so closely that we were wetted with the water they spouted up, and might have touched them, and with the power to overturn us with a stroke of their tail, they never noticed us. They seemed to be satisfied with each other's society. We were truly sorry to see their mortal enemy appear amongst them, the swordfish of the south, armed with its long saw, remarkable for a sort of fringe of nine or ten inches long, which distinguishes it from the swordfish of the north. They are both terrible enemies to the whale, and next to man, who wages an eternal war with them, its most formidable foes. The whales in our South Seas had only the swordfish to dread, and as soon as they saw him approach, they dispersed, or dived into the depths of the ocean. One only, very near us, did not succeed in escaping, and we witnessed a combat, of which, however, we could not see the event. These two monsters attacked each other with equal ferocity, but as they took an opposite direction to that we were going, we soon lost sight of them. But we shall never forget our meeting with these wonderful giants of the deep. We happily doubled the promontory beyond which the canoe had passed, and found ourselves in an extensive gulf, which narrowed as it entered the land, and resembled the mouth of a river. We did not hesitate to follow its course. We went round the bay, but found no traces of man, but numerous herds of the amphibious animal, called sometimes the sea-lion, the sea-dog, or the sea-elephant, or trunked phoca. Modern voyagers give it the last name. These animals, though of enormous size, are gentle and peaceful, unless roused by the cruelty of man. They were in such numbers on this desert coast that they would have prevented our approach if we had intended it. They actually covered the beach and the rocks, opening their huge mouths, armed with very sharp teeth, more frightful than dangerous. As it was night when we entered the bay, they were all sleeping, but they produced a most deafening noise with their breathing. We left them to their noisy slumber. For us, alas, no such comfort remained. The continual anxiety attending an affliction like ours destroys all repose, and for three days we had not slept an hour. Since the new misfortune of Jack's captivity, we were all kept up by a kind of fever. Fritz was in a most incredible state of excitement, and declared he would never sleep till he had rescued his beloved brother. His bath had partially removed the colouring from his skin, but he was still dark enough to pass for a savage when arrayed like them. The shores of the strait we were navigating were very steep, and we had not yet met with any place where we could land. However, my sons persisted in thinking the savages could have taken no other route, as they had lost sight of their canoe round the promontory. As the strait was narrow and shallow, I consented that Fritz should throw off the clothes he had on, and swim to reconnoitre a place which seemed to be an opening in the rocks or hills that obstructed our passage, and we soon had the pleasure of seeing him standing on the shore, motioning for us to approach. The strait was now so confined that we could not have proceeded any further with the pinnace. We could not even bring it to the shore. Ernest and I were obliged to step into the water up to the waist, but we took the precaution to tie a long and strong rope to the prow, and when we were aided by the vigorous arm of Fritz, we soon drew the pinnace near enough to fix it by means of the anchor. There were neither trees nor rocks on that desert shore to which we could fasten the pinnace, but to our great delight and encouragement we found, at a short distance from our landing place, a bark canoe, which my sons were certain was that in which Jack had been carried off. We entered it, but at first saw only the oars. At last, however, Ernest discovered in the water which half filled the canoe part of a handkerchief stained with blood which they recognized as belonging to Jack. This discovery, which relieved our doubts, caused Fritz to shed tears of joy. 
we were certainly on the track of the robbers, and might trust that they had not proceeded farther with their barbarity. We found on the sand, and in the boat, some coconut shells and fish bones, which satisfied us of the nature of their repasts. We resolved to continue our search into the interior of the country, following the traces of the steps of the savages. We could not find any traces of Jack's foot, which would have alarmed us if Fritz had not suggested that they had carried him on account of his wound. We were about to set out, when the thoughts of the pinnace came over us. It was more than ever necessary for us to preserve this, our only means of return, and which, moreover, contained our goods for ransom, our ammunition and our provisions, still untouched, for some breadfruit Fritz had gathered, some mussels, and small but excellent oysters had been sufficient for us. It was fortunate that we had brought some gourds of water with us, for we had not met with any. We decided that it would be necessary to leave one of our party to guard the precious pinnace, though this would be but an insufficient and dangerous defence in case of the approach of the natives. My recent bereavements made me tremble at the idea of leaving either of my sons. I cannot yet reflect on the agony of that moment without horror, yet it was the sole means to secure our vessel. There was not a creek or a tree to hide it, and the situation of the canoe made it certain the savages must return there to embark. My children knew my thoughts, by the distracted glances with which I alternately regarded them and the pinnace, and after consulting each other's looks, Ernest said, The pinnace must not remain here unguarded, father, to be taken, or at any rate pillaged by the natives, who will return for their canoe. Either we must all wait till they come, or you must leave me to defend it. I see, Fritz, that you could not endure to remain here. In fact, Fritz impatiently stamped with his foot, saying, I confess I cannot remain here. Jack may be dying of his wound, and every moment is precious. I will seek him, find him, and save him. I have a presentiment I shall, and if I discover him, as I expect, in the hands of the savages, I know the way to release him, and to prevent them carrying off our pinnace. I saw that the daring youth, in the heat of his exasperation, exposed alone to the horde of barbarians, might also become their victim. I saw that my presence was necessary to restrain and aid him, and I decided with a heavy heart to leave Ernest alone to protect the vessel. His calm and cool manner made it less dangerous for him to meet the natives. He knew several words of their language, and had read of the mode of addressing and conciliating them. He promised me to be prudent which his elder brother could not be. We took the bag of toys which Fritz had brought, and left those in the chest, to use if necessary, and, praying for the blessing of heaven on my son, we left him. My sorrow was great, but he was no longer a child, and his character encouraged me. Fritz embraced his brother, and promised him to bring Jack back in safety. After having traversed for some time a desert, sandy plain, without meeting a living creature, we arrived at a thick wood, where we lost the traces we had carefully followed. We were obliged to direct our course by chance, keeping no fixed road, but advancing as the interwoven branches permitted us. The wood was alive with the most beautiful birds of brilliant and varied plumage, but in our anxious and distressed state, we should have been more interested in seeing a savage than a bird. We passed at last through these verdant groves, and reached an arid plain extending to the shore. We again discovered numerous footsteps, and whilst we were observing them, we saw a large canoe pass rapidly, filled with islanders, and this time I thought that, in spite of the distance, I could recognize the canoe we had built, and which they had robbed us of. Fritz wished to swim after them, and was beginning to undress himself, and I only stopped him by declaring that if he did, I must follow him, as I had decided not to be separated from him. I even proposed that we should return to Ernest, as I was of opinion that the savages should stop at the place where we had disembarked, to take away the boat they had left, and we might then, by means of the words Ernest had acquired, 
learn from them what had become of my wife and children. Fritz agreed to this, though he still persisted that the easiest and quickest mode of return would have been by swimming. We were endeavouring to retrace our road, when to our great astonishment we saw at a few yards' distance a man clothed in a long black robe advancing towards us, whom we immediately recognised as a European. "'Either I am greatly deceived,' said I, "'or this is a missionary, a worthy servant of God, coming to these remote regions to make him known to the wretched idolaters.' We hastened to him. I was not wrong. He was one of those zealous and courageous Christians who devote their energies and their lives to the instruction and eternal salvation of men born in another hemisphere, of another color, uncivilized, but not less our brothers. I had quitted Europe with the same intention, but Providence had ordered it otherwise. Yet I met with joy one of my Christian brethren, and, unable to speak from emotion, I silently embraced him. He spoke to me in English, a language I had fortunately learned myself, and taught to my children, and his words fell on my soul like the message of the angel to Abraham, commanding him to spare his son. "'You are the person I am seeking,' said he, in a mild and tender tone, "'and I thank heaven that I have met with you. This youth is Fritz, your eldest son, I conclude. But where have you left your second son, Ernest?' "'Reverend man!' cried Fritz, seizing his hands. "'You have seen my brother Jack. Perhaps my mother? You know where they are. Oh, are they living?' "'Yes, they are living, and well taken care of,' said the missionary. "'Come, and I will lead you to them.' It was indeed necessary to lead me. I was so overcome with joy that I should have fainted, but the good missionary made me inhale some volatile salts which he had about him and, supported by him and my son, I managed to walk. My first words were a thanksgiving to God for his mercy. Then I implored my good friend to tell me if I should indeed see my wife and children again. He assured me that an hour's walk would bring me to them. But I suddenly recollected Ernest, and refused to present myself before the beloved ones while he was still in danger. The missionary smiled, as he told me he expected this delay and wished to know where we had left Ernest. I recounted to him our arrival in the island, and the purpose for which we had left Ernest, with our intention of returning to him as soon as we saw the canoe pass, hoping to obtain some intelligence from the savages. "'But how could you have made yourselves understood?' said he. "'Are you acquainted with their language?' I told him Ernest had studied the vocabulary of the South Sea Islanders. Doubtless that of Tahiti, or the Friendly Islands, said he, but the dialect of these islanders differs much from theirs. I have resided here more than a year, and I have studied it. So may be of use to you. Let us go. Which way did you come? Through the thick wood, replied I, where we wandered a long time, and I fear we shall have some difficulty in finding our way back. "'You should have taken the precaution to notch the trees as you came,' said our worthy friend. "'Without that precaution you were in danger of being lost. "'But we will find my marks, which will lead us to the brook, "'and following its course we shall be safe.' "'We saw no brook,' remarked Fritz. "'There is a brook of excellent water, which you have missed in crossing the forest. "'If you had ascended the course of the stream, "'you would have reached the hut which contains your dear friends.' The brook runs before it. Fritz struck his forehead with vexation. God orders all for the best, said I to the good priest. We might not have met with you. We should have been without earnest. You might have sought us all day in vain. Ah, good man, it is under your holy auspices that our family ought to meet, in order to increase our happiness. Now please to tell me. But first, interrupted Fritz, Pray tell me how Jack is. He was wounded, and— Be composed, young man, said the calm man of God. The wound, which he confesses he owes to his own imprudence, will have no evil consequences. The savages had applied some healing herbs to it, but it was necessary to extract a small ball, an operation which I performed yesterday evening. Since then he suffers less, 
and will soon be well, when his anxiety about you is relieved. Fritz embraced the kind missionary, entreating his pardon for his rashness, and adding, Did my brother talk to you of us, sir? He did, answered his friend. But I was acquainted with you before. Your mother talked continually of her husband and children. What mingled pain and delight she felt yesterday evening when the savages brought to her dear Jack wounded. I was fortunately in the hut to comfort her, and assist her beloved boy. And dear Francis, said I, how rejoiced he would be to see his brother again. Francis, said the missionary, smiling, will be the protector of you all. He is the idol of the savages now, an idolatry permitted by Christianity. We proceeded through the wood as we conversed, and at last reached the brook. I had a thousand questions to ask, and was very anxious to know how my wife and Francis had been brought to this island, and how they met with a missionary. The five or six days we had been separated seemed to me five or six months. We walked too quickly for me to get much information. The English minister said little, and referred me to my wife and son for all details. On the subject of his own noble mission, he was less reserved. Thank God, said he, I have already succeeded in giving this people some notions of humanity. They love their black friend, as they call me, and willingly listen to my preaching, and the singing of some hymns. When your little Francis was taken, he had his reed flageolet in his pocket, and his playing and graceful manners have so captivated them that I fear they will, with reluctance, resign him. The king is anxious to adopt him. But do not alarm yourself, brother. I hope to arrange all happily, with the divine assistance. I have gained some power over them, and I will avail myself of it. A year ago I could not have answered for the life of the prisoners. Now I believe them to be in safety. But how much is there yet to teach these simple children of nature, who listen only to her voice, and yield to every impression. Their first impulse is good, but they are so unsteady their affection may suddenly change to hatred. They are inclined to theft, violent in their anger, yet generous and affectionate. You will see an instance of this in the abode where a woman, more unfortunate than your wife, since she has lost her husband, has found an asylum. He was silent, and I did not question him farther on this subject. We were approaching the arm of the sea where we had left our pinnace, and my heart, at ease about the rest, became now anxious solely for earnest. Sometimes the hills concealed the water from us. Fritz climbed them, anxious to discover his brother. At last I heard him suddenly cry out, Ernest! Ernest! He was answered by shouts, or rather howls, amongst which I could not distinguish the voice of my son. Terror seized me. These are the islanders, said I to the missionary, and these frightful cries are cries of joy, said he, which will be increased when they see you. This path will conduct us to the shore. Call Fritz, but I do not see him. He will doubtless have descended the hill, and join them. Have no fears. Recommend your sons to be prudent. The black friend will speak to his black friends, and they will hear him. We proceeded towards the shore, when at some distance I perceived my two sons on the deck of the pinnace, which was covered with the islanders, to whom they were distributing the treasures of the chest, at least those we had put apart in the bag. They had not been so imprudent as to open the chest itself, which would soon have been emptied. It remained snugly below the deck with the powder-barrel. At every new acquisition the savages uttered cries of joy, repeating, Mona, Mona, signifying beautiful. The mirrors were at first received with the most delight, but this soon changed into terror. They evidently conceived that there was something magical about them, and flung them all into the sea. The colored glass beads had then the preference, but the distribution caused many disputes. Those who had not obtained any wished to deprive the rest of them by force. The clamor and quarreling were increasing, when the voice of the missionary was heard, and calmed them as if by enchantment. 
all left the pinnace and crowded round him. He harangued them in their own language, and pointed me out to them, naming me Metuatuan, that is, Father, which they repeated in their turn. Some approached me, and rubbed their noses against mine, which, the pastor had informed me, was a mark of respect. In the meantime, Fritz had informed Ernest that his mother and brothers were found, and that the man who accompanied us was a European. Ernest received the intelligence with a calm joy. It was only by the tears in his eyes you could discover how much his heart was affected. He leaped from the pinnace and came to thank the missionary. I had my share of his gratitude, too, for coming to seek him before I had seen the dear lost ones. We had now to think of joining them. We unanimously decided to proceed by water, in the first place, that we might bring our pinnace as near as possible to my dear Elizabeth, who was still suffering from her fall, her forced voyage, and above all from her anxiety. Besides, I confess that I felt a little fatigue, and should have reluctantly set out to cross the wood a third time. But, in addition to this, I was assured that it was the promptest mode of reaching our friends, and this alone would have decided me. The pinnace was then loosened, the sail set, and we entered with thankfulness. Dreading the agitation of my wife if she saw us suddenly, I entreated our new friend to precede us and prepare her. He consented, but as he was coming on board, he was suddenly stopped by the natives, and one of them addressed him for some time. The missionary listened till he had concluded with calmness and dignity. Then, turning to me, he said, You must answer for me, brother, the request which Paramaxuat makes. He wishes me, in the name of the whole, to wait a few moments for their chief, to whom they give the title of king. Barauru, as he is called, has assembled them here for a ceremony, at which all his warriors must assist. I have been anxious to attend, fearing it might be a sacrifice to their idols, which I have always strongly opposed, and wishing to seize this occasion to declare to them the one true God. Barauru is not wicked, and I hope to succeed in touching his heart, enlightening his mind, and converting him to Christianity. His example would certainly be followed by the greatest part of his subjects, who are much attached to him. Your presence, and the name of God uttered by you, with the fervor and in the attitude of profound veneration and devotion, may aid this work of charity and love. Have you sufficient self-command to delay, for perhaps a few hours, the meeting with your family? Your wife and children, not expecting you, will not suffer from suspense. If you do not agree to this, I will conduct you to them, and return, I hope in time, to fulfill my duty. I wait your decision to reply to Paramakwekde, who is already sufficiently acquainted with the truth, to desire that his king and his brethren should know it also. Such were the words of this true servant of God, but I cannot do justice to the expression of his heavenly countenance. Mr. Willis, for such was his name, was forty-five or fifty years of age, tall and thin. The labors and fatigues of his divine vocation had, more than years, left their traces on his noble figure and countenance. He stooped a little, his open and elevated forehead was slightly wrinkled, and his thin air was prematurely gray. His clear blue eyes were full of intelligence and kindness, reading your thoughts, and showing you all his own. He usually kept his arms folded over his breast, and was very calm in speaking. But when his extended hand pointed to heaven, the effect was irresistible. One might have thought he saw the very glory he spoke of. His simple words to me seemed a message from God, and it would have been impossible to resist him. It was indeed a sacrifice, but I made it without hesitation. I glanced at my sons, who had their eyes cast down, but I saw Fritz knitting his brows. "'I shall stay with you, father,' said I. "'Happy if I could assist you in fulfilling your sacred duties.' 
"'And you, young people,' said he, "'are you of the same opinion?' Fritz came forward, and frankly said, "'Sir, it was, unfortunately, I who wounded my brother Jack. He has been generous enough to conceal this. You extracted the ball which I discharged into his shoulder. I owe his life to you, and mine is at your disposal. I can refuse you nothing, and however impatient, I must remain with you.' I repeat the same, said Ernest. You protected our mother and brothers, and by God's permission you restore them to us. We will all remain with you. You shall fix the time of our meeting, which will not, I trust, be long delayed. I signified my approbation, and the missionary gave them his hand, assuring them that their joy on meeting their friends would be greatly increased by the consciousness of this virtuous self-denial. We soon experienced this. Mr. Willis learned from Parabakuate that they were going to fetch their king in our pretty canoe when we saw it pass. The royal habitation was situated on the other side of the promontory, and we soon heard a joyful cry that they saw the canoe coming. While the savages were engaged in preparing to meet their chief, I entered the pinnace, and, descending beneath the deck, I took from the chest what I judged most fitting to present to His Majesty. I chose an axe, a saw, a pretty small ornamented sabre, which could not do much harm, a packet of nails, and one of glass beads. I had scarcely put aside these articles when my sons rushed to me in great excitement. "'Oh, father!' cried they at once. "'Look! Look! Summon all your fortitude! See! There is Francis himself in the canoe!' Oh, how curiously he is dressed! I looked and saw at some distance our canoe ascending the strait. It was decorated with green branches, which the savages, who formed the king's guard, held in their hand. Others were rowing vigorously, and the chief, wearing a red and yellow handkerchief, which had belonged to my wife, as a turban, was seated at the stern, and a pretty little blooming flaxen-haired boy was placed on his right shoulder. With what delight did I recognize my child! He was naked above the waist, and wore a little tunic of woven leaves which reached to his knees, a necklace and bracelets of shells, and a variety of colored feathers mingled with his bright curls. One of these fell over his face, and doubtless prevented him from seeing us. The chief seemed much engaged with him, and continually took some ornament from his own dress to decorate him. "'It is my child,' said I, in great terror, to Mr. Willis. "'My dearest and youngest! They have taken him from his mother. What must be her grief? He is her Benjamin, the child of her love. Why have they taken him? Why have they adorned him in this manner? Why have they brought him here?' "'Have no fear,' said the missionary. "'They will do him no harm. I promise you they shall restore him, and you shall take him back to his mother.' Place yourselves at my side, with these branches in your hands. He took some from Parabapakuate, who held a bundle of them, and gave us each one. Each of the savages took one also. They were from a tree which had slender, elegant leaves, and rich scarlet flowers, species of mimosa. The Indians call it the tree of peace. They carry a branch of it when they have no hostile intentions. In all their assemblies, when war is proclaimed, they make a fire of these branches, and if all are consumed, it is considered an omen of victory. While Mr. Willis was explaining this to us, the canoe approached. Two savages took Francis on their shoulders, two others took the king in the same way, and advanced gravely towards us. What difficulty I had to restrain myself from snatching my child from his bearers and embracing him! My sons were equally agitated. Fritz was darting forward, but the missionary restrained him. Francis, somewhat alarmed at his position, had his eyes cast down and had not yet seen us. When the king was within twenty yards of us, they stopped, and all the savages prostrated themselves before him. We alone remained standing. Then Francis saw us and uttered a piercing cry calling out, Papa, dear brothers, 
He struggled to quit the shoulders of his bearers, but they held him too firmly. It was impossible to restrain ourselves longer. We all cried out, and mingled our tears and lamentations. I said to the good missionary, a little too harshly, perhaps, Ah, if you were a father! I am, said he, the father of all this flock, and your children are mine. I am answerable for all. Command your sons to be silent, request the child to be composed, and leave the rest to me. I immediately took advantage of the permission to speak. Dear Francis, said I, holding out my arms, we are come to seek you and your mother. After all our dangers we shall soon meet again, to part no more. But be composed, my child, and do not risk the happiness of that moment by any impatience. Trust in God, and in this good friend that he has given us, and who has restored to me the treasures without which I could not live. We then waved our hands to him, and he remained still, but wept quietly, murmuring our names. Papa, Fritz, Ernest, tell me about Mama," said he, at last, in an inquiring tone. She does not know we are so near her, said I. How did you leave her? Very much grieved, said he, that they brought me away, but they have not done me any harm. They are so kind, and we shall soon all go back to her. Oh, what joy for her and our friends! One word about Jack, said Fritz. How does his wound go on? Oh, pretty well, answered he. He has no pain now, and Sophia nurses him and amuses him. How little Matilda would weep when the savages carried me off! If you knew, Papa, how kind and good she is! I had no time to ask who Sophia and Matilda were. They had allowed me to speak to my son to tranquilize him, but the king now commanded silence, and, still elevated on the shoulders of his people, began to harangue the assembly. He was a middle-aged man with striking features. His thick lips, his hair tinged with red paint, his dark brown face, which as well as his body was tattooed with white, gave him a formidable aspect, yet his countenance was not unpleasant, and announced no ferocity. In general, these savages have enormous mouths, with long white teeth. They wear a tunic of reeds or leaves from the waist to the knees. My wife's handkerchief, which I had recognized at first, was gracefully twisted round the head of the king. His hair was fastened up high and ornamented with feathers, but it nearly removed them all to deck my boy. He placed him at his side, and frequently pointed him out during his speech. I was on thorns. As soon as he had concluded, the savages shouted, clapped their hands, and surrounded my child dancing and presenting him fruit, flowers, and shells, crying out, Uraki! a cry in which the king, who was now standing, joined also. What does the word Uraki mean? said I to the missionary. It is the new name of your son, answered he, or rather of the son of Barauru, who has just adopted him. Never! cried I, darting forward. Boys, let us rescue your brother from these barbarians! We all three rushed towards Francis, who, weeping, extended his arms to us. The savages attempted to repulse us, but at that moment the missionary pronounced some words in a loud voice. They immediately prostrated themselves on their faces, and we had no difficulty in securing the child. We brought him to our protector, who still remained in the same attitude in which he had spoken, with his eyes and his right hand raised towards heaven. He made a sign for the savages to rise, and afterwards spoke for some time to them. What would I have given to have understood him? But I formed some idea from the effect of his words. He frequently pointed to us, pronouncing the word Iacute, Ruiacute, and particularly addressed the king, who listened motionless to him. At the conclusion of his speech, Barauru approached and attempted to take hold of Francis, who threw himself into my arms, where I firmly held him. Let him go now, said Mr. Willis, and fear nothing. I released the child. The king lifted him up, 
pressed his own nose to his, then, placing him on the ground, took away the feathers and necklace with which he had decked him, and replaced him in my arms, rubbing my nose also, and repeating several words. In my first emotion I threw myself on my knees, and was imitated by my two sons. "'It is well!' cried the missionary, again raising his eyes and hands. Thus should you offer thanks to heaven. The king, convinced it is the will of God, restores your child, and wishes to become your friend. He is worthy to be so, for he adores and fears your God. May he soon learn to know and believe all the truths of Christianity. Let us pray together that the time may come when, on these shores, where paternal love has triumphed, I may see a temple rise to the Father of all, the God of peace and love. He kneeled down, and the king and all his people followed his example. Without understanding the words of his prayer, I joined in the spirit of it with all my heart and soul. I then presented my offerings to the king, increasing them considerably. I would willingly have given all my treasures in exchange for him he had restored to me. My sons also gave something to each of the savages, who incessantly cried, Tayo, Tayo! I begged Mr. Willis to tell the king I gave him my canoe, and hoped he would use it to visit us in our island, to which we were returning. He appeared pleased, and wished to accompany us in our pinnace, which he seemed greatly to admire. Some of his people followed him on board to row. The rest placed themselves in the canoes. We soon entered the sea again, and, doubling the second point, we came to an arm of the sea much wider, and deep enough for our pinnace, and which conducted us to the object of our dearest hopes. We were never weary with caressing our dear Francis. We were very anxious to learn from him all the particulars of the arrival of savages in our island, the seizure of his mother and himself, their voyage, and their residence here, and who were the friends they had met with but it was impossible. His tawny majesty never left us for a moment, and played with the boy as if he had been a child himself. Francis showed him all the toys from our chest. He was extremely amused with the small mirrors and the dolls. A painted carriage, driven by a coachman who raised his whip when the wheels turned, appeared miraculous to him. He uttered screams of delight as he pointed it out to his followers. The ticking of my watch also charmed him and as I had several more, I gave it to him, showing him how to wind it up. But the first time he tried to do it, he broke the spring, and when it was silent he cared no longer for it, but threw it on one side. However, as the gold was very glittering, he took it up again, and suspending it from the handkerchief that was wound round his head, it hung over his nose and formed a striking ornament. Francis showed him his face in a mirror, which royal amusement made him laugh heartily. He asked the missionary if it was the invisible and almighty God who had made all these wonderful things. Mr. Willis replied that it was he who gave men the power to make them. I do not know whether Bara Uru comprehended this, but he remained for some time in deep thought. I profited by this to ask the missionary what were the words which had terrified them so when they wished to keep my son from me, and which had compelled them to surrender him. I told them, answered he, that the almighty and unseen God, of whom I spoke to them daily, ordered them by my voice to restore a son to his father. I threatened them with his anger if they refused, and promised them his mercy if they obeyed, and they did obey. The first step is gained. They know the duty of adoring and obeying God. Every other truth proceeds from this, and I have no doubt that my savages will one day become good Christians. My method of instruction is suited to their limited capacity. I prove to them that their wooden idols, made by their own hands, could neither create, hear them, nor protect them. I have shown them God in His works, have declared Him to be as good as He is powerful, hating evil, cruelty, murder, and cannibalism, and they have renounced all these. In their late wars they have either released or adopted their prisoners. If they carried off your wife and son, 
they intended it for a good action, as you will soon understand. I could not ask Francis any questions, as Bero Uru continued playing with him. So, turning to Ernest, I asked him what passed when the savages joined him. "'When you left me,' said he, "'I amused myself by searching for shells, plants, and zoophytes, with which the rocks abound, and I have added a good deal to my collection. I was at some distance from the pinnace when I heard a confused sound of voices, and concluded that the savages were coming. In fact, ten or a dozen issued from the road you had entered, and I cannot comprehend how you missed meeting them. Fearing they would attempt to take possession of my pinnace, I returned speedily, and seized a loaded musket, though I determined to use it only to defend my own life, or the pinnace. I stood on the deck in an attitude as bold and imposing as I could command, but I did not succeed in intimidating them. They leaped one after the other on deck, and surrounded me, uttering loud cries. I could not discover whether they were cries of joy or of fury, but I showed no fear, and addressed them in a friendly tone, in some words from Captain Cook's vocabulary, but they did not seem to comprehend me. Neither could I understand any of theirs, except for Tarotoo, woman. One of them had Fritz's gun, from which I concluded they were of the party that had carried off Jack. I took it, and showing him mine, endeavored to make him understand that it also belonged to me. He thought I wished to exchange, and readily offered to return it and take mine. This would not have suited me. Fritz's gun was discharged and I could not let them have mine loaded. To prevent accident, surrounded as I was, I decided to give them a fright, and seeing a bird flying above us, I took aim so correctly that my shot brought down the bird, a blue pigeon. They were for a moment stupefied with terror, then immediately all left the pinnace, except Parab Equitete. He seemed to be pleased with me, often pointing to the sky and speaking something which means good, I believe. His comrades were examining the dead bird. Some touched their own shoulders, to try if they were wounded as well as the bird and Jack had been, which convinced me they had carried him off. I tried to make Parabacuate understand my suspicion, and I think I succeeded, for he made me an affirmative sign, pointing to the interior of the island, and touching his shoulder with an air of pity. I took several things from the chest and gave them to him, making signs that he should show them to the others, and induce them to return to me. He comprehended me very well, and complied with my wishes. I was soon surrounded by the whole party begging of me. I was busy distributing beads, mirrors, and small knives when you came, and we are now excellent friends. Two or three of them returned to the wood, and brought me coconuts and bananas. But we must be careful to hide our guns, of which they have a holy horror. And now, dear father, I think we ought not to call these people savages. They have the simplicity of childhood. A trifle irritates them, a trifle appeases them, but they are grateful and affectionate. I find them neither cruel nor barbarous. They have done me no harm, when they might easily have killed me, thrown me into the sea, or carried me away. We must not said I, judge of all savage people by these, who have had the benefit of a virtuous teacher. Mr. Willis has already cast into their hearts the seeds of that divine religion, which commands us to do unto others as we would they should do unto us, and to pardon and love our enemies. While we were discoursing, we arrived at a spot where the canoes had already landed. We were about to do the same, but the king did not seem inclined to quit the pinnace but continued speaking to the missionary. I was still fearful that he wished to keep Francis, to whom he seemed to be more and more attached, holding him constantly on his knee. But at last, to my great joy, he placed him in my arms. "'He keeps his word with you,' said Mr. Willis. "'You may carry him to his mother. But in return he wishes you to permit him to go in your pinnace to his abode on the other side of the strait, that he may show it to the women.' and he promises to bring it back. Perhaps there would be danger in refusing him. I agreed with him, 
but still there was a difficulty in granting this request. If he chose to keep it, how should we return? Besides, it contained our only barrel of powder, and all our articles of traffic, and how could we expect it would escape pillage? Mr. Willis confessed that he had not been able to cure their fondness for theft, and suggested, as the only means of security, that I should accompany the king and bring the pinnace back, which was then to be committed to the charge of Parabaquite, for whose honesty he would be responsible. Here was another delay. The day was so far advanced that I might not perhaps be able to return before night. Besides, though my wife did not know we were so near her, she knew they had carried away Francis, and she would certainly be very uneasy about him. Barauru looked very impatient, and as it was necessary to answer him, I decided at once. I resigned Francis to the missionary, entreating him to take him to his mother, to prepare her for our approach, and to relate the cause of our delay. I told my sons it was my desire they should accompany me. Fritz agreed rather indignantly, and earnest with calmness. Mr. Willis told the king that in gratitude to him, and to do him honor, I and my sons wished to accompany him. He appeared much flattered at this, made my sons seat themselves on each side of him, endeavored to pronounce their names, and finished by exchanging names as a token of friendship, calling Fritz Bara, Ernest, Uru, and himself Fritz Ernest. Mr. Willis and Francis left us. Our hearts were sad to see them go where all our wishes centered, but the die was cast. The king gave the signal to depart. The canoes took the lead, and we followed. In an hour we saw the royal palace. It was a tolerably large hut, constructed of bamboos and palm leaves very neatly. Several women were seated before it, busily employed in making the short petticoats of reeds which they all wore. Their hair was very carefully braided in tufts on the crown of the head. None were good-looking, except two daughters of the king, about ten and twelve years old, who, though very dark, were graceful. These, no doubt, he intended for wise for my Francis. We disembarked about a hundred yards from the hut. The women came to meet us, carrying a branch of the mimosa in each hand. They then performed a singular kind of dance, entwining their arms and shaking their feet, but never moving from the spot. This they accompanied with a wild chant, which was anything but musical. The king seemed pleased with it, and, calling his wives and daughters, he showed them his Tayo, Bara, and Uru, calling himself Fritz Ernest. He then joined in the dance, dragging my sons with him, who managed it pretty well. As for me, he treated me with great respect, always calling me the name for father, and made me sit down on a large trunk of a tree before his house, which was doubtless his throne, for he placed me there with great ceremony, rubbing his royal nose against mine. After the dance was concluded, the women retired to the hut and returned to offer us a collation, served up in the shells of coconuts. It was a sort of paste, composed, I believe, of different sorts of fruit, mixed up with a kind of flour, and the milk of the coconut. This mixture was detestable to me, but I made up for it with some kernel of coconuts and the breadfruit. Perceiving that I liked these, Barauru ordered some of them to be gathered, and carried to the pinnace. The hut was backed by a wood of palms and other trees, so that our provision was readily made. Still there was time for my sons to run to the pinnace, attended by Parabacuate, and bring from the chest some beads, mirrors, scissors, needles, and pins to distribute to the ladies. When they brought the fruit they had gathered, I made a sign to Barauru to take them to see the pinnace. He called them and they followed him timidly and submitting to his wishes in everything. They carried the fruit two and two in a sort of basket, very skillfully woven in rushes, which appeared to have a European form. They had no furniture in their dwelling but mats, which were doubtless their beds, and some trunks of trees serving for seats and tables. Several baskets were suspended to the bamboo, 
which form the walls, and also lances, slings, clubs, and other similar weapons, from which I concluded they were a nation of warriors. I did not observe much, however, for my thoughts were in the future, and I was very impatient for our departure. I hastened to the pinnace, and my sons distributed their gifts to the females, who did not dare to express their delight, but it was evident in their countenances. They immediately began to adorn themselves with their presence, and appeared to value the mirrors much more than their husbands had done. They soon understood their use, and employed them to arrange with taste the strings of beads round their necks, heads, and arms. At last the signal was given for our departure. I rubbed my nose against that of the king. I added to my presence a packet of nails, and one of gilt buttons, which he seemed to covet. I went on board my pinnace, and, conducted by the good Parabaquite, we took our way to that part of the coast where the dear ones resided, whom I so anxiously desired to see. Some of the savages accompanied us in their own canoe. We should have preferred having only our friend Parabaquite, but we were not the masters. Favored by the wind, we soon reached the shore we had formerly quitted, and found our excellent missionary waiting for us. Come, said he, you are now going to receive your reward. Your wife and children impatiently expect you. They would have come to meet you, but your wife is still weak and Jack suffering. Your presence will soon cure them. I was too much affected to answer. Fritz gave me his arm, as much to support me as to restrain himself from rushing on before. Ernest did the same with Mr. Willis. His mildness pleased the good man who also saw his taste for study and tried to encourage it. After half an hour's walk, the missionary told us we were now near our good friends. I saw no sign of a habitation, nothing but trees and rocks. At last I saw a light smoke among the trees, and at that moment Francis, who had been watching, ran to meet us. "'Mama is expecting you,' said he, showing us the way through a grove of shrubs, thick enough to hide entirely the entrance into a kind of grotto, we had to stoop to pass into it. It resembled much the entrance of the bear's den, which we found in the remote part of our island. A mat of rushes covered the opening, yet permitted the light to penetrate it. Francis removed the matting, calling, "'Mama, here we are!' A lady, apparently about twenty-seven years of age, of mild and pleasing appearance, came forward to meet me. She was clothed in a robe made of palm leaves tied together, which reached from her throat to her feet, leaving her beautiful arms uncovered. Her light hair was braided and fastened up round her head. "'You are welcome,' said she, taking my hand. "'You will be my poor friend's best physician.' We entered and saw my dear wife seated on a bed of moss and leaves, she wept abundantly, pointing out to me our dear boy by her side. A little nymph of eleven or twelve years old was endeavouring to raise him. "'Here are your papa and brothers, Jack,' said she. "'You are very happy in having what I have not. But your papa will be mine, and you shall be my brother.' Jack thanked her affectionately. Fritz and Ernest, kneeling beside the couch, embraced their mother. Fritz begged her to forgive him for hurting his brother, and then tenderly inquired of Jack after his wound. For me, I cannot describe my gratitude and agitation. I could scarce utter a word to my dear wife, who, on her part, sunk down quite overcome on her bed. The lady, who was, I understood, named Madame Hertel, approached to assist her. When she recovered, she presented to me Madame Hertel and her two daughters. The eldest, Sophia, was attending on Jack. Matilda, who was about ten or eleven years of age, was playing with Francis, while the good missionary, on his knees, thanked God for having reunited us. "'And for life,' cried my dear wife, "'my dear husband, I well knew you would set out to seek me, but how could I anticipate that you would ever succeed in finding me?' We will now separate no more. This beloved friend has agreed to accompany us to the happy island, as I intend to call it, 
if I ever have the happiness to reach it again, with all I love in the world. How graciously God permits us to derive blessings from our sorrows. See what my trial has produced me, a friend and two dear daughters, for henceforward we are only one family. We were mutually delighted with this arrangement, and entreated Mr. Willis to visit us often, and to come and live in the happy island when his mission was completed. I will consent, said he, if you will come and assist me in my duties, for which purpose you and your sons must acquire the language of these islanders. We are much nearer your island than you think, for you took a very circuitous course, and Parabacuate, who knows it, declares it is only a day's voyage with a fair wind. And, moreover, he tells me, that he is so much delighted with you and your sons, that he cannot part with you, and wishes me to obtain your permission to accompany you, and remain with you. He will be exceedingly useful to you, will teach the language to you all, and will be a ready means of communication between us. I readily agreed to take Parabacuate with us as a friend, but it was no time yet to think of departing, as Mr. Willis wished to have Jack some days longer under his care. We therefore arranged that I and my two sons should become his guests, as his hut was but a short distance off. We had many things to hear, but as my wife was yet too weak to relate her adventures, we resolved first to have the history of Madame Hertel. Night coming on, the missionary lighted a gourd lamp, and after a light collation of breadfruit, Madame Hertel began her story. My life, she began, passed without any remarkable events, till the misfortune occurred which brought me to this island. I was married, when very young, to Mr. Hertel, a merchant at Hamburg, an excellent man whose loss I have deeply felt. I was very happy in this union, arranged by my parents, and sanctioned by reason. We had three children, a son and two daughters, in the first three years of our marriage. And Mr. Hertel, seeing his family increase so rapidly, wished to increase his income. An advantageous establishment was offered him in the Canary Islands. He accepted it, and prevailed on me to settle there, with my family, for some years. My parents were dead. I had no tie to detain me in Europe. I was going to see new regions those fortunate isles I had heard so much of, and I set out joyfully with my husband and children, little foreseeing the misfortunes before me. Our voyage was favourable. The children, like myself, were delighted with the novelties of it. I was then twenty-three years old, Sophia seven, Matilda six, and Alfred, our pretty, gentle boy, not yet five. Poor child! He was the darling and the plaything of all the crew. She wept bitterly for a few moments, and then resumed her narration. He was as fair as your own Francis, and greatly resembled him. We proceeded first to Bordeaux, where my husband had a correspondent, with whom he had had large dealings. By his means my husband was enabled to raise large sums for his new undertaking. We carried with us, in fact, nearly his whole fortune. We re-embarked under the most favourable auspices, the weather delightful, and the wind fair. But we very soon had a change. We were met by a terrible storm and hurricane, such as the sailors had never witnessed. For a week our ship was tossed about by contrary winds, driven into unknown seas, lost all its rigging, and was at last so broken that the water poured in on all sides. All was lost, apparently, but in this extremity my husband made a last attempt to save us. He tied my daughters and myself firmly to a plank, taking the charge of my boy himself, as he feared the additional weight would be too much for our raft. His intention was to tie himself to another plank, to fasten this to ours, and taking his son in his arms, to give us a chance of being carried to the shore, which did not appear far off. Whilst he was occupied in placing us, he gave Alfred to the care of a sailor who was particularly attached to him. I heard the man say, Leave him with me. I will take care to save him. 
On this Mr. Hertel insisted on his restoring him, and I cried out that he should be given to me. At that moment the ship, which was already fallen on its side, filled rapidly with water, plunged, and disappeared with all on board. The plank on which I and my daughters were fixed alone floated, and I saw nothing but death and desolation round me. Madame Hertel paused, almost suffocated by the remembrance of that awful moment. "'Poor woman!' said my wife, weeping. "'It is five years since this misfortune. It was at the same time as our shipwreck, and was doubtless caused by the same storm. But how much more fortunate was I! I lost none that was dear to me, and we even had the vessel left for our use. But, my dear, unfortunate friend, by what miracle were you saved? It was he who only can work miracles, said the missionary, who cares for the widow and the orphan, and without whose word not a hair of the head can perish, who at that moment gave courage to the Christian mother. My strength, continued she, was nearly exhausted when, after being tossed about by the furious waves, I found myself thrown upon what I supposed to be a sandbank with my two children. I envied the state of my husband and son. If I had not been a mother I should have wished to have followed them, but my two girls lay senseless at my side, and I was anxious, as I perceived they still breathed, to recover them. At the moment Mr. Hertel pushed the raft into the water, he threw upon it a box bound with iron, which I grasped mechanically and still held, when we were left on shore. It was not locked, yet it was with some difficulty, in my confined position, that I succeeded in opening it. It contained a quantity of gold and banknotes, which I looked upon with contempt and regret. But there was something useful in the box. In the Morocco portfolio, which contained the banknotes, there were the usual little instruments, a knife, scissors, pencils, stiletto, and also a small bottle of eau de cologne, which was particularly serviceable in restoring my children. I began by cutting the cords that tied us. I then rubbed my dear children with the eau de cologne, made them inhale it, and even swallow a little. The wind was still blowing, but the clouds began to break and the sun appeared, which dried and warmed us. My poor children opened their eyes and knew me, and I felt I was not utterly comfortless. But their first words were to ask for their father and brother. I could not tell them that they were no more. I tried to deceive myself, to support my strength, by a feeble and delusive hope. Mr. Hertel swam well, the sailor still better and the last words I had heard still rung in my ears, Do not be uneasy, I will save the child. If I saw anything floating at a distance, my heart began to beat, and I ran towards the water. But I saw it was only wreck, which I could not even reach. Some pieces were, however, thrown on shore, and with these and our own raft I was enabled to make a sort of shelter by resting them against a rock. My poor children, by crouching under this, sheltered themselves from the rain or from the rays of the sun. I had the good fortune to preserve a large beaver hat, which I wore at the time, and this protected me. But these resources gave me little consolation. My children were complaining of hunger, and I felt only how much we were in want of. I had seen a shellfish on the shore, resembling the oyster or mussel. I collected some, and opening them with my knife, we made a repast on them which sufficed for the first day. Night came. My children offered up their evening prayer, and I earnestly besought the succor of the Almighty. I then lay down beside my babes on our raft as conveniently as we could, and they soon slept. The fearful thoughts of the past and dreadful anticipations of the future prevented me from sleeping. My situation was indeed melancholy, but I felt, as a mother, I ought not to wish for death. As soon as day broke, I went close to the shore to seek some shellfish for our breakfast. In crossing the sand I nearly plunged my foot into a hole, and fancied I heard a crash. I stooped 
and putting my hand into the opening, found it was full of eggs. I had broken two or three, which I tasted and thought very good. From the color, form, and taste, I knew them to be turtles' eggs. There were at least sixty, so I had no more care about food. I carried away in my apron as many as I could preserve from the rays of the sun. This I endeavored to effect by burying them in the sand and covering them with one end of our plank, and succeeded very well. Besides these, there were as many to be found on the shore as we required. I have sometimes found as many as ninety together. These were our sole support while we remained there. My children liked them very much. I forgot to add that I was fortunate enough to discover a stream of fresh water running into the sea. It was the same which runs past this house, and which conducted me here. The first day we suffered greatly from thirst, but on the second we met with the stream which saved us. I will not tire you by relating day by day our sad life. Every one was the same, and took away by degrees every hope from me. As long as I dared to indulge any, I could not bear to leave the shore, but at last it became insupportable to me. I was worn out with gazing continually on that boundless horizon and that moving crystal which had swallowed up my hopes. I pined for the verdure and shade of trees. Although I had contrived to make for my daughters little hats of a marine rush, they suffered much from the extreme heat, the burning rays of a tropical sun. I decided at last to abandon that sandy shore, to penetrate at all risks into the country, in order to seek a shady and cooler abode, and to escape from the view of that sea which was so painful to me. I resolved not to quit the stream which was so precious to us, for, not having any vessel to contain water, I could not carry it with us. Sophia, who was naturally quick, formed from a large leaf a sort of goblet which served us to drink from and I filled my pockets with turtle's eggs as provision for a few days. I then set off with my two children, after praying the God of all mercy to watch over us, and taking leave of the vast tomb which held my husband and my son, I never lost sight of the stream. If any obstacle obliged me to turn a little way from it, I soon recovered my path. My eldest daughter, who was very strong and robust, followed me stoutly, as I took care not to walk too far without resting, but I was often compelled to carry my little Matilda on my shoulders. Both were delighted with the shade of the woods, and were so amused with the delightful birds that inhabited them, and a pretty little sportive green monkey, that they became as playful as ever. They sang and prattled, but often asked me if Papa and Alfred were not soon returned to see these pretty creatures, and if we were going to seek them these words rent my heart, and I thought it best then to tell them that they would meet no more on earth, and that they were both gone to heaven, to that good God to whom they prayed morning and evening. Sophia was very thoughtful, and the tears ran down her cheeks. I will pray to God more than ever, said she, that he may make them happy and send them back to us. Mamma, said Matilda, have we left the sea to go to heaven? Shall we soon be there? And shall we see beautiful birds like these? We walked on very slowly, making frequent rests, till night drew on, and it was necessary to find a place for repose. I fixed on a sort of thick grove, which I could only enter by stooping. It was formed of one tree, whose branches, reaching the ground, take root there and soon produce other stems, which follow the same course, and become in time an almost impenetrable thicket. Here I found a place for us to lie down, which appeared sheltered from wild beasts or savages, whom I equally dreaded. We had still some eggs, which we ate, but I saw with fear that the time approached when we must have more food, which I knew not where to find. I saw, indeed, some fruits on the trees, but I did not know them, and feared to give them to my children who wished to have them. 
I saw also coconuts, but quite out of my reach, and even if I could have got them I did not know how to open them. The tree under whose branches we found protection was, I conjectured, an American fig tree. It bore a quantity of fruit, very small and red, and like the European fig. I ventured to taste them, and found them inferior to ours, insipid and soft, but I thought quite harmless. I remarked that the little green monkeys ate them greedily, so I had no more fear, and allowed my children to regale themselves. I was much more afraid of wild beasts during the night, however. I had seen nothing worse than some little quadrupeds resembling the rabbit or the squirrel, which came in numbers to shelter themselves during the night under our tree. The children wished to catch one, but I could not undertake to increase my charge. We had a quiet night, and were early awaked by the songs of the birds. How delighted I was to have escaped the noise of the waves, and to feel the freshness of the woods, and the perfume of the flowers, with which my children make garlands, to decorate my head and their own. These ornaments, during this time of mourning and bereavement, affected me painfully, and I was weak enough to forbid them this innocent pleasure. I tore away my garland, and threw it into the rivulet. "'Gather flowers,' said I, "'but do not dress yourselves in them. They are no fitting ornaments for us. Your father and Alfred cannot see them.' They were silent and sad, and threw their garlands into the water as I had done. We followed the stream, and passed two more nights under the trees. We had the good fortune to find more figs, but they did not satisfy us and our eggs were exhausted. In my distress I almost decided to return to the shore, where we might at least meet with that nourishment. As I sat by the stream, reflecting mournfully on our situation, the children, who had been throwing stones into the water, cried out, Look, Mama, what pretty fishes! I saw, indeed, a quantity of small salmon trout in the river, but how could I take them? I tried to seize them with my hands, but could not catch them. Necessity, however, is the mother of invention. I cut a number of branches with my knife, and wove them together to make a kind of light hurdle, the breadth of the stream, which was very narrow just here. I made two of these. My daughters assisted me, and were soon very skillful. We then undressed ourselves and took a bath, which refreshed us much. I placed one of my hurdles upright across the rivulet, and the second a little lower. The fishes who remained between attempted to pass, but the hurdles were woven too close. We watched for them attempting the other passage. Many escaped us, but we captured sufficient for our dinner. We threw them out upon the grass, at a distance from the stream, so that they could not leap back. My daughters had taken more than I, but the sensible Sophia threw back those we did not require, to give them pleasure, she said, and Matilda did the same to see them leap. We then removed our hurdles, dressed ourselves, and I began to consider how I should cook my fish, for I had no fire, and had never kindled one myself. However, I had often seen Mr. Hertel, who was a smoker, light his pipe by means of the flint and steel. They were in the precious Morocco case, together with tinder and matches. I tried to strike a light, and after some difficulty succeeded. I collected the fragments of the branches used for the hurdles. The children gathered some dry leaves, and I soon had a bright, lively fire which I was delighted to see, notwithstanding the heat of the climate. I scraped the scales from the fish with my knife, washed them in the rivulet, and then placed them on the fire to broil. This was my apprenticeship in the art of cookery. I thought how useful it would be to give young ladies some knowledge of the useful arts, for who can foresee what they may need? Our European dinner delighted us as much as the bath and the fishing which had preceded it. I decided to fix our residence at the side of the rivulet and beneath the fig trees, my only objection being the fear of missing some passing vessel which might carry us back to Europe. But can you understand my feelings when I confess to you that, although overcome by sorrow and desolation, 
having lost husband, son, and fortune, knowing that in order to support myself and bring up my children I must depend upon my friends, and to attain this having to hazard again the dangers of the sea, the very thought of which made me shudder, I should prefer to remain where Providence had brought me, and live calmly without obligation to any one. I might certainly have some difficulty in procuring the means of supporting a life which was dear to me, for the sake of my children, but even this was an employment and an amusement. My children would early learn to bear privations, to content themselves with a simple and frugal life, and to labor for their own support. I might teach them all that I knew would be useful to them in future, and above all, impress upon their young minds the great truths of our holy religion. By bringing this constantly before their unsophisticated understanding, I might hope they would draw from it the necessary virtues of resignation and contentment. I was only twenty-three years of age, and might hope by God's mercy to be spared to them some time, and in the course of years who knew what might happen. Besides, we were not so far from the sea but that I might visit it sometimes, if it were only to seek for turtle's eggs. I remained then under our fig tree at night, and by day on the borders of the stream. It was under a fig tree also, said my wife, that I have spent four happy years of my life. Unknown to each other, our fate has been similar, but henceforward I hope we shall not be separated. Madame Hertel embraced her kind friend, and observing that the evening was advanced, and that my wife, after such agitation, needed repose, we agreed to defer till next day the conclusion of the interesting narrative. My elder sons and myself followed the missionary to his hut, which resembled the king's palace, though it was smaller. It was constructed of bamboos bound together, and the intervals filled with moss and clay. It was covered in the same way, and was tolerably solid. A mat in one corner, without any covering, formed his bed, but he brought out a bear's skin, which he used in winter, and which he now spread on the ground for us. I had observed a similar one in the grotto, and he told us we should hear the history of these skins next day, in the continuation of the story of Emily, or Mimi, as she was affectionately called by all. We retired to our couch, after a prayer from Mr. Willis, and for the first time since my dear wife was taken from me, I slept in peace. We went to the grotto early in the morning, and found our two invalids much improved. My wife had slept better, and Mr. Willis found Jack's wound going on well. Madame Mimi told her daughters to prepare breakfast. They went out and soon returned, with a native woman and a boy of four or five years old, carrying newly made rush baskets filled with all sorts of fruit, figs, guavas, strawberries, coconuts, and the breadfruit. "'I must introduce you,' said Emily, "'to the rest of my family. This is Kanda, the wife of your friend Parabakwate, and this is their son, Mino Mino, whom I regard as my own. Your Elizabeth is already attached to them, and bespeaks your friendship for them. They will follow us to the happy island.' "'Oh, if you knew,' said Francis, "'what a well-behaved boy Mino is. "'He can climb trees, run, and leap. "'Though he's less than I am, "'he must be my friend.' "'And Kanda,' said Elizabeth, "'shall be our assistant and friend.' "'She gave her hand to Kanda, "'I did the same, and caressed the boy, "'who seemed delighted with me, "'and, to my great surprise, "'spoke to me in very good German. "'The mother, too, knew several words of the language.' They busied themselves with our breakfast, opened the coconuts, and poured the milk into the shells after separating the kernel. They arranged the fruits on the trunk of a tree, which served for a table, and did great credit to the town of their instructress. "'I should have liked to have offered you coffee,' said Madame Hertel, "'which grows in this island, but having no utensils for roasting, grinding, or preparing it, it has been useless to me, and I have not even gathered it.' "'Do you think, my dear, that it would grow in our island?' said my wife to me, in some anxiety. I then recollected, for the first time, how fond my wife was of coffee, 
which in Europe had always been her favorite breakfast. There would certainly be in the ship some bags, which I might have brought away, but I had never thought of it, and my unselfish wife, not seeing it, had never named it, except once wishing we had some to plant in the garden. Now that there was a probability of obtaining it, she confessed that coffee and bread were the only luxuries she regretted. I promised to try and cultivate it in our island, foreseeing, however, that it would probably not be of the best quality. I told her she must not expect mocha, but her long privation from this delicious beverage had made her less fastidious, and she assured me it would be a treat to her. After breakfast we begged Madame Hertel to resume her interesting narrative. She continued. After the reflections on my situation, which I told you of last night, I determined only to return to the seashore when our food failed us in the woods, but I acquired other means of procuring it. Encouraged by the success of my fishing, I made a sort of net from the filaments of the bark of a tree and a plant resembling hemp. With these I succeeded in catching some birds. One, resembling our thrush, was very fat and of delicious flavor. I had the greatest difficulty in overcoming my repugnance in taking away their life. Nothing but the obligation of preserving our own could have reconciled me to it. My children plucked them. I then spitted them on a slender branch and roasted them before the fire. I also found some nests of eggs, which I concluded were those of the wild ducks which frequented our stream. I made myself acquainted with all the fruits which the monkeys and parakeets eat, and which were not out of my reach. I found a sort of acorn which had the flavor of a nut. The children also discovered plenty of large strawberries, a delicious repast, and I found a quantity of honeycomb in the hollow of a tree, which I obtained by stupefying the bees with a smoking brand. I took care to mark down every day on the blank leaves of my pocket-book. I had now marked thirty days of my wandering life on the border of the river, for I never strayed beyond the sound of its waters. Still I kept continually advancing towards the interior of the island. I had yet met with nothing alarming, and the weather had been most favorable. But we were not long to enjoy this comfort. The rainy season came on, and one night, to my great distress, I heard it descend in torrents. We were no longer under our fig-tree, which would have sheltered us for a considerable time. The tree under which we now were had tempted me by having several cavities between the roots, filled with soft moss, which formed natural couches, but the foliage was very thin and we were soon drenched completely. I crept near my poor children to protect them a little, but in vain. Our little bed was soon filled with water, and we were compelled to leave it. Our clothes were so heavy with the rain that we could scarcely stand, and the night was so dark that we could see no road, and ran the risk of falling or striking against some tree if we moved. My children wept, and I trembled for their health, and for my own, which was so necessary to them. This was one of the most terrible nights of my pilgrimage. My children and I knelt down, and I prayed to our Heavenly Father for strength to bear this trial, if it was His will to continue it. I felt consolation and strength from my prayers, and rose with courage and confidence. And though the rain continued unabated, I waited with resignation the pleasure of the Almighty. I reconciled my children to our situation, and Sophia told me she had asked her father, who was near the gracious God, to entreat him to send no more rain, but let the sun come back. I assured them God would not forget them. They began to be accustomed to the rain. Only Sophia begged they might take off their clothes, and then it would be like a bath in the brook. I consented to this, thinking they would be less liable to suffer than by wearing their wet garments. The day began to break, and I determined to walk on without stopping, in order to warm ourselves by the motion, and to try to find some cave, some hollow tree, or some tree with thick foliage, to shelter us the next night. I undressed the children and made a bundle of their clothes, which I would have carried myself, but I found they would not be too heavy for them, and I judged it best to accustom them early to the difficulties, fatigue, and labor which would be their lot, 
and to attend entirely on themselves. I, therefore, divided the clothes into two unequal bundles, proportioned to their strength, and having made a knot in each, I passed a slender branch through it, and showed them how to carry it on their shoulders. When I saw them walking before me in this savage fashion, with their little white bodies exposed to the storm, I could not refrain from tears. I blamed myself for condemning them to such an existence, and thought of returning to the shore, where some vessel might rescue us. But we were now too far off to set about it. I continued to proceed with much more difficulty than my children, who had nothing on but their shoes and large hats. I carried the valuable box, in which I had placed the remains of our last night's supper, an act of necessary prudence, as there was neither fishing nor hunting now. As the day advanced, the rain diminished, and even the sun appeared above the horizon. "'Look, my darlings,' said I, "'God has heard us, and sent his son to warm and cheer us. Let us thank him.' "'Papa has begged it of him,' said Matilda. "'Oh, Mama, let us pray him to send Alfred back.' My poor little girl bitterly regretted the loss of her brother. Even now she can scarcely hear his name without tears. When the savages brought Francis to us, she at first took him for her brother. "'Oh, how you've grown in heaven!' cried she, and after she discovered he was not her brother, she often said to him, "'How I wish your name was Alfred!' Forgive me for dwelling so long on the details of my wretched journey, which was not without its comforts, in the pleasure I took in the development of my children's minds, and in forming plans for their future education. Though anything relating to science, or the usual accomplishments, would be useless to them, I did not wish to bring them up like young savages. I hoped to be able to communicate much useful knowledge to them and to give them juster ideas of this world and that to come. As soon as the sun had dried them, I made them put on their dresses, and we continued our walk by the brook, till we arrived at the grove which is before this rock. I removed the branches to pass through it, and saw beyond them the entrance to this grotto. It was very low and narrow, but I could not help uttering a cry of joy for this was the only sort of retreat that could securely shelter us. I was going to enter it without thought, not reflecting there might be in it some ferocious animal, when I was arrested by a plaintive cry, more like that of a child than a wild beast. I advanced with more caution, and tried to find out what sort of an inhabitant the cave contained. It was indeed a human being, an infant, whose age I could not discover, but it seemed too young to walk, and was, besides, tied up in leaves and moss, enclosed in a piece of bark, which was much torn and rent. The poor infant uttered the most piteous cries, and I did not hesitate a moment to enter the cave, and to take the innocent little creature in my arms. It seized its cries as soon as it felt the warmth of my cheek. But it was evidently in want of food, and I had nothing to give it but some figs, of which I pressed the juice into its mouth. This seemed to satisfy it, and, rocking it in my arms, it soon went to sleep. I had then time to examine it, and to look round the cave. From the size and form of the face, I concluded it might be older than I first thought, and I recollected to have read that the savages carried their children swaddled up in this way, even till they could walk. The complexion of the child was a pale olive, which I have since discovered is the natural complexion of the natives, before the exposure to the heat of the sun gives them the bronze hue you have seen. The features were good, except that the lips were thicker and the mouth larger than those of the Europeans. My two girls were charmed with it and caressed it with great joy. I left them to rock it gently in its cradle of bark till I went round this cave, which I intended for my palace, and which I have never quitted. You see it, the form is not changed, but since heaven has sent me a friend, looking at the missionary, it is adorned with furniture and utensils which have completed my comforts. But to return, 
the grotto was spacious and irregular in form. In a hollow I found, with surprise, a sort of bed carefully arranged with moss, dry leaves, and small twigs. I was alarmed. Was this grotto inhabited by men, or by wild beasts? In either case, it was dangerous to remain here. I encouraged a hope, however, that, from the infant being here, the mother must be the inhabitant, and that on her return, finding me nursing her child, she might be induced to share her asylum with us. I could not, however, reconcile this hope with the circumstance of the child being abandoned in this open cave. As I was considering whether I ought to remain or leave the cave, I heard strange cries at a distance, mingled with the screams of my children, who came running to me for protection, bringing with them the young savage, who fortunately was only half awaked, and soon went to sleep again, sucking a fig. I laid him gently on the bed of leaves, and told my daughters to remain near him in a dark corner. Then, stepping cautiously, I ventured to look out to discover what was passing, without being seen. The noise approached nearer to my great alarm, and I could perceive, through the trees, a crowd of men armed with long pointed lances, clubs, and stones. They appeared furious and the idea that they might enter the cave froze me with terror. I had an idea of taking the little native babe and holding it in my arms as my best shield, but this time my fears were groundless. The whole troop passed outside the wood, without even looking on the same side as the grotto. They appeared to follow some traces they were looking out for on the ground. I heard their shouts for some time, but they died away and I recovered from my fears. Still, the dread of meeting them overcame even hunger. I had nothing left in my box but some figs, which I kept for the infant, who was satisfied with them, and I told my daughters we must go to bed without supper. The sleeping infant amused them so much that they readily consented to give up the figs. He awoke smiling, and they gave him the figs to suck. In the meantime, I prepared to release him from his bondage to make him more comfortable, and I then saw that the outer covering of bark was torn by the teeth of some animal, and even the skin of the child slightly grazed. I ventured to carry him to the brook, into which I plunged him two or three times, which seemed to give him great pleasure. I ran back to the cave, which is, you see, not more than twenty yards distant and found Sophia and Matilda very much delighted at a treasure they had found under the dry leaves in a corner. This was a great quantity of fruits of various kinds, roots of some unknown plant, and a good supply of beautiful honey, on which the little gluttons were already feasting. They came directly to give some on their fingers to their little doll, as they called the babe. This discovery made me very thoughtful. Was it possible that we were in a bear's den? I had read that they sometimes carried off infants, and that they were very fond of fruits and of honey, of which they generally had a hoard. I remarked on the earth, and especially at the entrance where the rain had made it soft, the impression of large paws, which left me no doubt. The animal would certainly return to his den, and we were in the greatest danger. But where could we go? The sky, dark with clouds, threatened a return of the storm, and the troop of savages might still be wandering about the island. I had not courage, just as night set in, to depart with my children, nor could I leave the poor infant, who was now sleeping peacefully after his honey and figs. His two nurses soon followed his example, but for me there was no rest. The noise of the wind among the trees and of the rain pattering on the leaves, the murmur of the brook, the light bounds of the kangaroo, all made my heart beat with fear and terror. I fancied it was the bear returning to devour us. I had cut and broken some branches to place before the entrance, but these were but a weak defence against a furious and probably famished animal, and if he even did no other harm to my children, I was sure their terror at the sight of him would kill them. 
I paced backwards and forwards, from the entrance to the bed, in the darkness, envying the dear sleepers their calm and fearless rest. The dark-skinned baby slept soundly, nestled warmly between my daughters, till day broke at last, without anything terrible occurring. Then my little people awoke and cried out with hunger. We ate of the fruits and honey brought us by our unknown friend, feeding also our little charge, to whom my daughters gave the pet name of Mino, which he still keeps. I busied myself with his toilette. There was no need to go to the brook for a bath, for the rain came down incessantly. I then folded Matilda's apron round him, which pleased her greatly. The rain ceased for a while, and they set off for flowers to amuse him. They were scarcely gone when I heard the cries of the savages again, but this time they seemed rather shouts of joy and triumph. They sung and chanted a sort of chorus, but were still at such distance that I had time to recall my daughters and withdraw them out of sight. I took Mino with me as the mediator, and placed myself in an angle of the rock where I could see without being seen. They passed, as before, beyond the wood, armed, and two of them bore at the end of their lances something very large and dark, which I could not distinguish, but thought might be some wild beast they had destroyed. Afterwards I flattered myself it might be the bear, whose return I so greatly dreaded. Following the train was a woman, naked, with her hair hanging down, uttering loud cries, and tearing her face and breast. No one attempted to soothe her, but occasionally one of the bearers of the black mass pointed it out to her. She then became furious, threw herself on it, and tried to tear it with her teeth and nails. I was quite overcome with horror and pity. That woman, my friends, was Kanda, whom you have just seen. Kanda, usually so mild and gentle, was rendered frantic by the loss of her child, her firstborn, whom she believed was devoured by the bear. Parabakwate, her husband, tried to console her, but was himself in great sorrow. These bears, as I have since learnt, for there were two of them, had come from a mountain, at the foot of which was Parabakwate's hut. They had only this son, and Kanda, according to the custom of the country, tying it in a piece of bark, carried it on her back. One morning, after having bathed him in the stream, which has its source near their abode, she placed him on the turf a few moments, while she was employed in some household duties. She soon heard his cries, mingled with a sort of growl. She ran to the spot and saw a frightful beast holding her child in its mouth and running off with it. It was then more than twenty yards off. Her cries brought her husband. She pointed to the horrible animal and darted after it, determined to save her child or perish. Her husband only stopped to seize his javelin and followed her, but did not overtake her till fatigue and the heat of the day made her fall almost senseless to the ground. Stopping for a moment to raise and encourage her, he lost sight of the bear and could not recover the track. All the night, that dreadful night of rain, when I was weeping and murmuring, thinking myself the most unfortunate of women, was Kanda exposed without clothes to that frightful storm, hopelessly seeking her only child, and not even feeling that it did rain. Parabakwate, not less afflicted, but more composed, went to relate his misfortune to his neighbors, who, arming themselves, set out with Parabakwate at their head, following the track of the animal over the wet ground. They discovered it next morning with another bear, so busy devouring a swarm of bees and their honey, that the savages were able to draw near them. Parabakwate pierced one with his spear, and dispatched him with a blow of his club. One of his comrades killed the other, and Parabakwate tasted the truly savage joy of vengeance. But the poor mother could not be so comforted. After wandering through the rain all night, she reached the party as they were skinning the bear and dividing the flesh. Parabakwate only asked and obtained the skins to recompense him for the loss of his son. They returned home in triumph, Kanda following them with bitter cries, 
tearing her face with a shark's tooth. From observation of these circumstances, I concluded that Kanda must be the mother of my little child that I'd found. My heart sympathized with her, and I even made some steps forward to restore him. But the sight of the savage crowd, with their tattooed bodies, filled me with such terror that I retreated involuntarily to the grotto, where my children, alarmed by the noise, were hiding themselves. "'Why do the people cry out so?' said Sophia. "'They frighten me. Don't let them come here, Mama, or they may carry Mino away.' "'Certainly,' said I, "'and I should have no right to forbid them. I think they are his friends, who are distressed at losing him. I wish I could restore him to them.' "'Oh, no, Mama," said Matilda. "'Pray don't give him back. We like him so much, and we will be his little mamas. He will be far happier with us than with those ugly savages, who tied him up like a parcel in the bark, with the moss which pricked him so much. He's much more comfortable in my apron. How he moves his legs as if he wanted to walk! Sophia and I will teach him. Do let us keep him, Mimi." Even if I had decided— it was now too late. The savages had passed on to some distance. I, however, explained to Matilda the beauty of the divine precept, Do unto others, as you would, they should do unto you. Asking her how she would have liked to be detained by the savages, and what then would be the suffering of her own mamma? She was thoughtful for a moment, and then embracing Minu and me. You're right, mamma Mimi. But if she loves her baby, let her come and seek him," said the little rebel. In the meantime, Sophia had been out and returned with some brilliant flowers, fresh after the rain, with which they make garlands to dress up the infant. "'Oh, if his mamma saw him, she would be glad to let us have him,' said Matilda. She then explained to her sister who this mamma was, and Sophia shed tears to think of the sorrow of the poor mother. "'But how do you know, Mama, that she was Minu's mother?' demanded she. This question proved that her judgment was forming, and I took the opportunity of teaching her what information one may derive from observation. She understood me very well, and when I told her on what I had founded my idea, she trembled to think he had been brought here by a bear, and asked me if the bear would have eaten him. "'I cannot answer for it,' said I if it had been pressed by hunger. They tell us that the bear does no harm to man unless attacked, and is especially fond of children. But, notwithstanding this, I should not like to trust it. At all events, the poor babe would have died if we had not found him. "'Poor babe, he shall not die of hunger now,' said she. "'Let us give him some figs. But these are not good. We must go and seek some more.' The rain having ceased, I consented, passing through the grove where there were no fig-trees, to search farther. My daughters had fed the child with honey and water. It appeared quite reconciled to us, and had ceased to cry. I judged it might be about eight months old. We soon found some trees covered with the violet-colored figs. Whilst I gathered them, the girls made a pretty bed of moss, adorned with flowers for the little favorite, and fed him with the fresh fruit which he enjoyed much, and with their fair hair and rosy faces, and the little negro between them, with his arch, dark countenance, they formed a charming picture, which affected me greatly. We had been more than an hour under the tree, when I heard cries again, but this time I was not alarmed, for I distinguished the voice of the disconsolate mother, and I knew that I could comfort her. Her grief brought her back to the spot where she thought her child had been devoured. She wished, as she afterwards told us, when we could understand her, to search for some remains of him, his hair, his bones, or even a piece of the bark that bound him. And here he was, full of life and health. She advanced slowly, sobbing, and her eyes turned to the ground. She was so absorbed in her search that she did not see us when we were but twenty yards from her. Suddenly Sophia darted like an arrow to her, took her hand, and said, "'Come, Mino is here!' Kanda neither knew what she saw nor what she heard. She took my daughter for something supernatural, 
and made no resistance, but followed her to the fig-tree. Even then she did not recognize the little creature, released from his bonds, half-clothed, covered with flowers, and surrounded by three divinities, for she took us for such, and wished to prostrate herself before us. She was still more convinced of it when I took up her son, and placed him in her arms. She recognized him, and the poor little infant held out his arms to her. I can never express to you the transport of the mother. She screamed, clasped her child till he was half suffocated, rapidly repeating words which we could not understand, wept, laughed, and was in a delirium of delight that terrified Minu. He began to cry, and held out his arms to Sophia, who, as well as Matilda, was weeping at the sight. Kanda looked at them with astonishment. She soothed the child, and put him to her breast, which he rejected at first, but finally seized it, and his mother was happy. I took the opportunity to try and make her comprehend that the great animal had brought him here, that we had found him and taken care of him, and I made signs for her to follow me, which she did without hesitation, till we reached the grotto when, without entering, she fled away with her infant with such rapidity that it was impossible to overtake her, and was soon out of sight. I had some difficulty in consoling my daughters for the loss of Minu. They thought they should see him no more, and that his mother was very ungrateful to carry him off, without even letting them take leave of him. They were still weeping and complaining, when we saw the objects of our anxiety approaching. But Kanda was now accompanied by a man, who was carrying the child. They entered the grotto, and prostrated themselves before us. You know Parabakwate, his countenance pleased and tranquilized us. As a relation of the king, he was distinguished by wearing a short tunic of leaves. His body was tattooed and stained with various colors, but not his face, which expressed kindness and gratitude, united with great intelligence. He comprehended most of my signs. I did not succeed so well in understanding him, but saw he meant kindly. In the meantime, my daughters had a more intelligible conversation with Kanda and Minu. They half devoured the latter with caresses, fed him with figs and honey, and amused him so much that he would scarcely leave them. Kanda was not jealous of this preference, but seemed delighted with it. She, in her turn, caressed my daughters, admired their glossy hair and fair skin, and pointed them out to her husband. She repeated, Minu after them, but always added another Minu, and appeared to think this name beautiful. After some words with Parabakwate, she placed Minu Minu in Sophia's arms, and they both departed, making signs that they would return. But we did not see them for some time after. Sophia and Matilda had their full enjoyment of their favorite. They wished to teach him to walk and to speak, and they assured me he was making great progress. They were beginning to hope his parents had left him entirely. When they came in sight, Parabakwate bending under the weight of two bear skins and a beautiful piece of matting to close the entrance to my grotto. Kanda carried a basket on her head filled with fine fruit, the cocoa, the breadfruit, which they call rima, pineapples, figs, and finally a piece of bear's flesh roasted at the fire, which I did not like but I enjoyed the fruits and the milk of the coconut, of which Minu Minu had a good share. They spread the bear skins in the midst of the grotto. Parabakwate, Kanda, and the infant between them took possession of one without ceremony, and motioned to us to make our bed of the other. But the bears having only been killed the evening before, these skins had an intolerable smell. I made them comprehend this, and Parabakwate immediately carried them off, and placed them in the brook, secured by stones. He brought us in exchange a heap of moss and leaves, on which we slept very well. From this moment we became one family. Kanda remained with us, and repaid to my daughters all the care and affection they bestowed on Minu Minu. There never was a child had more indulgence, but he deserved it for his quickness and docility. At the end of a few months, 
he began to lisp a few words of German, as well as his mother, of whom I was the teacher, and who made rapid progress. Parabakwate was very little with us, but he undertook to be our purveyor, and furnished us abundantly with everything necessary for our subsistence. Kanda taught my daughter to make beautiful baskets. Some, of a flat form, served for our plates and dishes. Parabakwate made us knives from sharp stones. My daughters, in return, taught Kanda to sew. At the time of our shipwreck we had, each of us, in her pocket, a Morocco housewife with a store of needles and thread. By means of these we had mended our linen, and we now made dresses of palm leaves. The bearskins, washed in the stream and thoroughly dried in the burning sun, have been very useful to us in the cold and rainy season. Now that we had guides, we made, in the fine season, excursions to different parts of the island. Minu Minu soon learned to walk, and, being strong, like all these islanders, would always accompany us. We went one day to the seashore. I shuddered at the sight, and Kanda, who knew that my husband and child had perished in the sea, wept with me. We now spoke each other's language well enough to converse. She told me that a black friend, Emily bowed to Mr. Willis, had arrived in a neighboring island to announce to them that there was a being, almighty and all-merciful, who lived in heaven and heard all they said. Her comprehension of this truth was very confused, and I endeavored to make it more clear and positive. I see very well, said she, that you know him. Is it to him that you speak every morning and evening, kneeling as we do before our king Barauru? Yes, Kanda, said I. It is before him who is the king of kings, who gave us our life, who preserves it, and bestows on us all good, and who promises us still more when this life is past. Was it he who charged you to take care of Minu Minu? and to restore him to me?" asked she. Yes, Kanda. All that you or I do that is good is put into our hearts by him. I thus tried to prepare the simple mind of Kanda for the great truths that Mr. Willis was to teach her. You left me little to do, said Mr. Willis. I found Parabakwate and Kanda prepared to believe, with sincere faith, the holy religion I came to teach. The god of the white people was the only one they adored. I knew Parabakwate. He had come to hunt seals in the island where I was established, and I was struck by his appearance. What was my astonishment to find that when I spoke to him of the one true god, he was no stranger to the subject. He had even some ideas of a savior, and of future rewards and punishments. It was the white lady, said he, who taught me this. She teaches Kanda and Minu Minu, whose life she saved, and whom she is bringing up to be good like herself. I had a great desire, continued Mr. Willis, to become acquainted with my powerful assistant in the great work of my mission. I told Parakwate this, who offered to bring me here in his canoe. I came and found, in a miserable cave, or rather in a bear's den, all the virtues of mature age united to the charms of youth a resigned and pious mother, bringing up her children, as women should be brought up, in simplicity, forbearance, and love of industry, teaching them as the best knowledge to love God with all their heart, and their neighbor as themselves. Under the inspection of their mother they were educating the son of Parabakwate. This child, then four years and a half old, spoke German well, and knew his alphabet, which Madame Hertel traced on the floor of the grotto. In this way she taught her daughters to read. They taught Minu Minu, who in his turn teaches his parents. Parabakwate often brings his friends to the grotto, and Madame Hertel, having acquired the language, casts into their hearts the good seed, which I venture to hope will not be unfruitful. Finding these people in such a good state, and wishing to enjoy the society of a family, like myself, banished to a remote region, I decided to take up my abode in this island. Parabakwate soon built me a hut in the neighborhood of the grotto. 
Madame Hertel compelled me to take one of her bearskins. I have by degrees formed my establishment, dividing with my worthy neighbor the few useful articles I brought from Europe, and we live a tranquil and happy life. And now comes the time that brought about our meeting. Some of our islanders, in a fishing expedition, were driven by the wind on your island. At the entrance of a large bay they found a small canoe of bark, carefully moored to a tree. Either their innate propensity for theft, or the notion that it had no owner, prevailed over them, and they brought it away. I was informed of this, and was curious to see it. I recognized at once that it was made by Europeans. The careful finish, the neat form, the oars, rudder, mast, and triangular sail, all showed that it had not been made by savages. The seats of the rowers were made of planks, and were painted, and what further convinced me was that I found in it a capital gun, loaded, and a horn of powder in a hole under one of the seats. I then made particular inquiries about the island from whence they had brought the canoe, and all their answers confirmed my idea that it must be inhabited by a European from whom they had perhaps taken his only means of leaving it. Restless about this fancy, I tried to persuade them to return and discover if the island was inhabited. I could not prevail on them to restore the canoe, but, seeing me much agitated, they resolved secretly to procure me a great pleasure, as they thought, by returning to the island and bringing away any one they could meet with, whether he would or not. Parabaquite, always the leader in perilous enterprises, and who was so attached to me, would not be left out in one which was to produce me such pleasure. They set out, and you know the rest of their expedition. I leave it to your wife to tell you how she was brought away, and pass on to the time of their arrival. My people brought them to me in triumph, and were vexed that they had only found one woman and a child, whom I might give to the white lady. This I did promptly. Your wife was ill and distressed, and I carried her immediately to the grotto. There she found a companion who welcomed her with joy. Francis replaced her own lost Alfred, and the two good mothers were soon intimate friends. But, notwithstanding this solace, your Elizabeth was inconsolable at the separation from her husband and children and terrified at the danger to which you would expose yourself in searching for her. We were even afraid she would lose her reason when the king came to take away Francis. He had seen him on his arrival, and was much taken with his appearance. He came again to see him, and resolved to adopt him as his son. You know what passed on this subject, and now you are once more united to all those who are dear to you. Bless God, brother! who knows how to produce good from what we think evil, and acknowledge the wisdom of his ways. You must return altogether to your island. I am too much interested in the happiness of Emily to wish to detain her, and if God permits me, when my missions are completed, I will come to end my days with you, and to bless your rising colony. I suppress all our reflections on this interesting history, and our gratitude for the termination of our trials, and hastened to the recital which at my particular entreaty my wife proceeded to give us. My story, she began, will not be long. I might make it in two words. You have lost me, and you have found me. I have every reason to thank heaven for a circumstance which has proved to me how dear I am to you, and has given me the happiness of gaining a friend and two dear daughters. Can one complain of an event which has produced such consequences, even though it was attended with some violence? But I ought to do the savages justice. This violence was as gentle as it could be. I need only tell you Parabaquite was there to convince you I was well treated, and it was solely the sorrow of being parted from you that affected my health. I shall be well now, and as soon as Jack can walk, I shall be ready to embark for our happy island. I will now tell you how I was brought away. When you and our three sons left, to make the tour of the island, I was very comfortable, and you had told me you might return late, 
or probably not till next day, and when the evening passed away without seeing you, I was not uneasy. Francis was constantly with me. We went together to water the garden, and rested in the Grano Ernestine. Then I returned to the house, took my wheel, and placed myself in my favourite colonnade, where I should be the first to see your return. Francis, seeing me at work, asked if he might go as far as the bridge to meet you, to which I readily consented. He set out, and I was thinking, thinking of the pleasure I should have in seeing you again, and hearing you relate your voyage, when I saw Francis running, crying out, Mama, Mama, there is a canoe on the sea. I know it is ours. It is full of men, perhaps savages. Silly little fellow, said I, it is your father and brothers. If they are in the canoe, there can be no doubt of it. Your father told me he would bring it, and they would return by water. I had forgotten this when I let you go. Now you can go and meet them on the shore. Give me your arm, and I will go too. And we set off very joyfully to greet our captors. I soon, alas, saw my error. It was indeed our canoe. But instead of my dear ones, there were in it six half-naked savages, with terrible countenances, who landed and surrounded us. My blood froze with fright, and if I had wished to flee I was unable. I fell on the shore nearly insensible. Still, I heard the cries of my dear Francis, who clung to me, and held me with all his strength. At last my senses quite failed me, and I only recovered to find myself lying at the bottom of the canoe. My son, weeping over me, was trying to recover me, assisted by one of the savages, of less repulsive appearance than his companions, and who seemed the chief. This was Parabaquite. He made me swallow a few drops of a detestable fermented liquor, which, however, restored me. I felt, as I recovered, the extent of my disaster, and your grief, my dears, when you should find me missing. I should have been wholly disconsolate, but that Francis was left to me, and he was continually praying me to live for his sake. I received some comfort from a vague notion that, as this was our canoe, the savages had already carried you off, and were taking us to you. I was confirmed in this hope when I saw that the savages, instead of making to sea, continued to coast the island till they came to the great bay. I had then no doubt but that we should meet with you, but this hope was soon destroyed. Two or three more of the savages were waiting there on the shore. They spoke to their friends in the canoe, and I understood from their gestures that they were saying they could not find anybody there. I have since learnt from Kanda that part of them landed at the Great Bay, with instructions to search that side of the island for inhabitants whilst the rest proceeded with the canoe to examine the other side, and had succeeded but too well. The night came on, and they were anxious to return, which, doubtless, prevented them pillaging our house. I believe, moreover, that none of them could have reached Tent House, defended by our strong palisade, and hidden by the rocks among which it is built, and the other party, finding us on the shore, would not penetrate further. When all had entered the canoe, they pushed off, by the light of the stars, into the open sea. I think I must have sunk under my sorrow, but for Francis, and I must confess it, my dear dog Flora, who had never left me. Francis told me that she had tried to defend me, and flew at the savages, but one of them took my apron, tore it, and tied it over her mouth like a muzzle, bound her legs, and then threw her into the canoe where the poor creature lay at my feet, moaning piteously. She arrived with us in this island, but I have not seen her since. I have often inquired of Parabaquite, but he could not tell me what had become of her. "'But I know,' said Fritz, "'and have seen her. We brought Turk with us, and the savages had carried Flora to that desert part of the island, from whence Jack was carried off, so the two dogs met.' When I had the misfortune to wound Jack, I quite forgot them. They were rambling off in chase of kangaroos. We left them, and no doubt they are still there. 
but we must not abandon the poor beasts. If my father will permit me, I will go and seek them in Parabaquite's canoe. As we were obliged to wait a few days for Jack's recovery, I consented on condition that Parabaquite accompanied them, and the next day was fixed for the expedition. Ernest begged to be of the party, that he might see the beautiful trees and flowers they had described. I then requested the narration might be continued, which had been interrupted by this episode of the two dogs. Francis resumed it where his mother had left off. We had a favourable passage. The sea was calm, and the boat went so smoothly that both Mama and I went to sleep. You must have come a much longer way round than necessary, Papa, as your voyage lasted three days, and we arrived here the day after our departure. Mama was then awake and wept constantly, believing she should never more see you or my brothers. Parabaquite seemed very sorry for her and tried to console her. At last he addressed to her two or three words of German, pointing to heaven. His words were very plain. Almighty God, good, and then black friend, and white lady, adding the words kanda, bear, and minu minu. We did not understand what he meant, but he seemed so pleased at speaking these words that we could not but be pleased too, and to hear him name God in German gave us confidence, though we could not comprehend where or how he had learnt the words. Perhaps, said Mamma, he has seen your papa and brothers. I thought so, too. Still it appeared strange that in so short a time he could acquire and remember these words. However it might be, Mamma was delighted to have him near her, and taught him to pronounce the words father, mother, and son, which did not seem strange to him, and he soon knew them. She pointed to me and to herself, as she pronounced the words, and he readily comprehended them, and said to us, with bursts of laughter, showing its large ivory teeth, Kanda, mother, Minu Minu, son, Parabaquite, father, white lady, mother. Mama thought he referred to her, but it was to Madame Emily. He tried to pronounce this name and two others, but could not succeed. At last he said, Girls, girls, and almost convinced us he must know some Europeans, which was a great comfort to us. When I saw Mama more composed, I took out my flagellette to amuse her, and played the air to earnest verses. This made her weep again very much, and she begged me to desist. The savages, however, wished me to continue, and I did not know whom to obey. I changed the air, playing the merriest I knew. They were in ecstasies. They took me in their arms one after the other, saying, Bara Uru! Bara Uru! I repeated the word after them, and they were still more delighted. But Mama was so uneasy to see me in their arms that I broke from them and returned to her. At last we landed. They carried Mama, who was too weak to walk. About a hundred yards from the shore we saw a large building of wood and reeds, before which was a crowd of savages. One who was very tall came to receive us. He was dressed in a short tunic, much ornamented, and wore a necklace of pierced shells. He was a little disfigured by a white bone passed through his nostrils. But you saw him, Papa, when he wanted to adopt me. It was Bara Uru, the king of the island. I was presented to him, and he was pleased with me, touched the end of my nose with his, and admired my hair very much. My conductors ordered me to play on the flagellette. I played some lively German airs, which made them dance and leap, till the king fell down with fatigue, and made a sign for me to desist. He then spoke for some time to the savages, who stood in a circle round him. He looked at Mama, who was seated in a corner near her protector Parabaquite. He called the latter, who obliged Mama to rise, and presented her to the king. Bara Uru looked only at the red and yellow India handkerchief which she wore on her head. He took it off, very unceremoniously, and put it on his own head, saying, Miti, which means beautiful. He then made us re-embark in the canoe with him, 
amusing himself with me and my flagellet, which he attempted to play by blowing it through his nose, but did not succeed. After turning round a point which seemed to divide the island into two, we landed on a sandy beach. Parabaquite and another savage proceeded into the interior, carrying my mother, and we followed. We arrived at a hut similar to the king's, but not so large. There we were received by Mr. Willis, whom we judged to be the black friend, and from that time we had no more fears. He took us under his protection, first speaking to the king and to Parabaquite in their own language. He then addressed Mama in German, mixed with a few English words, which we understood very well. He knew nothing of you and my brothers, but, from what Mama told him, he promised to have you sought for and brought as soon as possible to the island. In the meantime, he offered to lead us to a friend who would take care of us and nurse poor Mama, who looked very ill. She was obliged to be carried to the grotto, but after that her cares were over and her pleasure without alloy, for the black friend had promised to seek you. The white lady received us like old friends, and Sophia and Matilda took me at first for their own brother, and still love me as if I was. We only wish for you all. Madame Mimi made Mama lie down on the bearskin, and prepared her a pleasant beverage from the milk of the coconut. Sophia and Matilda took me to gather strawberries and figs and beautiful flowers, and we caught fish in the brook between two osier hurdles. We amused ourselves very well with Minu Minu, while Kanda and Madame Emily amused Mama. The king came the next day to see his little favorite. He wished me to go with him to another part of the island, where he often went to hunt. But I would not leave Mama and my new friends. I was wrong, Papa, for you were there, and my brothers. It was there Jack was wounded and brought away. I might have prevented all that and you would then have returned to us. How sorry I have been for my obstinacy! It was I, more than Fritz, who was the cause of his being wounded. Bara Uru returned in the evening to the grotto, and think, Papa, of our surprise, our delight, and our distress, when he brought us poor Jack, wounded and in great pain, but still all joy at finding us again. The king told Mr. Willis he was sure Jack was my brother, and he made us a present of him, adding that he gave him in exchange for Mama's handkerchief. Mama thanked him earnestly, and placed Jack beside her. From him she learned all you had done to discover us. He informed Mr. Willis where he had left you, and he promised to seek and bring you to us. He then examined the wound which Jack wished him to think he had himself caused with Fritz's gun, but this was not probable, as the ball had entered behind and lodged in the shoulder. Mr. Willis extracted it with some difficulty, and poor Jack suffered a good deal. But all is now going on well. What a large party we shall be, Papa, when we are all settled in our island! Sophia and Matilda, Minu Minu, Kanda, Parabaquite, you, Papa, and two mamas, and Mr. Willis. My wife smiled as the little orator concluded. Mr. Willis then dressed Jack's wound, and thought he might be removed in five or six days. Now, my dear Jack, said I, it is your turn to relate your history. Your brother left off where you were entertaining the savages with your buffooneries, and certainly they were never better introduced. But how did they suddenly think of carrying you away? Parabakwate told me, said Jack, that they were struck with my resemblance to Francis as soon as I took my flagellet. After I played a minute or two, the savage who wore Mama's handkerchief, whom I now know to be the king, interrupted me by crying out and clapping his hands. He spoke earnestly to the others, pointing to my face and to my flagellet, which he had taken. He looked also at my jacket of blue cotton, which one of them had tied round his shoulders like a mantle, and doubtless he then gave orders for me to be carried to the canoe. They seized upon me. I screamed like a madman, kicked them and scratched them, but what could I do against seven or eight great savages? 
They tied my legs together, and my hands behind me, and carried me like a parcel. I could then do nothing but cry out for Fritz, and the night of the gun came rather too soon. In attempting to defend me, some way or another, off went his gun, and the ball took up its abode at my shoulder. I can assure you an unpleasant visitor is that same ball, but here he is, the scoundrel. Father Willis pulled him out by the same door as that by which he went in, and since his departure all goes on well. Now for my story. When poor Fritz saw that I was wounded, he fell down as if he had been shot at the same time. The savages, thinking he was dead, took away his gun and carried me into the canoe. I was in despair more for the death of my brother than from my wound, which I almost forgot, and was wishing they would throw me into the sea, when I saw Fritz running at full speed to the shore. But we pushed off, and I could only call out some words of consolation. The savages were very kind to me, and one of them held me up seated on the outrigger. They washed my wound with sea water, sucked it, tore my pocket handkerchief to make a bandage, and as soon as we landed, squeezed the juice of some herb into it. We sailed very quickly, and passed the place where we had landed in the morning. I knew it again, and could see Ernest standing on a sandbank. He was watching us, and I held out my arms to him. I thought I also saw you, Papa, and heard you call. But the savages yelled, and though I cried with all my strength, it was in vain. I little thought they were taking me to Mama. As soon as we had disembarked, they brought me to this grotto, and I thought I must have died of surprise and joy when I was met by Mama and Francis, and then by Sophia, Matilda, Mama Emily, and Mr. Willis, who was a second father to me. This is the end of my story, and a very pretty end it is that brings us all together. What matters it to have had a little vexation for all this pleasure? I owe it all to you, Fritz. If you had let me sink to the bottom of the sea, instead of dragging me out by the hair, I should not have been here so happy as I am. I am obliged to the gun, too. Thanks to it, I was the first to reach Mama and see our new friends. The next day, Fritz and Ernest set out on their expedition with Parabaquite in his canoe, to seek our two valued dogs. The good islander carried his canoe on his back to the shore. I saw them set off, but not without some dread, in such a frail bark, into which the water leaked through every seam. But my boys could swim well, and the kind, skillful, and bold Parabaquite undertook to answer for their safety. I therefore recommended them to God, and returned to the grotto, to tranquilize my wife's fears. Jack was inconsolable that he could not form one of the party, but Sophia scolded him for wishing to leave them to go upon the sea which had swallowed up poor Alfred. In the evening we had the pleasure of seeing our brave dogs enter the grotto. They leaped on us in a way that terrified the poor little girls at first, who took them for bears, but they were soon reconciled to them when they saw them fawn round us, lick our hands, and pass from one to the other to be caressed. My sons had had no difficulty in finding them. They had run to them at the first call, and seemed delighted to see their masters again. The poor animals had subsisted on the remains of the kangaroos, but apparently had met with no fresh water, for they seemed dying with thirst, and rushed to the brook as soon as they discovered it, and returned again and again. Then they followed us to the hut of the good missionary, who had been engaged all day in visiting the dwellings of the natives and teaching them the truths of religion. I had accompanied him, but from ignorance of the language could not aid him. I was, however, delighted with the simple and earnest manner in which he spoke, and the eagerness with which they heard him. He finished by a prayer, kneeling, and they all imitated him, lifting up their hands and eyes to heaven. He told me, he was trying to make them celebrate the Sunday. He assembled them in his tent, which he wished to make a temple for the worship of the true God. He intended to consecrate it for this purpose, and to live in the grotto after our departure. The day arrived at last. Jack's shoulder was nearly healed, 
and my wife, along with her happiness, recovered her strength. The pinnace had been so well guarded by Parabaquite and his friends that it suffered no injury. I distributed among the islanders everything I had that could please them, and made Parabaquite invite them to come and see us in our island, requesting we might live on friendly terms. Mr. Willis wished much to see it, and to complete our happiness he promised to accompany and spend some days with us, and Parabaquite said he would take him back when he wished it. We embarked then, after taking leave of Barauru, who was very liberal in his presence, giving us, besides fruits of every kind, a whole hog roasted, which was excellent. We were fourteen in number, sixteen reckoning the two dogs. The missionary accompanied us, and a young islander, whom Parabaquite had procured to be his servant, as he was too old and too much occupied with his mission to attend to his own wants. This youth was of a good disposition and much attached to him. Parabaquite took him to assist in rowing when he returned. Emily could not but feel rather affected at leaving the grotto, where she had passed four tranquil, if not happy, years, fulfilling the duties of a mother. Neither could she avoid a painful sensation when she once more saw the sea that had been so fatal to her husband and son. She could scarcely subdue the fear she had of trusting all she had left to that treacherous element. She held her daughters in her arms, and prayed for the protection of heaven. Mr. Willis and I spoke to her of the goodness of God, and pointed out to her the calmness of the water, the security of the pinnace, and the favorable state of the wind. My wife described to her our establishment, and promised her a far more beautiful grotto than the one she had left, and at last she became more reconciled. After seven or eight hours' voyage, we arrived at Cape Disappointment, and we agreed the bay should henceforth be called the Bay of the Happy Return. The distance to Tent House from hence was much too great for the ladies and children to go on foot. My intention was to take them by water to the other end of the island near our house, but my elder sons had begged to be landed at the bay to seek their livestock and take them home. I left them there with Parabaquite. Jack recommended his buffalo to them, and Francis his bull, and all were found. We coasted the island, arrived at Safety Bay, and were soon at Tent House, where we found all, as we had left it, in good condition. Notwithstanding the description my wife had given them, our new guests found our establishment far, far beyond their expectation. With what delight Jack and Francis ran up and down the colonnade with their young friends! What stories they had to tell of all the surprises they had prepared for their mother! They showed them Fritzia, Jackia, the Franciade, and gave their friends water from their beautiful fountain. Absence seemed to have improved everything, and I must confess, I had some difficulty to refrain from demonstrating my joy as wildly as my children. Minu, Minu, Parabaquite, and Kanda were lost in admiration, calling out continually, Miti, beautiful! My wife was busied in arranging a temporary lodging for our guests. The workroom was given up to Mr. Willis. My wife and Madame Emily had our apartment, the two little girls being with them, to whom the hammocks of the elder boys were appropriated. Kanda, who knew nothing about beds, was wonderfully comfortable on the carpet. Fritz, Ernest, and the two natives stowed themselves wherever they wished, in the colonnade or in the kitchen, all was alike to them. I slept on moss and cotton in Mr. Willis's room, with my two younger sons. Every one was content, waiting till our ulterior arrangements were completed. I must conclude my journal here. We can scarcely be more happy than we are, and I feel no cares about my children. Fritz is so fond of the chase and of mechanics, and earnest of study, that they will not wish to marry, but I please myself by hoping at some time to see my dear Jack and Francis happily united to Sophia and Matilda. What remains for me to tell? The details of happiness, however sweet in enjoyment, are often tedious in recital. I will only add that after passing a few days with us, Mr. Willis returned to his charge, promising to visit us, 
and eventually to join us. The Grotto Ernestine, fitted up by Fritz and Parabaquite, made a pretty abode for Madame Hertel and her daughters, and the two islanders. Minu Minu did not leave his young mamas, and was very useful to them. I must state also that my son Ernest, without abandoning the study of natural history, applied himself to astronomy, and mounted the large telescope belonging to the ship. He acquired considerable knowledge of this sublime science, which his mother, however, considered somewhat useless. The course of the other planets did not interest her, so long as all went on well in that which she inhabited, and nothing now was wanting to her happiness, surrounded as she was by friends. The following year we had a visit from a Russian vessel, the Neva, commanded by Captain Krusenstern, a countryman and distant relation of mine. The celebrated Horner of Zurich accompanied him as astronomer. Having read the first part of our journal, sent into Europe by Captain Johnson, he had come purposely to see us. Delighted with our establishment, he did not advise us to quit it. Captain Krusenstern invited us to take a passage in his vessel. We declined his offer, but my wife, though she renounced her country for ever, was glad of the opportunity of making inquiries about her relations and friends. As she had concluded, her good mother had died some years before, blessing her absent children. My wife shed some tears, but was consoled by the certainty of her mother's eternal felicity and the hope of their meeting in futurity. One of her brothers was also dead. He had left a daughter, to whom my wife had always been attached, though she was very young when we left. Henrietta Bodmer was now sixteen, and, Mr. Horner assured us, a most amiable girl. My wife wished much to have her with us. Ernest would not leave Mr. Horner a moment. He was so delighted to meet with one so eminently skillful in his favorite science. Astronomy made them such friends that Mr. Horner petitioned me to allow him to take my son to Europe, promising to bring him back himself in a few years. This was a great trial to us but I felt that his taste for science required a larger field than our island. His mother was reluctant to part with him, but consoled herself with the notion that he might bring his cousin Henrietta back with him. Many tears were shed at our parting. Indeed, the grief of his mother was so intense that my son seemed almost inclined to give up his inclination. But Mr. Horner made some observations about the transit of Venus so interesting that Ernest could not resist. He left us, promising to bring us back everything we wished for. In the meantime, Captain Krusenstern left us a good supply of powder, provisions, seeds, and some capital tools, to the great delight of Fritz and Jack. They regretted their brother greatly, but diverted their minds from sorrow by application to mechanics, assisted by the intelligent Parabaquite. They have already succeeded in constructing, near the Cascade, a corn-mill and a sawmill, and have built a very good oven. We miss Ernest very much. Though his taste for study withdrew him a good deal from us, and he was not so useful as his brothers, we found his calm and considerate advice often of value, and his mildness always spread a charm over our circle, in joy or in trouble. Except this little affliction, we were very happy. Our labors are divided regularly. Fritz and Jack manage the board of works. They have opened a passage through the rock which divided us from the other side of the island, thus doubling our domain and our riches. At the same time, they formed a dwelling for Madame Hertel, near our own, from the same excavation in the rock. Fritz took great pains with it. The windows are made of oiled paper instead of glass, but we usually assemble in our large workroom, which is very well lighted. Francis has the charge of our flocks and of the poultry, all greatly increased. For me, I preside over the grand work of agriculture. The two mothers, their two daughters, and Kanda manage the garden, spin, weave, take care of our clothes, and attend to household matters. Thus we all work and everything prospers. 
Several families of the natives, pupils of Mr. Willis, have obtained leave through him to join us, and are settled at Falcon's Nest, and at the farm. These people assist us in the cultivation of our ground, and our dear missionary in the cultivation of our souls. Nothing is wanting to complete our happiness but the return of dear Ernest. We are now as happy as we can desire. Our son is returned. According to my wishes, he had made out Captain Johnson and Lieutenant Bell, our first visitors, whom the storm had driven from us, but who were still determined to see us again. My son found them preparing for another voyage to the South Seas. He at once seized the opportunity of accompanying them, impatiently desirous to revisit the island and to bring to us Henrietta Bodmer, now become his wife. She is a simple, amiable Swiss girl, who suits us well, and who is delighted to see once more her kind aunt, now become her mother. My wife is overjoyed. This is her first daughter-in-law, but Jack and Francis, as well as Sophia and Matilda, are growing up. And, moreover, my dear wife, who has great ideas of married happiness, hopes to induce Emily to consent to be united to Fritz at the same time as her daughters are married. Fritz would feel all the value of this change. His character is already softened by her society, and though she is a few years older than he is, she is blessed with all the vivacity of youth. Mr. Willis approves of this union, and we hope he will live to solemnize the three marriages. Ernest and Henrietta inhabit the Grotto Ernestine, which his brothers fitted up as a very tasteful dwelling. They had even, to gratify their brother, raised on the rock above the grotto a sort of observatory where the telescope is mounted, to enable him to make his astronomical observations. Yet I perceive his passion for exploring distant planets is less strong, since he has so much to attach him to this. I give this conclusion of my journal to Captain Johnson, to take into Europe, to be added to the former part. If any one of my readers be anxious for further particulars respecting our colony and our mode of life, let him set out for the happy island. He will be warmly welcomed, and may join with us an earnest chorus, which we now sing with additional pleasure. All we love around us smile. Joyful is our desert isle. End of the book this recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Thank you for listening.